El attempt to vocalize his remembrance of the captain endearing and tall engaged in which desperate operation of memory, O'Connor left the old gentleman, and returned to his temporary abode to pass a sleepless night of vain remembrances, regrets, and despair. On the morning subsequent to the somewhat disorderly scene which we have described as having occurred in the theatre, Mary Ashwood, as usual, sat silent and melancholy, in the dressing room of her father, Sir Richard. The baronet was not yet sufficiently recovered to venture downstairs to breakfast, which in those days was a very early meal indeed. After an unusually prolonged silence, the old man, turning suddenly to his daughter, abruptly said, Mary, you have now had some days to study Lord Aspenley, how do you like him? The girl raised her eyes, not a little surprised at the question, and doubtful whether she had heard it aright. I say resumed he, you ought to have been able by this time to arrive at a fair judgment as to Lord Aspenley's merits, what do you think of him, do you like him? Indeed, Father replied she, I have observed him very little, he may be a very estimable man, but I have not seen enough of him to form any opinion, and indeed, if I had, my opinion must needs be a matter of the merest indifference to him and everyone else. Your opinion upon this point replied Sir Richard, tartly, happens not to be a matter of indifference. A considerable pause again ensued during which Mary Ashwood had ample time to reflect upon the very unpleasant doubts which this brief speech, and the tone in which it was uttered, were calculated to inspire. Lord Aspenless manners are very agreeable, very continued Sir Richard, meditatively, I may say, indeed, fascinating, underscore very underscore, do you think so, he added sharply, turning towards his daughter. This was rather a puzzling question. The girl had never thought about him except as a frivolous old beau, yet it was plain she could not say so without vexing her father, she therefore adopted the simplest expedient under such perplexing circumstances, and preserved an embarrassed silence. The fact is said Sir Richard, raising himself a little, so as to look full in his daughter's face, at the same time speaking slowly and sternly, the fact is. I had better be explicit on this subject. I am anxious that you should think well of Lord Aspenley, it is, in short, my wish and pleasure that you should like him, you understand me, you had better understand me. This was said with an emphasis not to be mistaken, and another pause ensued. For the present continued he, run down and amuse yourself, and, stay, offer to show his lordship the old terrace garden do you mind? Now, once more, run away. So saying, the old gentleman turned coolly from her, and rang his hand bell vehemently. Scarcely knowing what she did, such was her astonishment at all that had passed, Mary Ashwood left the room without any very clear notion as to whither she was going, or what to do, nor was her confusion much relieved when, on entering the hall, the first object which encountered her was Lord Aspenley himself, with his triangular hat under his arm, while he adjusted his deep lace ruffles, he had never looked so ugly before. As he stood beneath her while she descended the broad staircase, smiling from ear to ear, and bowing with the most chivalric profundity, his skinny, lemon-coloured face, and cold, glittering little eyes raised toward her. She thought that it was impossible for the human shape so nearly to assume the outward semblance of a squat, emaciated toad. Miss Ashwood, as I live, exclaimed the noble peer, with his most gracious and fascinating smile. On what mission of love and mercy does she move? Shall I hope that her first act of pity may be exercised in favour of the most devoted of her slaves? I have been looking in vain for a guide through the intricacies of Sir Richard's yew hedges and leaden statues, may I hope that my presiding angel has sent me one in you. Lord Aspenley paused, and grinned wider and wider, but receiving no answer, he resumed, I understand, Miss Ashwood, that the pleasure grounds, which surround us, abound in samples of your exquisite taste, as a votary of flora, 
may I ask, if the request be not too bold, that you will vouchsafe to lead a bewildered pilgrim to the object of his search? There is, is there not, shrined in the centre of these rustic labyrinths, a small flower garden which owes its sweet existence to your creative genius, if it be not too remote, and if you can afford so much leisure, allow me to implore your guidance. As he thus spoke, with a graceful flourish, the little gentleman extended his hand, and courteously taking hers by the extreme points of the fingers, he led her forward in a manner, as he thought, so engaging as to put resistance out of the question. Mary Ashwood felt far too little interest in anything but the one ever-present grief which weighed upon her heart, to deny the old fop his trifling request, shrouding her graceful limbs, therefore, in a short cloak, and drawing the hood over her head, she walked forth, with slow steps and an aching heart, among the trim hedges which fenced the old-fashioned pleasure walks. Beauty exclaimed the nobleman, as he walked with an air of romantic gallantry by her side, and glancing as he spoke at the flowers which adorned the border of the path, beauty is nowhere seen to greater advantage than in spots like this, where nature has amassed whatever is most beautiful in the inanimate creation, only to prove how unutterably more exquisite are the charms of living loveliness, these walks, but this moment to me a wilderness, are now so many paths of magic pleasure, how can I enough thank the kind enchantress to whom I owe the transformation? Here the little gentleman looked unutterable things, and a silence of some minutes ensued, during which he effected some dozen very wheezy sighs. Emboldened by Miss Ashwood's silence, which he interpreted as a very unequivocal proof of conscious tenderness, he resolved to put an end to the skirmishing with which he had opened his attack and to commence the action in downright earnestness. This place breathes an atmosphere of romance, it is a spot consecrated to the worship of love, it is, it is the shrine of passion, and I, underscore I underscore am a votary, a worshipper. Miss Ashwood paused in mingled surprise and displeasure, for his vehemence had become so excessive as, in conjunction with his asthma, to threaten to choke his lordship outright. When Mary Ashwood stopped short, Lord Aspinley took it for granted that the crisis had arrived, and that the moment for the decisive onset was now come, he therefore ejaculated with a rapturous croak, and you, underscore you underscore are my divinity, and at the same moment he descended stiffly upon his two knees, caught her hand in his, and began to mumble it with unmistakable devotion. My lord, Lord Aspinley. Surely your lordship cannot mean, have done, my lord exclaimed the astonished girl, withdrawing her hand indignantly from his grasp. Rise, my lord, you cannot mean otherwise than to mock me by such extravagance. My lord, my lord, you surprise and shock me beyond expression. Angel of beauty, most exquisite, most perfect of your sex gasped his lordship, I love you, yes to distraction. Answer me, if you would not have me expire at your feet, ah, uh, ah, uh, tell me that I may hope, ah, uh, that I am not indifferent to you, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, that, that you can love me. Here his lordship was seized with so violent a fit of coughing, that Miss Ashwood began to fear that he would expire at her feet in downright earnest. During the paroxysm, in which, with one hand pressed upon his side, he supported himself by leaning with the other upon the ground, Mary had ample time to collect her thoughts, so that when at length he had recovered his breath, she addressed him with composure and decision. My lord she said, I am grateful for your preference of me, although, when I consider the shortness of my acquaintance with you, and how few have been your opportunities of knowing me, I cannot but wonder very much at its vehemence. For me, your lordship cannot feel more than an idle fancy, which will, no doubt, pass away just as lightly as it came, and as for my feelings, I have only to say, that it is wholly impossible for you ever to establish in them any interest of the kind you look for. Indeed, indeed, my lord, I hope I have not given you pain, 
nothing can be further from my wish than to do so, but it is my duty to tell you plainly and at once my real feelings. I should otherwise but trifle with your kindness, for which, although I cannot return it as you desire, I shall ever be grateful. Having thus spoken, she turned from her noble suitor, and began to retrace her steps rapidly towards the house. Stay, Miss Ashwood, remain here for a moment, you must hear me, exclaimed Lord Aspinley, in a tone so altered, that she involuntarily paused, while his lordship, with some difficulty, raised himself again to his feet, and with a flushed and haggard face, in which still lingered the ghastly phantom of his habitual smile, he hobbled to her side. Miss Ashwood he exclaimed, in a tone tremulous with emotions very different from love, I, I, I am not used to be treated cavalierly, I, I will not brook it, I am not to be trifled with, jilted, madam, jilted, and taken in. You have accepted and encouraged my attentions, attentions which you cannot have mistaken, and now, madam, when I make you an offer, such as your ambition, your most presumptuous ambition, dared not have anticipated, the offer of my hand, and, and a coronet, you coolly tell me you never cared for me. Why, what on earth do you look for or expect, a foreign prince or potentate, an emperor, ha, ha, he, he, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. I tell you plainly, Miss Ashwood, that my feelings must be considered. I have long made my passion known to you, it has been encouraged and I have obtained Sir Richard's, your father's, sanction and approval. You had better reconsider what you have said. I shall give you an hour, at the end of that time, unless you see the propriety of avowing feelings which, you must pardon me when I say it, your encouragement of my advances has long virtually acknowledged, I must lay the whole case, including all the painful details of my own ill usage, before Sir Richard Ashwood and trust to his powers of persuasion to induce you to act reasonably, and, I will add, honourably. Here his lordship took several extraordinarily copious pinches of snuff, after which he bowed very low, conjured up an unusually hideous smile, in which spite, fury, and triumph were eagerly mingled, and hobbled away before the astonished girl had time to muster her spirits sufficiently to answer him. Chapter XXI who appeared to Mary Ashwood as she sate under the trees, the champion. With flashing eyes and a swelling heart, struck dumb with unutterable indignation, the beautiful girl stood fixed in the attitude in which his last words had reached her, while the enraged and unmanly old fop hobbled away, with the ease and grace with which a crippled ape might move over a hot griddle. He had disappeared for some minutes before she had recovered herself sufficiently to think or speak. If he were by my side she said, this noble lord dared not have used me thus. Edmund would have died a thousand deaths first. But oh! God look upon me, for his love is gone from me, and I am now a poor, grieved, desolate creature, with none to help me. Thus saying, she sate herself down upon the grass bank, beneath the tall and antique trees, and wept with all the bitter and devoted abandonment of hopeless sorrow. From this unrestrained transport of grief she was at length aroused by the pressure of a hand, gently and kindly laid upon her shoulder. "'What vexes you, Mary, my little girl?' inquired Major Leary, for he it was that stood by her. "'Come, darling.' Don't fret, but tell your old uncle the whole business, and twenty to one, he has wit enough in his old noddle yet to set matters to rights. So, so, my darling, dry your pretty eyes, wipe the tears away, why should they wet your young cheeks, my poor little dote, that you always were? It is too early yet for sorrow to come on you. Wouldn't I throw myself between my little pet and all grief and danger? Then trust to me, darling, wipe away the tears, or by, I'll begin to cry myself. Dry your eyes, and see if I can't help you one way or another. The mellow brogue of the old major had never fallen before with such a tender pathos upon the ear of his beautiful niece, 
as now that its rich current bore full upon her heart the unlooked-for words of kindness and comfort. Were not you always my pet continued he, with the same tenderness and pity in his tone, from the time I first took you upon my knee, my poor little Mary. And were not you fond of your old rascally uncle O'Leary? You sit I always to take your part, right or wrong, and do you think I'll desert you now? Then tell it all to me, ain't I your poor old uncle, the same as ever? Come, then, dry the tears, there's a darling, wipe them away. While thus speaking, the warm-hearted old man took her hand, with a touching mixture of gallantry, pity, and affection, and kissed it again and again, with a thousand accompanying expressions of endearment, such as in the days of her childhood he had been wont to lavish upon his little favourite. The poor girl, touched by the kindness of her early friend, whose good-natured sympathy was not to be mistaken, gradually recovered her composure, and yielding to the urgencies of the major, who clearly perceived that something extraordinarily distressing must have occurred to account for her extreme agitation, she at length told him the immediate cause of her grief and excitement. The major listened to the narrative with growing indignation, and when it had ended, he inquired, in a tone, about whose unnatural calmness there was something infinitely more formidable than in the noisiest clamour of fury, which way, darling, did his lordship go when he left you? The girl looked in his face, and saw his deadly purpose there. Uncle, my own dear uncle she cried distractedly, for God's sake do not follow him, for God's sake, I conjure you, I implore, she would have cast herself at his feet, but the major caught her in his arms. Well, well, my darling he exclaimed, I'll not kill him, well as he deserves it, I'll not, you have saved his life. I pledge you my honour, as a gentleman and a soldier. I'll not harm him for what he has said or done this day, are you satisfied? I am, I am. Thank God, thank God, exclaimed the poor girl, eagerly. But, Mary, I must see him rejoined the Major, he has threatened to set Sir Richard upon you, I must see him, you don't object to that, under the promise I have made. I want to, to reason with him. He shall not get you into trouble with the baronet, for though Richard and I came of the same mother, we are not of the same marriage, nor of the same mould, I would not for a cool hundred that he told his story to your father. Indeed, indeed, dear uncle replied the girl, I fear me there is little hope of escape or ease for me. My father must know what has passed, he will learn it inevitably and then it needs no colouring or misrepresentation to call down upon me his heaviest displeasure, his anger I must endure as best I may. God help me! But neither threats nor violence shall make me retract the answer I have given to Lord Aspenley, nor ever yield consent to marry him, nor any other now. Well, well, little Mary rejoined the Major, I like your spirit. Stand to that and you'll never be sorry for it. In the meantime, I'll venture to exercise his lordship's conversational powers in a brief conference of a few minutes, and if I find him as reasonable as I expect, you'll have no cause to regret my interposition. Don't look so frightened, haven't I promised, on the honour of a gentleman, that I will not pink him for anything said or done in his conference with you. To send a small sword through a bolster or a bailiff he continued, meditatively, is an indifferent action, but to spit such a poisonous, crawling toad as the respectable old gentleman in question, would be nothing short of meritorious, it is an act that you'd tickle the fancy of every saint in heaven, and, if there's justice on earth, would canonize myself. But never mind, I'll let it alone, the little thing shall escape. Since you wish it, Major Leary has said it, so let no doubt disturb you. Goodbye, my little darling, dry your eyes, and let me see you, before an hour, as merry as in the merriest days that are gone. So saying, Major Leary patted her cheek, and taking her hand affectionately in both his, he added, Sure I am, 
that there is more in all this than you care to tell me, my little pet. I am sorely afraid there is something beyond my power to remedy, to change your light-hearted nature so mournfully. What it is, I will not inquire, but remember, darling, whenever you want a friend, you will find a sure one in me. Thus having spoken, he turned from her, and strode rapidly down the walk, until the thick, formal hedges concealed his retreating form behind their impenetrable screens of darksome verdure. Odd as were the manner and style of the major's professions, there was something tender, something of heartiness, in his speech, which assured her that she had indeed found a friend in him, rash, volatile, and violent it might be, but still one on whose truth and energy she might calculate. That there was one being who felt with her and for her, was a discovery which touched her heart and moved her generous spirit, and she now regarded the old major, whose spoiled favourite in childhood she had been, but whom, before, she had never known capable of a serious feeling, with emotions of affection and gratitude, stronger and more ardent than he had ever earned from any other being. Agitated, grieved, and excited, she hurriedly left the scene of this interview, and sought relief for her overcharged feelings in the quiet and seclusion of her chamber. Chapter XXII The Spiney In no very pleasant frame of mind did Lord Aspenley retrace his steps toward the old house. His lordship had, all his life, been firmly persuaded that the whole female creation had been sighing and pining for the possession of his heart and equipage. He knew that among those with whom his chief experience lay, his fortune and his coronet were considerations not to be resisted, and he as firmly believed, that even without such recommendations, few women, certainly none of any taste or discrimination, could be found with hearts so steeled against the archery of Cupid, as to resist the fascinations of his manner and conversation, supported and directed, as both were by the tact and experience drawn from a practice of more years than his. Lordship cared to count, even to himself. He had, however, smiled, danced, and chatted, in impregnable celibacy, through more than half a century of gaiety and frivolity, breaking, as he thought, hearts innumerable, and, at all events, disappointing very many calculations, until, at length, his lordship had arrived at that precise period of existence at which old gentlemen, not unfrequently, become all at once romantic, disinterested, and indiscreet, nobody exactly knows why, unless it be for variety, or to spite an heir presumptive, or else that, as a preliminary to second childhood, nature has ordained a second boyhood too. Certain, however, it is that Lord Aspenley was seized, on a sudden, with a matrimonial frenzy, and, tired of the hackneyed schemers, in the centre of whose manoeuvres he had stood and smiled so long in contemptuous security, he resolved that his choice should honour some simple, unsophisticated beauty, who had never plotted his matrimony. Fired with this benevolent resolution, he almost instantly selected Mary Ashwood as the happy companion of his second childhood, acquainted Sir Richard with his purpose, of course received his consent and blessing, and forthwith opened his entrenchments with the same certainty of success with which the great Duke of Marlborough might have invested a Flanders village. The inexperience of a girl who had mixed, comparatively, so little in gay society, her consequent openness to flattery, and susceptibility of being fascinated by the elegance of his address, and the splendour of his fortune, all these considerations, accompanied by a clear consciousness of his own infinite condescension in thinking of her at all, had completely excluded from all his calculations the very possibility of her doing anything else than jump into his arms the moment he should open them to receive her. The result of the interview which had just taken place, had come upon him with the overwhelming suddenness of a thunderbolt. Rejected, Lord Aspenley rejected, a coronet, and a fortune, and a man whom all the male world might envy, 
each and all rejected, and by whom, a chit of a girl, who had no right to look higher than a half-pay captain with a wooden leg, or a fox-hunting boar, with a few inaccessible acres of bog and mountain, the daughter of a spendthrift baronet, who was, as everyone knew, on the high road to ruin. Death and fury. Was it to be endured? The little lover, absorbed in such tranquilizing reflections, arrived at the house, and entered the drawing room. It was not unoccupied, seated by a spinet, and with a sheet of music paper in her lap, and a pencil in her hand, was the fair Emily Copland. As he entered, she raised her eyes, started a little, became gracefully confused, and then, with her archest smile, exclaimed, What shall I say, my lord? You have detected me. I have neither defence nor palliation to offer, you have fairly caught me. Here am I engaged in perhaps the most presumptuous task that ever silly maiden undertook, I am wedding your beautiful verses to most unworthy music of my own. After all, there is nothing like a simple ballad. Such exquisite lines as these inspire music of themselves. Would that Henry Purcell had had but a peep at them. To what might they not have prompted such a genius, to what, indeed? So sublime was the flight of fancy suggested by this interrogatory, that Miss Copland shook her head slowly in poetic rapture, and gazed fondly for some seconds upon the carpet, apparently unconscious of Lord Aspinley's presence. She is a fine creature half murmured he, with an emphasis upon the identity which implied a contrast not very favourable to Mary, and, and very pretty, nay, she looks almost beautiful, and so, so lively, so much vivacity. Never was poor poet so much flattered continued his lordship, approaching, as he spoke, and raising his voice, but not above its most mellifluous pitch, to have his verses read by such eyes, to have them chanted by such a minstrel, were honour too high for the noblest bards of the noblest days of poetry, for me it is a happiness almost too great, yet, if the request be not a presumptuous one, may I, in all humility, pray that you will favour me with the music to which you have coupled my most undeserving, my most favoured lines. The young lady looked modest, glanced coyly at the paper which lay in her lap, looked modest once more, and then arch again, and at length, with rather a fluttered air, she threw her hands over the keys of the instrument, and to a tune, of which we say enough when we state that it was in no way unworthy of the words, she sang, rather better than young ladies usually do, the following exquisite stanzas from his lordship's pen, though Chloe slight me when I woo, and scorn the love of poor. Philander, the shepherd's heart she scorns is true, his heart is true, his passion tender. But poor Philander sighs in vain, in vain laments the poor Philander, fair Chloe scorns with high disdain, his love so true and passion tender. And here Philander lays him down, here will expire the poor Philander, the victim of fair Chloe's frown, of love so true and passion tender. Ah, well a day, the shepherd's dead, eh, dead and gone, the poor Philander, and Dryad's crown with flowers his head, and Cupid mourns his love so tender. During this performance, Lord Aspinley, who had now perfectly recovered his equanimity, marked the time with head and hand, standing the while beside the fair performer, and every note she sang found its way through the wide portals of his vanity, directly to his heart. Brother, brother, bravissima, murmured his lordship, from time to time. Beautiful, beautiful air, most appropriate, most simple, not a note that accords not with the word it carries, beautiful, indeed. A thousand thanks. I have become quite conceited of lines of which heretofore I was half ashamed. I am quite elated, at once overpowered by the characteristic vanity of the poet, and more than recompensed by the reality of his proudest aspiration, that of seeing his verses appreciated by a heart of sensibility, and of hearing them sung by the lips of beauty. 
I am but too happy if I am forgiven replied Emily Copland, slightly laughing, and with a heightened color, while the momentary overflow of merriment was followed by a sigh, and her eyes sank pensively upon the ground. This little by-play was not lost upon Lord Aspenley. Poor little thing he inwardly remarked, she is in a very bad way, desperate, quite desperate. What a devil of a rascal I am to be sure. Egord. It's almost a pity, she's a decidedly superior person, she has an elegant turn of mind, refinement, taste, Egord. She is a fine creature, and so simple. She little knows I see it all, perhaps she hardly knows herself what ails her, poor, poor little thing. While these thoughts floated rapidly through his mind, he felt, along with his spite and anger towards Mary Ashwood, a feeling of contempt, almost of disgust, engendered by her audacious non-appreciation of his merits, an impertinence which appeared the more monstrous by the contrast of Emily Copland's tenderness. She had made it plain enough, by all the artless signs which simple maidens know not how to hide, that his fascinations had done their fatal work upon her heart. He had seen, this for several days, but not with the overwhelming distinctness with which he now beheld it. Poor, poor little girl, said his lordship to himself, I am very, very sorry, but it cannot be helped, it is no fault of mine. I am really very, very, confoundedly sorry. In saying so to himself, however, he told himself a lie, for, instead of being grieved, he was pleased beyond measure, a fact which he might have ascertained by a single glance at the reflection of his wreathed smiles in the ponderous mirror which hung forward from the pier between the windows, as if staring down in wondering curiosity upon the progress of the flirtation. Not caring to disturb a train of thought which his vanity told him were but riveting the subtle chains which bound another victim to his conquering chariot wheels, the Earl of Aspenley turned, with careless ease, to a table, on which lay some specimens of that worsted tapestry work, in which the fair maidens of a century and a half ago were wont to exercise their taste and skill. Your work is very, very beautiful said he, after a considerable pause and laying down the canvas, upon whose unfinished worsted task he had been for some time gazing. That is my cousin's work said Emily, not sorry to turn the conversation to a subject upon which, for many reasons, she wished to dwell, she used to work a great deal with me before she grew romantic, before she fell in love. In love, with whom, inquired Lord Aspenley, with remarkable quickness. Don't you know, my lord, inquired Emily Copland, in simple wonder. Maybe I ought not to have told you, I am sure I ought not. Do not ask me any more. I am the giddiest girl, the most thoughtless. Nay, nay said Lord Aspenley, you need not be afraid to trust me, I never tell tales, and now that I know the fact that she is in love there can be no harm in telling me the less important particulars. On my honour continued his lordship, with real earnestness, and affected playfulness, upon my sacred honour. I shall not breathe one syllable of it to mortal, I shall be as secret as the tomb. Who is the happy person in question? Well, my lord, you will promise not to betray me replied she. I know very well I ought not to have said a word about it, but as I have made the blunder, I see no harm in telling you all I know, but you will be secret. On my honour, on my life and soul, I swear, exclaimed his lordship, with unaffected eagerness. Well, then, the happy man is a Mr. Edmund O'Connor replied she. O'Connor, O'Connor, I never saw nor heard of the man before rejoined the Earl, reflectively. Is he wealthy? Oh, no, a mere beggar man replied Emily, and a papist to boot. Ha, 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 he, 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 a papist beggar exclaimed his lordship, with an hysterical giggle, which was intended for a careless laugh. Has he any conversation, any manner, any attraction of that kind? 
Oh, none in the world, both ignorant, and I think, vulgar replied Emily. In short, he is very nearly a stupid boar. Excellent. Ha, ha, he, he, he are, very capital, excellent. Excellent, exclaimed his lordship, although he might have found some difficulty in explaining in what, precisely the peculiar excellence of the announcement consisted. Is he, is he, a, a, underscore handsome underscore? Decidedly not what I consider handsome, replied she, he is a large, coarse-looking fellow, with very broad shoulders, very large, and as they say of oxen, in very great condition, a sort of a prize man. Ha, ha, ah, uh, he, 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 ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, delightful, quite delightful, exclaimed the earl, in a tone of intense chagrin, for he was conscious that his own figure was perhaps a little too scraggy, and his legs a little too nearly approaching the genus spindle, and being so, there was no trait in the female character which he so inveterately abhorred and despised as their tendency to prefer those figures which exhibited a due proportion of thew and muscle. Under a cloud of rapi, his lordship made a desperate attempt to look perfectly delighted and amused, and effected a retreat to the window, where he again indulged in a titter of unutterable spite and vexation. And what says Sir Richard to the advances of this very desirable gentleman, inquired he, after a little time. Sir Richard is, of course, violently against it replied Emily Copland. So I should have supposed returned the little nobleman, briskly. And turning again to the window, he relapsed into silence, looked out intently for some minutes, took more snuff, and finally, consulting his watch, with a few words of apology, and a gracious smile and a bow, quitted the room. Chapter 23 The Dark Room, Containing Plenty of Scars and Bruises and Plans of Vengeance On the same day a very different scene was passing in another quarter, whither for a few moments we must transport the reader. In a large and aristocratic-looking brick house, situated near the then fashionable suburb of Glasnevin, Surrounded by stately trees, and within furnished with the most prodigal splendor, combined with the strictest and most minute attention to comfort and luxury, and in a large and lofty chamber, carefully darkened, screened round by the rich and voluminous folds of the silken curtains, with spider tables laden with fruits and wines and phials of medicine, crowded around him, and rather buried than supported among a luxurious pile of pillows, lay, in sore bodily torment, with fevered pulse, and heart and brain busy with a thousand projects of revenge, the identical Nicholas Bladen, whose signal misadventure in the theatre, upon the preceding evening, we have already recorded. A decent-looking matron sate in a capacious chair, near the bed, in the capacity of nurse tender, while her constrained and restless manner, as well as the frightened expression with which, from time to time, she stole a glance at the bloated mass of scars and bruises, of which she had the care, pretty plainly argued the sweet and patient resignation with which her charge endured his sufferings. In the recess of the curtained window sat a little black boy, arrayed according to the prevailing fashion, in a fancy suit, and with a turban on his head, and carrying in his awestruck countenance, as well as in the immobility of his attitude, a woeful contradiction to the gaiety of his attire. Drink, drink, where's that dd hag, give me drink, I say, howled the prostrate gambler. The woman started to her feet, and with a step which fell noiselessly upon the deep-piled carpets which covered the floor, she hastened to supply him. He had hardly swallowed the draught, when a low knock at the door announced a visitor. Come in, can't you, shouted Bladen. How do you feel now, Nicky dear, inquired a female voice, and a handsome face, with rather a bold expression, and crowned by a small mob cap, overlaid with a profusion of the richest lace, peeped into the room through the half-open door, how do you feel? In hell, that's all shouted he. Dr. Mallard is below, love added she, 
without evincing either surprise or emotion of any kind at the concise announcement which the patient had just delivered. Let him come up then was the reply. And a Mr. M. Quirk, a messenger from Mr. Chauncey. Let him come up too. But why the hell did not Chauncey come himself, that will do, pack, be off. The lady tossed her head, like one having authority, looked half inclined to say something sharp, but thought better of it, and contented herself with shutting the door with more emphasis than Dr. Mallard would have recommended. The physician of those days was a solemn personage, he would as readily have appeared without his head, as without his full-bottomed wig and his ponderous gold-headed cane was a sort of fifth limb, the supposition of whose absence involved a contradiction to the laws of anatomy, his dress was rich and funereal, his step was slow and pompous, his words very long and very few, his look was mysterious, his not awful, and the shake of his head unfathomable, in short, he was in no respect very much better than a modern charlatan. The science which he professed was then overgrown with absurdities and mystification. The temper of the times was superstitious and credulous. The physician, being wise in his generation, framed his outward man, including his air and language, accordingly, and the populace swallowed his long words and his electuaries with equal faith. Dr. Mallard was a doctor-like person, and, in theatrical phraseology, looked the part well. He was tall and stately, saturnine and sallow in aspect, had bushy, grizzled brows, and a severe and prominent dark eye, a thin, hooked nose, and a pair of lips just as thin as it. Along with these advantages he had a habit of pressing the gold head of his professional cane against one corner of his mouth, in a way which produced a sinister and mysterious distortion of that organ, and by exhibiting the medical baton, the outward and visible sign of doctorship, in immediate juxtaposition with the fountain of language, added enormously to the gravity and authority of the words which from time to time proceeded therefrom. In the presence of such a spectre as this, intimately associated with all that was nauseous and deadly on earth, it is hardly to be wondered at that even Nicholas Bladen felt himself somewhat uneasy and abashed. The physician felt his pulse gazing the while upon the ceiling, and pressing the gold head of his cane, as usual, to the corner of his mouth, made him put out his tongue, asked him innumerable questions, which we forbear to publish, and ended by forbidding his patient the use of every comfort in which he had hitherto found relief, and by writing a prescription which might have furnished a country dispensary with good things for a twelvemonth. He then took his leave and his fee with the grisly announcement, that unless the drugs were all swallowed, and the other matters attended to in a spirit of absolute submission, he would not answer for the life of the patient. I am dd glad he's gone at last exclaimed Bladen, with a kind of gasp, as if a weight had been removed from his breast. Curse me, if I did not feel all the time as if my coffin was in the room. Are you there, M. Quirk? Here I am. Mr. Bladen rejoined the person addressed, whom we may as well describe, as we shall have more to say about him by and by. Mr. M. Quirk was a small, wiry man, of fifty years and upwards, arrayed in that style which is usually described as shabby genteel. He was gifted with one of those mean and commonplace countenances which seem expressly made for the effectual concealment of the thoughts and feelings of the possessor an advantage which he further secured by habitually keeping his eyes as nearly closed as might be, so that, for any indication afforded by them of the movements of the inward man, they might as well have been shut up altogether. The peculiarity, if not the grace, of his appearance, was heightened by a contraction of the muscles at the nape of the neck, which drew his head backward, and produced a corresponding elevation of the chin which, along with a certain habitual toss of the head, gave to his appearance a kind of caricatured affectation of superciliousness and hauteur, very impressive to behold. Along with the swing of the head, which we have before noticed, there was, whenever he spoke, 
a sort of careless libration of the whole body, which, together with a certain way of jerking or twitching the right shoulder from time to time, were the only approaches to gesticulation in which he indulged. Well, what does your master say, inquired Bladen, out with it, can't you? Master, master, indeed. Cock him up with master echoed the man, with lofty disdain. Eh, what does he say, reiterated Bladen, in no very musical tones. Do you, are you choking, or moonstruck? Out with it, can't you? Chauncey says that you had better think the matter over, and that's his opinion replied M. Quirk. And a fine opinion it is rejoined Bladen, furiously. Why, in hell's name, what's the matter with him, the, driveling idiot? What's law for, what's the courts for? Am I to be trounced and cudgelled in the face of hundreds, and, and half murdered, and nothing for it? I tell you, I'll be beggared before the scoundrel shall escape. If every penny I'm worth in the world can buy it, I'll have justice. Tell that sleepy sot Chauncey that I'll make him work. Ho, oh, 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 bawled the wretch, as his anguish all returned a hundredfold in the fruitless attempt to raise himself in bed. Drink, here, underscore drink underscore, I'm choking. Hock and water. Do you, don't look so stupid and frightened. I'll not be bamboozled by an old pothecary. Quick with it, you fumbling witch. He finished the draft, and lay silently for a time. See, mind me, M. Quirk he said, after a pause, tell Chauncey to come out himself, tell him to be here before evening, or I'll make him sorry for it, do you mind, I want to give him directions. Tell him to come at once, or I'll make him smoke for it, that's all. I understand, all right, very well, and so, as you seem settling for a snooze, I wish you good evening, Mr. Bladen, and all sorts of pleasure and happiness rejoined the messenger. The patient answered by a grin and a stifled howl, and Mr. M. Quirk, having his head within the curtains, which screened him effectually from the observation of the two attendants, and observing that Mr. Bladen's eyes were closely shut in the rigid compression of pain, put out his tongue, and indulged for a few seconds in an exceedingly ugly grimace, after which, repeating his farewell in a tone of respectful sympathy, he took his departure, chuckling inwardly all the way downstairs, for the little gentleman had a playful turn for mischief. When Gordon Chauncey, Esquire, Barrister at Law, in obedience to this summons, arrived at Cherry Hill, for so the residence of the sick voluptuary was called, he found his loving friend and patron, Nicholas Bladen, babbling not of green fields, but of green curtains, theatres, dice boxes, bright eyes, small swords, and the shades infernal, in a word, in a high state of delirium. On calling next day, however, he beheld him much recovered, and after an extremely animated discussion, these two well-assorted confederates at length, by their united ingenuity, succeeded in roughly sketching the outlines of a plan of terrific vengeance, in all respects worthy of the diabolical counsel in which it originated, and of whose progress and development this history very fully treats. Chapter Xiv a critic, a condition, and the small swords. Lord Aspinley walked forth among the trim hedges and secluded walks which surrounded the house, and by alternately taking enormous pinches of rapi, and humming a favourite air or two, he wonderfully assisted his philosophy in recovering his equanimity. It matters but little how the affair ends thought his lordship, if in matrimony, the girl is, after all, a very fine girl but if the matter is fairly off, in that case I shall, look very foolish suggested his conscience faintly, but his lordship dismissed the thought precipitately, in that case I shall make it a point to marry within a fortnight. I should like to know the girl who would refuse me, the only one you ever asked suggested his conscience again, 
but with no better result, I should like to see the girl of sense or discrimination who could refuse me. I shall marry the finest girl in the country, and then I presume very few will be inclined to call me fool. Not I for one, my lord exclaimed a voice close by. Lord Aspenley started, for he was conscious that in his energy he had uttered the concluding words of his proud peroration with audible emphasis, and became instantly aware that the speaker was no other than Major Leary. Not I for one, my lord repeated the Major, with extreme gravity, I take it for granted, my lord, that you are no fool. I am obliged to you, Major Leary, for your good opinion replied his lordship dryly, with a surprised look and a stiff inclination of his person. Nothing to be grateful for in it replied the major, returning the bow with grave politeness, if yours and discretion increase together, you and I ought to be models of wisdom by this time of day. I'm proud of my years, my lord, and I would be half as proud again if I could count as many as your lordship. There was something singularly abrupt and uncalled for in all this, which Lord Aspenley did not very well understand, he therefore stopped short, and looked in the Major's face, but reading in its state and formal gravity nothing whatever to furnish a clue to his exact purpose, he made a kind of short bow, and continued his walk in dignified silence. There was something exceedingly disagreeable, he thought, in the manner of his companion, something very near approaching to cool impertinence, which he could not account for upon any other supposition than that the Major had been prematurely indulging in the joys of Bacchus. If, however, he thought that by the assumption of the frigid and lofty dignity with which he met the advances of the Major, he was likely to relieve himself of his company, he was never more lamentably mistaken. His military companion walked with a careless swagger by his side, exactly regulating his pace by that of the little nobleman, whose meditations he had so cruelly interrupted. What on earth is to be done with this brute beast, muttered his lordship, taking care, however, that the query should not reach the subject of it. I must get rid of him, I must speak with the girl privately, what the deuce is to be done. They walked on a little further in perfect silence. At length his lordship stopped short and exclaimed, My dear Major, I am a very dull companion, quite a bore, there are times when the mind, the, the, spirits require solitude, and these walks are the very scene for a lonely ramble. I dare venture to aver that you are courting solitude like myself, your silence betrays you, then pray do not stand on ceremony, underscore that underscore walk leads down toward the river pray no ceremony. Upon my conscience, my lord, I never was less inclined to stand on ceremony than I am at this moment replied the major, so give yourself no trouble in the world about me. Nothing would annoy me so much as to have you think I was doing anything but precisely what I liked best myself. Lord Aspenley bowed, took a violent pinch of snuff, and walked on, the major still keeping by his side. After a long silence his lordship began to lilt his own sweet verses in a careless sort of a way, which was intended to convey to his tormentor that he had totally forgotten his presence, though Chloe slight me when I woo, and scorn the love of poor Philander, the shepherd's heart she scorns is true, his heart is true, his passion tender. Passion tender observed the major, passion tender. It's a nurse tender the like of you and me ought to be looking for, underscore passion underscore tender, upon my conscience, a good joke. Lord Aspenley was strongly tempted to give vent to his feelings, but even at the imminent risk of bursting, he managed to suppress his fury. The Major was certainly, however unaccountable and mysterious the fact might be, in a perfectly cut-throat frame of mind and Lord Aspenley had no desire to present his reason for the entertainment of his military friend. Tender, underscore tender underscore continued the inexorable major, allow me, my lord, to suggest the word tough as an improvement, underscore tender underscore, 
my lord, is a term which does not apply to chickens beyond a certain time of life, and it strikes me as too bold a license of poetry to apply it to a gentleman of such extreme and venerable old age as your lordship, for I take it for granted that Philander is another name for yourself. As the major uttered this critical remark, Lord Aspinley felt his brain, as it were, fizz with downright fury. The instinct of self-preservation, however, triumphed, he mastered his generous indignation, and resumed his walk in a state of mind nothing short of awful. My lord inquired the major, with tragic abruptness, and with very stern emphasis, I take the liberty of asking, have you made your soul? The precise nature of the Major's next proceeding, Lord Aspinley could not exactly predict, of one thing, however, he felt assured, and that was, that the designs of his companion were decidedly of a dangerous character, and as he gazed in mute horror upon the Major, confused but terrific ideas of homicidal monomania and coroner's inquests floated dimly through his distracted brain. My soul, faltered he, in undisguised trepidation. Yes, my lord repeated the major, with remarkable coolness, have you made your soul? During this conference his lordship's complexion had shifted from its original lemon colour to a lively orange, and thence faded gradually off into a pea-green, at which Hewitt remained fixed during the remainder of the interview. I protest, you cannot be serious. I am wholly in the dark. Positively, Major Leary, this is very unaccountable conduct, you really ought, pray explain. Upon my conscience, I will explain rejoined the Major, although the explanation won't make you much more in love with your present predicament, unless I am very much out. You made my niece, Mary Ashwood, an offer of marriage today, well, she was much obliged to you but she did not want to marry you, and she told you so civilly. Did you then, like a man and a gentleman, take your answer from her as you ought to have done, quietly and courteously? No, you did not, you went to bully the poor girl, and to insult her, because she politely declined to marry a, a an ugly bunch of wrinkles, like you, and you threatened to tell Sir Richard, a, you did, to tell him your pitiful story. You, 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 but wait a while. You want to have the poor girl frightened and bullied into marrying you. Where's your spirit or your feeling, my lord? But you don't know what the words mean. If ever you did, you'd sooner have been racked to death, than have terrified and insulted a poor friendless girl, as you thought her. But she's not friendless. I'll teach you she's not. As long as this arm can lift a small sword, and while the life is in my body, I'll never see any woman maltreated by a scoundrel, a scoundrel, my lord, but I'll bring him to his knees for it, or die in the attempt. And holding these opinions, did you think I'd let you offend my niece? No, sir, I'd be blown to atoms first. Major Leary replied his lordship. As soon as he had collected his thoughts and recovered breath to speak, your conduct is exceedingly violent, very, and, I will add, most hasty and indiscreet. You have entirely misconceived me, you have mistaken the whole affair. You will regret this violence, I protest, I know you will, when you understand the whole matter. At present, knowing the nature of your feelings, I protest. Though I might naturally resent your observations, it is not in my nature, in my heart to be angry. This was spoken with a very audible quaver. You would, my lord, you would be angry rejoined the major, you'd dance with fury this moment, if you dared. You could find it in your heart to go into a passion with a girl, but talking with men is a different sort of thing. Now, my lord, we are both here, with our swords. No place can be more secluded, and, I presume, no two men more willing. Pray draw, my lord, or I'll be apt to spoil your velvet and gold lace. Major Leary, I will be heard, exclaimed Lord Aspinley, with an earnestness which the imminent peril of his person inspired, 
I must have a word or two with you, before we put this dispute to so deadly an arbitrament. The Major had foreseen and keenly enjoyed the reluctance and the evident tremors of his antagonist. He returned his half-drawn sword to its scabbard with an impatient thrust, and, folding his arms, looked down with supreme contempt upon the little peer. Major Leary, you have been misinformed, Miss Ashwood has mistaken me. I assure you, I meant no disrespect, none in the world, I protest. I may have spoken hastily, perhaps I did, but I never intended disrespect, never for a moment. Well, my lord, suppose that I admit that you did not mean any disrespect, and suppose that I distinctly assert that I have neither right nor inclination just now to call you to an account for anything you may have said, in your interview this morning, offensive to my niece, I give you leave to suppose it, and, what's more, in supposing it, I solemnly aver, you suppose neither more nor less than the exact truth said the Major. Well, then, Major Leary replied Lord Aspenley. I profess myself wholly at a loss to understand your conduct. I presume, at all events, that nothing further need pass between us about the matter. Not so fast, my lord, if you please rejoined the major, a great deal more must pass between us before I have done with your lordship, although I cannot punish you for the past, I have a perfect right to restrain you for the future. I have a proposal to make to which I expect your lordship's assent, a proposal which, under the circumstances, I dare say, you will think, however unpleasant, by no means unreasonable. Pray state it said Lord Aspenley, considerably reassured on finding that the debate was beginning to take a diplomatic turn. This is my proposal, then replied the Major, you shall write a letter to Sir Richard renouncing all pretensions to his daughter's hand, and taking upon yourself the whole responsibility of the measure, without implicating her directly or indirectly, do you mind, and you shall leave this place, and go wherever you please, before supper time tonight. These are the conditions on which I will consent to spare you, my lord, and upon no other shall you escape. Why, what can you mean, Major Leary? exclaimed the little coxcomb, distractedly. If I did any such thing, I should be run through by Sir Richard or his rakehully son, besides, I came here for a wife, my friends know it, I cannot consent to make a fool of myself. How dare you presume to propose such conditions to me? The little gentleman as he wound up, had warmed so much, that he placed his hand on the hilt of his sword. Without one word of commentary, the Major drew his, and with a nod of invitation, threw himself into an attitude of defence, and resting the point of his weapon upon the ground, awaited the attack of his adversary. Perhaps Lord Aspenley regretted the precipitate valour which had prompted him to place his hand on his sword hilt, as much as he had ever regretted any act of his whole life, it was, however, too late to recede and with the hurried manner of one who has made up his mind to a disagreeable thing, and wishes it soon over, he drew his also, and their blades were instantly crossed in mortal opposition. Chapter XXV The Combat and Its Issue Lord Aspenley made one or two eager passes at his opponent, which were parried with perfect ease and coolness, and before he had well recovered his position from the last of those lunges, a single clanging sweep of the Major's sword, taking his adversary's blade from the point to the hilt with irresistible force, sent his lordship's weapon whirring through the air some eight or ten yards away. Take your life, my lord said the Major, contemptuously, I give it to you freely, only wishing the present were more valuable. What do you say now, my lord, to the terms? I say, sir, what do I say? echoed his lordship, not very coherently. Major Leary, you have disarmed me, sir, and you ask me what I say to your terms. What do I say? Why, sir, I say again what I said before, that I cannot and will not subscribe to them. Lord Aspenley, 
having thus delivered himself, looked half astonished and half frightened at his own valour. Everyone to his taste, your lordship has an uncommon inclination for slaughter observed the major coolly, walking to the spot where lay the little gentleman's sword, raising it, and carelessly presenting it to him, take it, my lord, and use it more cautiously than you have done, defend yourself. Little expecting another encounter, yet ashamed to decline it, his lordship, with a trembling hand, grasped the weapon once more, and again their blades were crossed in deadly combat. This time his lordship prudently forbore to risk his safety by an impetuous attack upon an adversary so cool and practised as the major, and of whose skill he had just had so convincing a proof. Major Leary, therefore, began the attack, and pressing his opponent with some slight feints and passes, followed him closely as he retreated for some twenty yards, and then, suddenly striking up to the point of his lordship's sword with his own, he seized the little nobleman's right arm at the wrist with a grasp like a vice, and once more held his life at his disposal. Take your life for the second and the last time said the major, having suffered the wretched little gentleman for a brief pause to fully taste the bitterness of death, mind, my lord, for the last time, and so saying, he contemptuously flung his lordship from him by the arm which he grasped. Now, my lord, before we begin for the last time, listen to me said the major, with a sternness, which commanded all the attention of the affrighted peer, I desire that you should fully understand what I propose. I would not like to kill you under a mistake, there is nothing like a clear, mutual understanding during a quarrel. Such an understanding being once established, bloodshed, if it unfortunately occurs, can scarcely, even in the most scrupulous bosom, excite the mildest regret. I wish, my lord, to have nothing whatever to reproach myself within the catastrophe which you appear to have resolved shall overtake you, and, therefore, I'll state the whole case for your dying consolation in as few words as possible. Don't be in a hurry. My lord, I'll not detain you more than five minutes in this miserable world. Now, my lord, you have two strong, indeed I may call them in every sense fatal, objections to my proposal. The first is, that if you write the letter I propose, you must fight Sir Richard and young Henry Ashwood. Now, I pledge myself, my soul, and honour, as a Christian, a soldier, and a gentleman, that I will stand between you and them, that I will protect you completely from all responsibility upon that score, and that if anyone is to fight with either of them, it shall not be you. Your second objection is, that having been fool enough to tell the world that you were coming here for a wife, you are ashamed to go away without one. Now, without meaning to be offensive, I never heard anything more idiotic in the whole course of my life. But if it must be so, and that you cannot go away without a wife, why the DL don't you ask Emily Copland, a fine girl with some thousands of pounds, I believe, and at all events dying for love of you, as I am sure you see yourself. You can't care for one more than the other, and why the deuce need you trouble your head about their gossip, if anyone wonders at the change. And now, my lord, mark me. I have said all that is to be said in the way of commentary or observation upon my proposal, and I must add a word or two about the consequences of finally rejecting it. I have spared your life twice, my lord, within these five minutes. If you refuse the accommodation I have proposed, I will a third time give you an opportunity of disembarrassing yourself of the whole affair by running me through the body, in which, if you fail, so sure as you are this moment alive and breathing before me, you shall, at the end of the next five, be a corpse. So help me God. Major Leary paused, leaving Lord Aspinley in a state of confusion and horror, scarcely short of distraction. There was no mistaking the Major's manner, and the old Bogarcon already felt in imagination the cold steel busy with his intestines. But, Major Leary said he, despairingly, will you engage, 
Can you pledge yourself that no mischief shall follow from my withdrawing as you say, not that I would care to avoid a duel when occasion required, but no one likes to unnecessarily risk himself. Will you indeed prevent all unpleasantness? Did I pledge my soul and honour that I would, inquired the Major sternly. Well, I am satisfied. I do agree replied his lordship. But is there any occasion for me to remove tonight? Every occasion replied the Major, coolly. You must come directly with me, and write the letter, and this evening, before supper, you must leave Morley Court. And, above all things, just remember this, let there be no trickery or treachery in this matter. So sure as I see the smallest symptom of anything of the kind, I will bring about such another piece of work as has not been for many a long day. Am I fully understood? Perfectly, perfectly, my dear sir replied the nobleman. Clearly understood. And believe me, Major, when I say that nothing but the fact that I myself, for private reasons, am not unwilling to break the matter off, could have induced me to cooperate with you in this business. Believe me, sir, otherwise I should have fought until one or other of us had fallen to rise no more. To be sure you would, my lord rejoined the major, with edifying gravity. And in the meantime your lordship will much oblige me by walking up to the house. There's pen and paper in Sir Richard's study, and between us we can compose something worthy of the occasion. Now, my lord, if you please. Thus, side by side, walked the two elderly gentlemen, like the very best friends, towards the old house. And shrewd indeed would have been that observer who could have gathered from the manner of either, whatever their flushed faces and somewhat ruffled exterior might have told, as with formal courtesy they threaded the trim arbors together, that but a few minutes before each had sought the other's life. Chapter XXVI The Hell, Gordon Chancy, Luck, Frenzy and a Resolution The night which followed this day found young Henry Ashwood, his purse replenished with banknotes, that day advanced by Craven, to the amount of one thousand pounds, once more engaged in the delirious prosecution of his favourite pursuit, gaming. In the neighbourhood of the theatre, in that narrow street now known as Smock Alley, there stood in those days a kind of coffee house, rather of the better sort. From the public room, in which actors, politicians, officers, and occasionally a member of parliament, or madcap Irish peer, chatted, lounged, and sipped their sack or coffee, the initiated, or, in short, any man with a good coat on his back and a few pounds in his pocket on exchanging a brief whisper with a singularly sleek-looking gentleman, who sate in the perspective of the background, might find his way through a small, baize-covered door in the back of the chamber, and through a lobby or two, and thence upstairs into a suite of rooms, decently hung with gilded leather, and well lighted with a profusion of wax candles, where hazard and cards were played for stakes unlimited except by the fortunes and the credit of those who gamed. The ceaseless clang of the dice box and rattle of the dice upon the table, and the clamorous challenging and taking of the odds upon the throwing, accompanied by the ferocious blasphemies of desperate losers, who, with clenched hands and distracted gestures, poured, unheeded, their frantic railings and imprecations, as they, in unpitted agony, withdrew from the fatal table and now and then the scarcely less hideous interruptions of brutal quarrels, accusations, and recriminations among the excited and half-drunken gamblers, were the sounds which greeted the ear of him who ascended toward this unhallowed scene. The rooms were crowded, the atmosphere hot and stifling, and the company in birth and pretensions, if not in outward attire, to the full as mixed and various as the degrees of fortune which scattered riches and ruin promiscuously among them. In the midst of all this riotous uproar, several persons sate and played at cards as if, as, perhaps, was really the case, perfectly unconscious of the ceaseless hubbub going on around them. 
Here you might see in one place the hair-brained young squire, scarcely three months launched upon the road to ruin, snoring in drunken slumber, in his deep cushioned chair, with his cravat untied, and waistcoat loosened, and his last cup of mulled sack upset upon the table beside him, and streaming upon his velvet breeches and silken hose, while his lightly won banknotes, stuffed into the loose coat pocket, and peeping temptingly from the aperture, invited the fingers of the first chevalier. D. Industry who wished to help himself. In another place you might behold two sharpers fulfilling the conditions of their partnership, by wheedling a half-tipsy simpleton into a quiet game of omba. And again, elsewhere you might descry some bully captain, whose occupation having ended with the Irish wars, indemnified himself as best he might by such contributions as he could manage to leave I from the young and reckless in such haunts as this, busily and energetically engaged in browbeating a timid greenhorn, who has the presumption to fancy that he has won something from the captain, which the captain has forgotten to pay. In another place you may see, unheeded and unheeding, the wretch who has played and lost his last stake, with white, unmeaning face and idiotic grin, glaring upon the floor, thought and feeling palsied, something worse, and more appalling than a maniac. The whole character of the assembly bespoke the recklessness and the selfishness of its ingredients. There was, too, among them a certain coarse and revolting disregard and defiance of the etiquettes and conventional decencies of social life. More than half the men were either drunk or tipsy, some had thrown off their coats and others wore their hats, altogether the company had more the appearance of a band of reckless rioters in a public street, than of an assembly of persons professing to be gentlemen, and congregated in a drawing room. By the fireplace in the first and by far the largest and most crowded of the three drawing rooms, there sate a person whose appearance was somewhat remarkable. He was an ill-made fellow, with long, lank, limber legs and arms, and an habitual lazy stoop. His face was sallow, his mouth, heavy and sensual, was continually moistened with the brandy and water which stood beside him upon a small spider table, placed there for his especial use. His eyes were long cut, and seldom more than half open and carrying in their sleepy glitter a singular expression of treachery and brute cunning. He wore his own lank and grizzled hair, instead of a peruke, and sate before the fire with a drowsy inattention to all that was passing in the room, and, except for the occasional twinkle of his eye as it glanced from the corner of his half-closed lids, he might have been believed to have been actually asleep. His attitude was lounging and listless and all his movements so languid and heavy, that they seemed to be rather those of a somnambulist than of a waking man. His dress had little pretension, and less neatness, it was a suit of threadbare, mulberry-coloured cloth, with steel buttons, and evidently but little acquainted with the clothes brush. His linen was soiled and crumpled, his shoes ill-cleaned, his beard had enjoyed at least two days' undisturbed growth and the dingy hue of his face and hands bespoke altogether the extremest negligence and slovenliness of person. This slovenly and ungainly being, who sate apparently unconscious of the existence of any other earthly thing than the fire on which he gazed, and the grog which from time to time he lazily sipped, was Gordon Chauncey, Esquire, of Skycopper Court, Whitefriar Street, in the city of Dublin, barrister at law a gentleman who had never been known to do any professional business, but who managed, nevertheless, to live, and to possess, somehow or other, the command of very considerable sums of money, which he most advantageously invested by discounting, at exorbitant interest, short bills and promissory notes in such places as that in which he now sate, one of his favourite resorts, by the way. At intervals of from five to ten minutes he slowly drew from the vast pocket of his clumsy coat a bulky pocket book, and sleepily conned over certain memoranda with which its leaves were charged, then having looked into its well-lined receptacles, 
to satisfy himself that no miracle of legerdemain had abstracted the treasure on which his heart was set, he once more fastened the buckle of the leathern budget, and deposited it again in his pocket. This procedure, and his attentions to the spirits and water, which from time to time he swallowed, succeeded one another with a monotonous regularity altogether undisturbed by the uproarious scene which surrounded him. As the night wore apace, and fortune played her wildest pranks, many an applicant, some successfully, and some in vain, sought chance's succour. Come, my fine fellow, tip me a cool hundred exclaimed a fashionably dressed young man, flushed with the combined excitement of wine and the dice and tapping Chancy on the back impatiently with his knuckles, this moment, will you, and be Dio, dear me, dear me, Captain Markham drawled the barrister in a low, drowsy tone, as he turned sleepily toward the speaker, have you lost the other hundred so soon? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Never you mind, old fox. Shell out, if you're going to do it rejoined the applicant. What is it to you? Oh, dear me, dear me, murmured Chauncey, as he languidly drew the pocketbook from his pocket. When shall I make it payable? Tomorrow. D.N. tomorrow replied the captain. I'll sleep all tomorrow. Won't a fortnight do, you harpy? Well, well, sign, sign it here said the usurer, handing the paper, with a pen, to the young gentleman and indicating with his finger the spot where the name was to be written. The Rue wrote his name without ever reading the paper, and Chauncey carefully deposited it in his book. The money, the money, D.N.U., will you never give it, exclaimed the young man, actually stamping with impatience, as if every moment's absence from the hazard table cost him a fortune. Give, give, underscore give underscore them. He seized the notes, and without counting, stuffed them into his coat pocket, and plunged in an instant again among the gamblers who crowded the table. Mr. Chauncey, Mr. Chauncey said a slight young man, whose whole appearance betokened a far progress in the wasting of a mortal decline. His face was pale as death itself, and glittering with the cold, clammy dew of weakness and excitement. The eye was bright, wild, and glassy, and the features of this attenuated face trembled and worked in the spasms of agonized anxiety and despair, with timid voice, and with the fearful earnestness of one pleading for his life, with knees half bent, and head stretched forward, while his thin fingers were clutched and knotted together in restless feverishness. He still repeated at intervals in low, supplicating accents, Mr. Chauncey, Mr. Chauncey, can you spare a moment, sir, Mr. Chauncey, good sir, Mr. Chauncey? For many minutes the worthy barrister gazed on apathetically into the fire, as if wholly unconscious that this piteous spectacle was by his side, and all but begging his attention. Mr. Chauncey, good sir, Mr. Chauncey, kind sir, only one moment, one word, Mr. Chauncey. This time the wretched young man advanced one of his trembling hands, and laid it hesitatingly upon Chance's knee, the seat of mercy, as the ancients thought, but truly here it was otherwise. The hand was repulsed with insolent rudeness, and the wretched suppliant stood trembling in silence before the bill discounter, who looked upon him with a scowl of brute ferocity, which the timid advances he had made could hardly have warranted. Well growled Chauncey, keeping his baleful eyes fixed not very encouragingly upon the poor young man. I have been unfortunate, sir, I have lost my last shilling, that is, the last I have about me at present. Well repeated he. I might win it all back continued the suppliant, becoming more voluble as he proceeded. I might recover it all, it has often happened to me before. Oh, sir, it is possible, underscore certain underscore, if I had but a few pounds to play on. Eh, the old story rejoined Chauncey. Yes, sir, it is indeed, indeed it is, Mr. Chauncey said the young man, eagerly, 
catching at this improvement upon his first laconic address as an indication of some tendency to relent, and making, at the same time, a most woeful attempt to look pleasant, it is, sir, the old story, indeed, but this time it will come out true, indeed it will. Will you do one little note for me, a little one, twenty pounds? No, I won't drawl chancy, imitating with coarse buffoonery the intonation of the request, I won't do a little one for you. Well, for ten pounds, for ten only. No, nor for ten pence rejoined Chancy, tranquilly. You may keep five out of it for the discount, for friendship, only let me have five, just five urged the wasted gambler, with an agony of supplication. No, I won't, just five replied the lawyer. I'll make it payable tomorrow urged the suppliant. Maybe you'll be dead before that drawled Chancy, with a sneer. The life don't look very tough in you. Ah. Mr. Chauncey, dear sir, good Mr. Chauncey said the young man, you often told me you'd do me a friendly turn yet. Do not you remember it, when I was able to lend you money? For God's sake, lend me five pounds now, or anything, I'll give you half my winnings. You'll save me from beggary, ah, sir, for old friendship. Mr. Gordon Chauncey seemed wondrously tickled by this appeal, he gazed sleepily at the fire while he raked the embers with the toe of his shoe, stuffed his hands deep into his breeches pockets, and indulged in a sort of lazy, comfortable laughter, which lasted for several minutes, until at length it subsided, leaving him again apparently unconscious of the presence of his petitioner. Emboldened by the condescension of his quindam friend, the young man made a piteous effort to join in the laughter, an attempt, however, which was speedily interrupted by the hollow cough of consumption. After a pause of a minute or two, during which Chauncey seemed to have forgotten his existence, he once more addressed that gentleman, Well, sir, well, Mr. Chauncey. The barrister turned full upon him with an expression of face not to be mistaken, and in a tone just as unequivocal. He growled, I'm DD if I give you as much as a leaden penny. Be off, there's no begging allowed here, away with you, you blackguard. Having thus delivered himself, Chauncey relapsed into his ordinary dreamy quiet. Every muscle in the pale, wasted face of the ruined, dying gamester quivered with fruitless agony, he opened his mouth to speak, but could not, he gasped and sobbed, and then clutching his lank hands over his eyes and forehead as though he would fain have crushed his head to pieces, he uttered one low cry of anguish, more despairing and appalling than the loudest shriek of horror, and passed from the room unnoticed. Jeffreys, can you lend me fifty or a hundred pounds till tomorrow, said young Ashwood, addressing a middle-aged fop who had just reeled in from an adjoining room. Cuss me, Ashwood. If the thing is a possibility replied he, with a hiccough, I have just been fairly cleaned out by Snarley and two or three others, not one guinea left, confound them all. I've this moment had to beg a crown to pay my chair and link boy home, but Chauncey is here, I saw him not an hour ago in his old corner. So he is, aboard, thank you and Ashwood was instantly by the moneyed man's side. Chauncey. I want a hundred and fifty, quickly, man, are you awake, and so saying, he shook the lawyer roughly by the shoulder. Oh, dear, oh, dear, exclaimed he, in his usual low, sleepy voice, it's Mr. Ashwood, it is indeed, dear me, dear me, and can I oblige you, Mr. Ashwood? Yes, don't I tell you I want a hundred and fifty, or stay, two hundred said Ashwood, impatiently. I'll pay you in a week or less, say tomorrow if you please it. Whatever sum you like, Mr. Ashwood rejoined he, whatever sum or whatever date you please, I declare to God I'm uncommonly glad to do it. Oh, dear, but them dice is unruly. Two hundred, you say, and a, a week we'll say, not to be pressing. Well, well, this money has luck in it, maybe. 
That's a long lane that has no turn, fortune changes sides when it's least expected. Your name here, Mr. Ashwood. The name was signed, the notes taken, and Ashwood once more at the table, but alack a day. Fortune was for once steady, and frowned with consistent obdurateness upon Henry Ashwood. Five minutes had hardly passed, when the two hundred pounds had made themselves wings and followed the larger sums which he had already lost. Again he had recourse to Chancy, again he found that gentleman smooth, gracious, and obliging as he could have wished. Still his luck was adverse, as fast as he drew the notes from his pocket, they were caught and whirled away in the eddy of ruin. Once more from the accommodating barrister he drew a larger sum, still with a like result. So large and frequent were his drafts, that Chauncey was obliged to go away and replenish his exhausted treasury, and still again and again, with a terrible monotony of disaster, young Ashwood continued to lose. At length the grey, cold light of morning streamed drearily through the chinks of the window shutters into the hot chamber of destruction and debauchery. The sounds of daily business began to make themselves heard from the streets. The wax lights were flaring in the sockets. The floor strewn with packs of cards, broken glasses, and plates, and fragments of fowls and bread, and a thousand other disgusting indications of recent riot and debauchery which need not to be mentioned. Soiled and jaded, with bloodshot eyes and haggard faces, the gamblers slunk, one by one, in spiritless exhaustion, from the scene of their distracting orgies, to rest the brain and refresh the body as best they might. With a stunning and indistinct sense of disaster and ruin, a vague, fevered, dreamy remembrance of overwhelming calamity, a stupefying, haunting consciousness that all the clatter, and roaring, and stifling heat, and jostling, and angry words, and smooth, civil speeches of the night past, had been, somehow or other, to him fraught with fearful and tremendous agony, and delirium, and ruin, Ashwood stalked into the street, and mechanically proceeded to the inn where his horse was stabled. The ostler saw, by the haggard, vacant stare with which Ashwood returned his salutation, that something had gone wrong, and, as he held the stirrup for him, he arrived at the conclusion that the young gentleman must have gotten at least a dozen duels upon his hands, to be settled, one and all, before breakfast. The young man dashed the spurs into the high-mettled horse, and traversing the streets at a perilous speed, Without well thinking or knowing whitherward he was proceeding, he found himself at length among the wild lanes and brushwood of the Royal Park, and was recalled to himself by finding his horse rearing and floundering up to his sides in a slough. Having extricated the animal, he dismounted, threw his hat beside him, and, kneeling down, bathed his head and face again and again in the water of a little brook which ran in many a devious winding through the tangled briars and thorns. The cold, refreshing ablution, assisted by the sharp air of the morning, soon brought him to his recollection. The fiend himself must have been by my elbow last night he muttered, as he stood bareheaded, in wild disorder, by the brook's side. I've lost before, and lost heavily too, but such a run, such an infernal string of ruinous losses. First, a thousand pounds gone, swallowed up in little more than an hour, and then the devil knows how much more, curse me, if I can remember how much I borrowed. I am over head and ears in Chance's books. How shall I face my father? And how, in the fiend's name, am I to meet my engagements? Craven will hand me no more of the money. Was I mad or drunk? To go on against such an accursed tide of bad luck, what fury from hell possessed me. I wish I had thrust my hand between the bars, and burnt it to the elbow, before I took the dice box last night. What's to be done? He paused, yes, I must do it, fate, destiny, circumstances drive me to it. I will marry the woman, she can't live very long, it's not likely and even if she does, 
what's that to me? The world is wide enough for us both, and once married, we need not plague one another much with our society. I must see Chauncey about those DD bills or notes, curse me, if I even know when they are payable. My brain swims like a sea. Lady Stukely, Lady Stukely, you are a happy woman, it's an ill wind that blows nobody good, I am resolved, my course is taken. First then for Morley Court, and next for the wealthy widows. I don't half like the thing, but, d in it, what other chance have I? Then away with hesitation, away with thought, fate has ordained it. So saying, the young man donned his hat, caught the bridle of his well-trained steed, vaulted into the saddle, and was soon far on his way to Morley Court, where strange and startling tidings awaited his arrival. Chapter XXA The Departure of the Pier, the Billet and the Shattered Mirror Never yet did day pass more disagreeably to mortal man than that whose early events we have recorded did to Lord Aspenley. His vanity and importance had suffered more mortification within the last few hours than he had ever before encountered in all the eight and sixty winters of his previous useful existence. And spite of the Major's assurances to the contrary, he could not help feeling certain very unpleasant misgivings, as the evening approached, touching the consequences likely to follow to himself from his meditated retreat. He resolved by the Major's advice to leave Morley Court without a formal leave-taking, or, in short, any explanatory interview whatever with Sir Richard. And for the purpose of taking his departure without obstruction or annoyance, he determined that the hour of his setting forth should be that at which the baronet was wont to retire for a time to his dressing room, previously to appearing at supper. The note which was to announce his departure was written and sealed, and deposited in his waistcoat pocket. He felt that it supplied but a very meagre explanation of so decided a step as he was constrained to take, nevertheless it was the only explanation he had to offer. He well knew that its perusal would be followed by an explosion, and he not unwisely thought it best, under all the circumstances to withdraw to a reasonable distance before springing the mine. The evening closed ominously in storm and cloud, the wind was hourly rising, and distant mutterings of thunder bespoke a night of tempest. Lord Aspenley had issued his orders with secrecy, and they were punctually obeyed. At the hour indicated, his own and his servants' horses were at the door. Lord Aspenley was crossing the hall, cloaked, booted, and spurred for the road, when he encountered Emily Copland. Dear me, my lord, can it be possible, surely you are not going to leave us tonight? Indeed, it is but too true, fair lady rejoined his lordship, with a dolorous shrug. An unlucky contretemps requires my attendance in town, my precipitate flight he continued, with an attempt at a playful smile, is accounted for in this note which perhaps you will kindly deliver to Sir Richard, when next you see him. I trust, Miss Copland, that fortune will often grant me the privilege of meeting you. Be assured it is one which I prize above all others. Adieu. His lordship gallantly kissed the hand which was extended to receive the note, and then, with his best bow, withdrew. A few petulant questions which bespoke his inward acerbity, he addressed to his servant, glanced with a very sour aspect at the lowering sky, clambered stiffly into the saddle, and then, desiring his attendant to follow him, rode down the avenue at a speed which seemed prompted by an instinctive dread of pursuit. As the wind howled and the thunder rolled and rumbled nearer and nearer, Emily Copland could not but wonder more and more what urgent and peremptory cause could have induced the little peer to adopt this sudden resolution, and to carry it into effect upon such a night of storm. Surely that motive must be a strange and urgent one which would not brook the delay of a few hours, especially during the violence of such weather as the luxurious little nobleman had perhaps never voluntarily encountered in the whole course of his life. Curiosity prompted her to deliver the note which she held in her hand at once, 
she therefore ran lightly upstairs, and rapidly threading all the intervening lobbies and rambling passages, she knocked at her uncle's door. Come in, come in cried the peevish voice of Sir Richard Ashwood. The girl entered the room. The Italian was at the toilet, arranging his master's dressing case, and the baronet himself in his nightgown and slippers, and with a pamphlet in his hand, reclined listlessly upon a sofa. Who is that, who is it, inquired he in the same tone, without turning his eyes from the volume which he read. Padina, exclaimed the Neapolitan, Miss Emily, she is very seldom come here. You are welcome, Miss Emily, will you seat down, there is chair. Sir Richard, it is Miss Emily. What does the young lady want, inquired he, dryly. I have gotten a note for you, uncle replied she. Well, put it down, put it there on the table, anywhere, I presume it will keep till morning replied he, without removing his eyes from the pages. It is from Lord Aspinley urged the girl. Eh? Lord Aspinley? How, give it to me said the baronet, raising himself quickly and tossing the pamphlet aside. He broke the seal and read the note. Whatever its contents were, they produced upon the baronet an extraordinary effect, he started from the sofa with clenched hands and frantic gesture. Who, where, stop him, after him, he shall answer me, he shall, cried, or rather shrieked, the baronet in the horse, choking scream of fury. After him all, my sword, my horse. By, dash. He'll reckon with me this night. Never did the human form more fearfully embody the passions of hell, he stood before them absolutely transformed. The quivering face was pale as ashes, the livid veins, like blue knotted cordage, protruded upon his forehead, the eye glared and rolled with the light of madness, and as he shook and raved there before them, no dream ever conjured up a spectacle more appalling, he spit upon the letter. He tore it into fragments, and with his gouty feet stamped it into the fire. There was no extravagance of frenzy which he did not enact. He tossed his arms into the air, and dashed his clenched hands upon the table, he stamped, he stormed, he howled, and as with thick and furious utterance he volleyed forth his incoherent threats, mandates, and curses, the foam hung upon his blackened lips. I'll bring him to the dust, to the earth. My very menials shall spurn him. Almighty, that he should dare, trickster, liar, that he should dare to practice upon me this outrageous slight. A, 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 laugh, my lord, laugh on, but by the, dash, this shall bring you to your knees, a, and to your grave, and you, underscore you underscore thundered he turning upon the awestruck and terrified young lady, you no doubt had your share in this, eh, you have, you have, yes, I know you, 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 hollow, lying, dash, quit my house, out with you, turn her out, drive her out, away with her. As the horrible figure advanced towards her, the girl by an effort roused herself from the dreadful fascination, and turning from him, fled swiftly downstairs and fell fainting at the parlour door. Sir Richard still strode through his chamber with the same frantic evidences of unabated fury, and the Italian, the only remaining spectator of the hideous scene, sate calmly in a chair by the toilet, with his legs crossed, and his countenance composed into a kind of sanctimonious placidity, which, however, spite of all his efforts, betrayed at the corners of the mouth and in the twinkle of the eye, a certain enjoyment of the spectacle, which was not altogether consistent with the perfect affection which he professed for his master. A, a, my lord continued the baronet, madly, laugh on, laugh while you may, but by the, dash, you shall gnash your teeth for this. What coning, old gentleman is me Lord Aspinley, ah, very, very said the Italian, reflectively. You shall, my lord continued Sir Richard, furiously. Your disgrace shall be public, exemplary, the insult shall recoil upon, 
yourself, your punishment shall be memorable public, tremendous. Me Lord Aspenley and Sir Richard, both so coning continued the Italian, yes, yes, set one thief to catch the other. The Neapolitan had, no doubt, bargained for the indulgence of his pleasant humour, as usual, free of cost, but he was mistaken. With the quickness of light, Sir Richard grasped a massive glass decanter, full of water, and hurled it at the head of his valet. Luckily for that gentleman's brains, it missed its object, and, alighting upon a huge mirror, it dashed it to fragments with a stunning crash. In the extremity of his fury, Sir Richard grasped a heavy metal inkstand, and just as the valet escaped through the private door of his room, hurled it, too, at his head. Two such escapes were quite enough for Signor Peruxi on one evening, and not wishing to tempt his luck further, he ran nimbly down the stairs, leaped into his own room, and bolted and double-locked the door, and thence, as the night wore on, he still heard Sir Richard pacing up and down his chamber, and storming and raving in dreadful rivalry with the thunder and hurricane without. Chapter XX The Thunderstorm the ebony stick, the unseen visitant, terror. At length the uproar in Sir Richard's room died away. The hoarse voice in furious soliloquy, and the rapid tread as he paced the floor, were no longer audible. In their stead was heard alone the stormy wind rushing and yelling through the old trees, and at intervals the deep volleying thunder. In the midst of this hubbub the Italian rubbed his hands, tripped lightly up and down his room placed his ear at the keyhole, and chuckled and rubbed his hands again in a paroxysm of glee, now and again venting his gratification in brief ejaculations of intense delight, the very incarnation of the spirit of mischief. The sounds in Sir Richard's room had ceased for two hours or more, and the piping wind and the deep-mouthed thunder still roared and rattled. The Neapolitan was too much excited to slumber. He continued therefore, to pace the floor of his chamber, sometimes gazing through his window upon the black stormy sky and the blue lightning, which leaped in blinding flashes across its darkness, revealing for a moment the ivied walls, and the tossing trees, and the fields and hills, which were as instantaneously again swallowed in the blackness of the tempestuous night, and then turning from the casement, he would plant himself by the door, and listen with eager curiosity for any sound from Sir Richard's room. As we have said before, several hours had passed, and all had long been silent in the baronet's apartment, when on a sudden Peruxi thought he heard the sharp and well-known knocking of his patron's ebony stick upon the floor. He ran and listened at his own door. The sound was repeated with unequivocal and vehement distinctness and was instantaneously followed by a prolonged and violent peal from his master's hand bell. The summons was so sustained and vehement, that the Italian at length cautiously withdrew the bolt, unlocked the door, and stole out upon the lobby. So far from abating, the sound grew louder and louder. On tiptoe he scaled the stairs, until he reached to about the midway, and he there paused for he heard his master's voice exerted in a tone of terrified entreaty, not now, not now, avaunt, not now. Oh, God, help cried the well-known voice. These words were followed by a crash, as of some heavy body springing from the bed, then a rush upon the floor, then another crash. The voice was hushed, but in its stead the wild storm made a long and plaintive moan, and the listener's heart turned cold. Malara, underscore corpo di Pluto, underscore muttered he between his teeth. What is it? Will he ring again? Santo Genero, there is something wrong. He paused in fearful curiosity, but the summons was not repeated. Five minutes passed, and yet no sound but the howling and pealing of the storm. Peruxi, with a beating heart ascended the stairs and knocked at the door of his patron's chamber. No answer was returned. Sir Richard, Sir Richard cried the man, do you want me, Sir Richard? 
still no answer. He pushed open the door and entered. A candle, wasted to the very socket, stood upon a table beside the huge hearse-like bed, which, for the convenience of the invalid, had been removed from his bedchamber to his dressing room. The light was dim, and waved uncertainly in the eddies which found their way through the chinks of the window, so that the lights and shadows flitted ambiguously across the objects in the room. At the end of the bed a table had been upset, and lying near it upon the floor was something, a heap of bedclothes, or, could it be, yes, it was Sir Richard Ashwood. Panksy approached the prostrate figure, it was lying upon its back, the countenance fixed and livid, the eyes staring and glazed, and the jaw fallen, he was a corpse. The Italian stooped down and took the hand of the dead man, it was already cold, he called him by his name and shook him, but all in vain. There lay the cunning intriguer, the fierce, fiery prodigal, the impetuous, unrelenting tyrant the unbelieving, reckless man of the world, a ghastly lump of clay. Illustration, Paruxi approached the prostate figure. To face page 156. With strange emotions the Neapolitan gazed upon the lifeless effigy from which the evil tenant had been so suddenly and fearfully called to its eternal and unseen abode. Gone, dead, all over, all past muttered he, slowly while he pressed his foot upon the dead body, as if to satisfy himself that life was indeed extinct, quite gone. Canchiro. It was ugly death, there was something with him, what was he speaking with? Paruxi walked to the door leading to the great staircase, but found it bolted as usual. Pshaw, there was nothing said he, looking fearfully round the room as he approached the body again and repeating the negative as if to reassure himself, no, no, nothing, nothing. He gazed again on the awful spectacle in silence for several minutes. Corbett Solly, and so it is over at length he ejaculated, the game is ended. See, see, the breast is bare, and there the two marks of Aldini's stiletto. Ah! Bricone, Bricone, what wild fellow were you? underscore panzanera underscore, for a pretty ankle and a pair of black eyes, you would dare the devil. Rotto di Icolo, his face is moving it is only the light that wavers. Diamine. The face is terrible. What made him speak? Nothing was with him, sure. Nothing could come to him here, no, no, nothing. As he thus spoke. The wind swept vehemently upon the windows with a sound as if some great thing had rushed, against them, and was pressing for admission, and the gust blew out the candle, the blast died away in a lengthened wail, and then again came rushing and howling up to the windows, as if the very prince of the powers of the air himself were thundering at the casement, then again the blue dazzling lightning glared into the room and gave place to deeper darkness. Pa that lightning smells like brimstone. Sank de you endure, I hear something in the room. Yielding to his terrors, Paruxi stumbled to the door opening upon the great lobby, and with cold and trembling fingers drawing the bolt, sprang to the stairs and shouted for assistance in a tone which speedily assembled half the household in the chamber of death. Chapter 6 The Crones, The Corpse and the sharper. Haggard, exhausted, and in no very pleasant temper, Henry Ashwood rode up the avenue of Morley Court. I shall have a blessed conference with my father thought he, when he learns the fate of the thousand pounds I was to have brought him, a pleasant interview, by, dash. How shall I open it? He'll be no better than a bedlamite. By, dash. A pretty hot kettle of fish this, but through it I must flounder as best I may, curse it, what am I afraid of? Thus muttering, he leaped from the saddle, leaving the well-trained steed to make his way to the stable, and entered at the half-open door. In the hall he encountered a servant, but was too much occupied by his own busy reflections to observe the earnest, awestruck countenance of the old domestic.
Mr. Henry, Mr. Henry, stay, sir, stay, one moment said the man, following and endeavouring to detain him. Ashwood, however, without heeding the interruption, hastened by him, and mounted the stairs with long and rapid strides, resolved not unnecessarily to defer the interview which he believed must come sooner or later. He opened Sir Richard's door, and entered the chamber. He looked round the room for the object of his search in vain, but to his unmeasured astonishment, beheld instead three old shriveled hags seated by the hearth, who all rose upon his entrance, except one, who was warming something in a saucepan upon the fire, and each and all resumed respectively the visages of woe which best became the occasion. A. Eh? How is this? What brings you here, nurse? exclaimed the young man, in a tone of startled curiosity. The old lady whom he addressed thought it advisable to weep, and instead of returning any answer, covered her face with her apron, turned away her head, and shook her palsied hand towards him with a gesture which was meant to express the mute anguish of unutterable sorrow. What is it? said Ashwood. Are you all tongue tied? Speak, some of you. Oh, Musha, Musha, the Crather observed the second witch, with a most lugubrious shake of the head, but it is he that's to be pitied. Oh, Wisha, Wisha, wire is through. What the DL ails you? Can't you speak out? Where's my father? repeated the young man, with impatient perplexity. With the blessed saints in glory replied the third hag giving the saucepan a slight whisk to prevent the contents from burning, and if ever there was an angel on earth, he was one. Well, well, he has his reward, that's one comfort, sure. The crown of glory, with the holy apostles, it's his to be envied, up in heaven, though he went mighty sudden, surely. This was followed by a kind of semi-dolorous shake of the head, in which the three old women joined. With a hurried step, young Ashwood strode to the bedside, drew the curtain, and gazed upon the sharp and fixed features of the corpse, as it leered with unclosed eyes from among the bedclothes. It would not have been easy to analyse the feelings with which he looked upon this spectacle. A kind of incredulous horror sate upon his compressed features. He touched the hand, which rested stiffly upon the coverlet, as if doubtful that the old man, whom he had so long feared and obeyed, was actually dead. The cold, dull touch that met his was not to be mistaken, and he gazed fixedly with that awful curiosity with which in death the well-known features of a familiar face are looked on. There lay the being whose fierce passions had been to him from his earliest days a source of habitual fear, in childhood, even of terror, henceforth to be no more to him than a thing which had never been. There lay the scheming, busy head, but what availed all its calculations and its cunning now? No more thought or power has it than the cushion on which it stiffly rests. There lies the proud, worldly, unforgiving, violent man, a senseless effigy of cold clay, a grim, impassive monument of the recent presence of the unearthly visitant. It's a beautiful corpse, if the eyes were only shut observed one of the crones approaching, a pretty corpse as ever was stretched. The hands is very handsome entirely observed another of them, and so small, like a lady's. It's himself was the good master observed the old nurse, with a slow shake of the head, the likes of him did not thread in shoe leather. Oh! But my heart's sore for you this day, Mr. Harry. Thus speaking, with a good deal of screwing and puckering, she succeeded in squeezing a tear from one eye, like the last drop from an exhausted lemon, and suffering it to rest upon her cheek, that it might not escape observation, she looked round with a most pity-moving visage upon her companions, and an expression of face which said as plainly as words, what a faithful, attached, old creature I am, and how well I deserve any little token of regard which Sir Richard's will may have bequeathed. Me. Ah, then, look at him said the matron of the saucepan, gazing with the most touching commiseration upon Henry Ashwood, 
see how he looks at it. Oh, but it's he that adored him. Oh, the Kratha, what will he do this day? Look at him there, he's an orphan now, God help him. Be off with yourselves, and leave me here said Henry, now Sir Henry, Ashwood, turning sharply upon them. Send me someone that can speak a word of sense, call Paruxai here, and get out of the room every one of you, away. With abundance of muttering and grumbling, and many an indignant toss of the head, and many a dignified sniff, the old women hobbled from the room, and Henry Ashwood had hardly been left alone, when the small private door communicating with Paruxai's apartment, opened, and the valet peeped in. Come in, come in, Jacopo said the young man, come in, and close the door. When did this happen? The Neapolitan recounted briefly the events which we have already recorded. It was a fit, some sudden seizure said the young man, glancing at the features of the corpse. Yes, very like, very like said Paruxai, he used to complain sometimes that his head was swimming round, and pains and aches, but there was something more, something more. What do you mean, don't speak riddles said Ashwood. I mean this. Then replied the Italian, something came to him, something was in the room when he died. How do you know that, inquired the young man. I heard him talking loudly with it replied he, talking and praying it to go away from him. Why did you not come into the room yourself, asked Ashwood. So I did, Diamine, so I did replied he. Well, what saw you? Nothing but Sir Richard dead, quite dead, and the far door was bolted inside, just so as he always used to do, and when the candle went out, the thing was here again. I heard it myself, as sure as I am leaving man, I heard it, close up with me, by the body. Tut, tut, man, speak sense. Do you mean to say that anyone talked with you, said Ashwood? I mean this that something was in the chamber with me beside the dead man replied the valet, doggedly. I heard it with my own ears. Zuckchia. I most av been deaf, if I did not hear it. It said hish and then again, close up to my face, it said it, hish, hish and laughed below its breath. Pa. The place smelt of brimstone. In plain terms, then. You believe that the devil was in the room, is that it, said Ashwood, with a ghastly smile of contempt. Oh, no replied the servant, with a sneer as ghastly, it was an angel, of course, an angel from heaven. No more of this folly, sir said Ashwood, sharply. Your own dd cowardice fills your brain with these fancies. Here, give me the keys, and show me where the papers are laid. I shall first examine the cabinets here, and then in the library. Now open this one, and do you hear, Paruxai, not one word of this cock and bull story of yours to the servants. Good God! My brain's unsettled. I can scarcely believe my father dead, dead and again he stood by the bedside, and looked upon the still face of the corpse. We must send for Craven at once said Ashwood turning from the bed, I must confer with him, he knows better than anyone else how all my father's affairs stand. There are some DD bills out, I believe, but we'll soon know. Having dispatched an urgent note to Craven, the insinuating attorney, to whom we have already introduced the reader, Sir Henry Ashwood proceeded roughly to examine the contents of boxes, escritoires, and cabinets filled with dusty papers, and accompanied and directed in his search by the Italian. You never heard him mention a will, did you? inquired the young man. The Neapolitan shook his head. You did not know of his making one, he resumed. No, no, I cannot remember said the Italian, reflectively, but he added quickly while a peculiar meaning lit up the piercing eyes which he turned upon the interrogator, but do you wish to find one? Maybe I could help you to find one. Pshaw, folly, 
what do you take me for, retorted Ashwood, slightly colouring, in spite of his habitual insensibility, for Paroxai was too intimate with his principles for him to assume ignorance of his meaning. Why the devil should I wish to find a will, since I inherit everything without it? Senior said the little man, after an interval of silence, during which he seemed absorbed in deep reflection, I have mosh to say about what I shall do with myself, and some things to ask from you. I will begin and end it here and now, it is best over at once. I have served Sir Richard there for thirty-four years. I have served him well, very well. I have taught him great secrets. I have won great abundance of good monies for him, if he was not rich it is not my fault. I attend him through his sickness, and A.V. been his companion for the half of a long life. What else I A.V. done for him I need not count up, but most of it you know well. Sir Richard is there, dead and gone, the service is ended, and now I A.V. resolved I will go back again to Italy, to Naples, where I was born. You shall never hear of me any more if you will do for me one little thing. What is it? speak out. You want to extort money, is it so, said Ashwood, slowly and sternly. I want continued the man, with equal distinctness and deliberateness, I want one thousand pounds. I do not ask a penny more, and I will not take a penny less, and if you give me that, I will never trouble you more with word of mine, you will never hear or see honest Jacopo Peruxi any more. Come, come. Jacopo, that were paying a little too dear, even for such a luxury replied Ashwood. A thousand pounds. Ha! Ha! A modest request, truly. I half suspect your brain is a little crazed. Remember what I have done, all I have done for him rejoined the Italian, coolly. And above all, remember what I have not done for him. I could have had him hanged up by the neck, hanged like a dog, but I never did. Oh! No, never, though not a day went by that I might not have brought the house full of officers, and have him away to jail and get him hanged. Remember all that, senior, and say is it in conscience to mosh, underscore rotter di collo, underscore it is not half, no, nor quarter so mosh as I ought to ask. No nor as you ought to give, senior, without me to ask at all. Peruxi, you are either mad or drunk, or take me to be so said Ashwood, who could not feel quite comfortable in disputing the claims of the Italian, nor secure in provoking his anger. But at all events, there is ample time to talk about these matters. We can settle it all more at our ease in a week or so. No, no, senior. I will have my answer now replied the man, doggedly. Mr. Craven has money now, the money of Miss Mary's land that Sir Richard got from her. But though the money is there now, in a week or little more we will not see mosh of it, and my pocket will remain empty, underscore Corbett Solly, underscore am I a fool. I tell you, Peruxi, I will give you no promises now exclaimed the young man, vehemently. Why? D it, the blood is hardly cold in the old man's veins, and you begin to pester me for money. Can't you wait till he's buried? Eh, yes, yes, wait till he's buried, and then wait till the morning's off, and then wait for something more said the Neapolitan, with a sneer, and so wait on till the money's all spent. No, no, senior, underscore corpo di bacco, underscore I will have it now. I will have my answer now, before Mr. Craven comes, underscore Giro di Dio underscore, I will have my answer. Don't talk like a madman, Peruxi replied the young man, angrily. I have no money here. I will make no promises. And besides, your request is perfectly ridiculous and unconscionable. I ask for a thousand pounds replied the valet. I must have the promise now, senior, and the money today. If you do not promise it here and at once, 
I will not ask again, and maybe you will be sorry. I will take one thousand pounds. I want no more, and I accept no less. Senior, your answer. There was a cool, menacing insolence in the manner of the fellow which stung the pride of the young baronet to the quick. Scoundrel said he, do you think I am to be bullied by your audacious threats? Do you dream that I am weak enough to suffer a wretch like you to practice his extortions upon me? By, dash, you'll find to your cost that you have no longer to deal with a master who is in your power. What care I for your utmost? Do your worst, miscreant, I defy you. I warn you only to beware of giving an undue license to your foul, lying tongue, for if I find that you have been spreading your libelous tales abroad, I'll have you pilloried and whipped. Well, you have given me an answer replied the Italian coolly. I will ask no more, and now, senor, farewell, adieu. I think, perhaps, you will hear of me again. I will not return here any more after I go out. And so, for the last time he continued, approaching the cold form which lay upon the bed, Farewell to you, Sir Richard Ashwood. While I am alive I will never see your face again, perhaps, if holy friars tell true, we may meet again. Till then, till then, farewell. With this strange speech the Neapolitan, having gazed for a brief space, with a strange expression, in which was a dash of something very nearly approaching to sorrow, upon the stern, moveless face before him, and then with an effort, and one long-drawn sigh, having turned away, deliberately withdrew from the room through the small door which led to his own apartment. The lad Sarin will come to himself in a little muttered Ashwood, he will think twice before he leaves this place, he'll cool, he'll cool. Thus soliloquizing, the young man locked up the presses and desks which he had opened, bolted the door after the Italian, and hurried from the room, for, somehow or other, he felt uneasy and fearful alone in the chamber with the body. Chapter XXX Sky Copper Court Upon the evening of the same day, the Italian having collected together the few movables which he called his own, and left them ready for removal in the chamber which he had for so long exclusively occupied, might have been seen, emerging from the old manor house, and with a small parcel in his hand, wending his solitary, moonlit way across the broad wooded pasture lands of Morley Court. Without turning to look back upon the familiar scene, which he was now forever leaving, for all his faculties and feelings, such as they were, had busy occupation in the measures of revenge which he was keenly pursuing, he crossed the little stile which terminated the pathway he was following, and descended upon the public road, shaking from his hat and cloak the heavy drops, which in his progress the close underwood through which he brushed had shed upon him. With a quickened pace, and with a stern, almost a savage countenance, over which from time to time there flitted a still more ominous smile, and muttering between his teeth many a short and vehement apostrophe as he went, he held his way directly toward the city of Dublin, and once within the streets, he was not long in reaching the ancient, and by this time to the reader, familiar mansion, over whose portal swung the glittering sign of the cock and anchor. Now, then thought Peruxi, let us see whether I have not one card left, and that a trump. What? because I wear no sword myself, shall you escape unpunished? Fool, miscreant, I will this night conjure up such an avenger as will appall even you, I will send him with a thousand atrocious wrongs upon his head, frantic into your presence, you had better cope with an actual incarnate demon. Such were the exulting thoughts which lighted the features of Peruxi with a fitful smile of singular grimness as he entered the inn-yard where meeting one of the waiters, he promptly inquired for a Connor. To his dismay, however, he learned that that gentleman had quitted the cock and anchor on the day before, and whither he had gone, none could inform him. As he stood, pondering in bitter disappointment what step was next to be taken, somebody tapped his shoulder smartly from behind. He turned, 
and beheld the square form and swarthy features of a Hanlon, whose interview with a Connor is recorded early in these pages. After a few brief questions and answers, in which, by reference to the portly proprietor of the cock and anchor who vouched for the accuracy of his representations, a Hanlon satisfied the vindictive foreigner that he might safely communicate the subject of his intended communication to him, as to the sure friend of Mr. O'Connor. Both personages, Peruxi and Ahanlon, or, as he was there called, Dwyer, repaired to a private room, where they remained closeted for fully half an hour. That interview had its consequences, consequences of which sooner or later the reader shall fully hear, and which were perhaps somewhat unlike those calculated upon by honest Jacopo. It is not necessary to detain the reader with a description of the ceremonial which conducted the mortal remains of Sir Henry Ashwood to the grave. It is enough to say that if pomp and pageantry, lavished upon the fleeting tenement of clay which it has deserted, can delight the departed spirit, that of the deceased baronet was happy. The funeral was an aristocratic procession, well worthy of the rank and pretensions of the distinguished dead, and in numbers and eclat such as to satisfy even the exactions of Irish pride. Carriages and four were there in abundance, and others of lesser note without number. Outriders, and footmen, and corpulent coachmen filled the court and avenue of the manor, and crowded its hall, where refreshments enough for a garrison were heaped together upon the tables. The funeral feasting and revelry finished, the enormous mob of coaches, horses, and lackeys began to arrange itself, and assume something like order. The great velvet-covered coffin was carried out upon the shoulders of six footmen, staggering under the leaden load, and was laid in the hearse. The high-born company, dressed in the fantastic trappings of mourning, began to show themselves one by one, or in groups, at the hall door, and took their places in their respective vehicles, and at length the enormous volume began to uncoil, and gradually passing down the great avenue, and winding along the road, to proceed toward the city, covering from the coffin to the last carriage a space of more than a mile in length. The body was laid in the Isle of St. Ordone's Church, and a comely monument, recording in eloquent periods the virtues of the deceased, was reared by the piety of his son. The Isle, however, in which it stood, is now a rootless ruin, and this, along with many a more curious relic, has crumbled into dust from its time-worn wall, so that there now remains, except in these idle pages, no record to tell posterity that so important a personage as Sir Richard Ashwood ever existed at all. Of all who donned the customary suit of solemn black upon the death of Sir Richard Ashwood, but one human being felt a pang of sorrow. But there was one whose grief was real and poignant, one who mourned for him as though he had been all that was fond and tender, who forgot and forgave all his faults and failings, and remembered only that he had been her father and she his child, and companion, and gentle, patient nurse tender through many an hour of pain and sickness. Mary wept for his death bitterly for many a day and night, for all that he had ever done or said to give her pain her noble nature found entire forgiveness, and every look, and smile, and word, and tone that had ever borne the semblance of kindness, were all treasured in her memory, and all called up again in affectionate and sorrowful review. Seldom indeed had the hard nature of Sir Richard evinced even such transient indications of tenderness, and when they did appear they were still more rarely genuine. But Mary felt that an object of her kindly care and companionship was gone, a familiar face forever hidden, one of the only two who were near to her in the ties of blood, departed to return no more, and with all the deep, strong yearnings of kindred, she wept and mourned after her father. Emily Copland had left Morley Court and was now residing with her gay relative, Lady Stukeley, so that poor Mary was left almost entirely alone and her brother, Sir Henry, was so immersed in business and papers that she scarcely saw him even for a moment except while he swallowed his hasty meals, and sooth to say, 
his thoughts were not much oftener with her than his person. Though, as the reader is no doubt fully aware, Sir Henry's grief for the loss of his parent was by no means of that violent kind which refuses to be comforted, yet he was too chary of the world's opinion, as well as too punctilious an observer of etiquette, to make the cheerfulness of his resignation under this dispensation startlingly apparent by any overt act of levity or indifference. Sir Henry, however, must see Gordon Chancy, he must ascertain how much he owes him and when it is all payable, facts of which he has, if any, the very dimmest and vaguest possible recollection. Therefore, upon the very day on which the funeral had taken place, as soon as the evening had closed, and darkness succeeded the twilight, the young baronet ordered his trusty servant to bring the horses to the door, and then muffling himself in his cloak, and drawing it about his face, so that even in the reflection of an accidental link he might not by possibility be recognized, he threw himself into the saddle, and telling his servant to follow him, rode rapidly through the dense obscurity towards the town. When he had reached Whitefriar Street, he checked his pace to a walk, and calling his attendant to his side, directed him to await his return there, then dismounting, he threw him the bridle and proceeded upon his way. Guided by the hazy starlight and by an occasional gleam from a shop window or tavern door, as well as by the dusky glimmer of the wretched street lamps, the young man directed his course for some way along the open street, and then turning to the right into a dark archway which opened from it, he found himself in a small, square court, surrounded by tall, dingy, half-ruinous houses which loomed darkly around deepening the shadows of the night into impenetrable gloom. From some of these dilapidated tenements issued smothered sounds of quarrelling, indistinctly mingled with the crying of children and the shrill accents of angry females, from others the sounds of discordant singing and riotous carousel, while, as far as the eye could discern, few places could have been conceived with an aspect more dreary, forbidding, and cut-throat, and, in all respects, more depressing and suspicious. This is unquestionably the place exclaimed Ashwood, as he stepped cautiously over the broken pavement, there is scarcely another like it in this town or any other, but beshrew me if I remember which is the house. He entered one of them, the hall door of which stood half open, and through the chinks of whose parlour door were issuing faint streams of light and gruff sounds of talking. At one of these doors he knocked sharply with his whip handle, and instantly the voices were hushed. After a silence of a minute or two, the parties inside resumed their conversation, and Ashwood more impatiently repeated his summons. There is someone knocking, I told you there was exclaimed a harsh voice from within. Open the door, Corny, and take a squint. The door opened cautiously, a great head covered with shaggy elf locks, was thrust through the aperture, and a singularly ill-looking face, as well as the imperfect light would allow Ashwood to judge, was advanced towards his. The fellow just opened the door far enough to suffer the ray of the candle to fall upon the countenance of his visitant, and staring suspiciously into his face for some time, while he held the lock of the door in his hand, he asked, Well, neighbour, did you rap at this door? Yes, I want to be directed to Mr. Chance's rooms, replied Ashwood. Mr. Who, repeated the man. Mr. Chancey, underscore Chancey underscore, he lives in this court, and, unless I am mistaken, in this house, or the next to it rejoined Ashwood. Chancey, I don't know him, answered the man. Do you know where Mr. Chancey lives, Garvey? Not I nor don't care rejoined the person addressed, with a hoarse growl, and without taking the trouble to turn from the fire, over which he was cowering, with his back toward the door. Slap the door to, can't you, and don't keep Gosther in there all night. No, he won't slap the door exclaimed the shrill voice of a female. I'll see the gentleman myself. Well, sir she cried, presenting a tall, raw-boned figure arrayed in tawdry rags, 
at the door, and shoving the man with the unkempt locks aside, she eyed Ashwood with a leer and a grin that were anything but inviting, well, sir, is there anything I can do for you? The chaps here is not used to quality, and Partha has a mighty ignorant manner, but they are placeable boys, and means no offence. Who is it you're looking for, sir? Mr. Gordon Chauncey, he lives in one of these houses. Can you direct me to him? No, we can't said the fellow from the fire, in a savage tone. I told you before. Won't you take your answer, won't you? Slap that door, Corny, or I'll get up to him myself. Hud your tongue, you gull bird, won't you, rejoined the female, in accents of shrill displeasure. Chauncey, is not he the counsellor gentleman, he has a yellow face and a down look, and never has his hands out of his breeches pockets. The very man replied Ashwood. Well, sir, he does live in this court, he has the parlour next door. The street door stands open, it's a lodging house. One door further on, you can't miss him. Thank you, thank you said Ashwood. Good night. And as the door was closed upon him, he heard the voices of those within raised in hot debate. He stumbled and groped his way into the hall of the house which the gracious nymph, to whom he had just bidden farewell, indicated, and knocked stoutly at the parlour door. It was opened by a sluttish girl, with bare feet, and a black eye, which had reached the green and yellow stage of recovery. She had probably been interrupted in the midst of a spirited altercation with the barrister, for ill humour and excitement were unequivocally glowing in her face. Ashwood walked in, and found matters as we shall describe them in the next chapter. Chapter XXXI The Usurer and the Oaken Box The room which Sir Henry Ashwood entered was one of squalid disorder. It was a large apartment originally handsomely wainscoted, but damp and vermin had made woeful havoc in the broad panels, and the ceiling was covered with green and black blotches of mildew. No carpet covered the bare boards, which were strewn with fragments of papers, rags, splinters of an old chest, which had been partially broken up to light the fire, and occasionally a potato skin, a bone, or an old shoe. The furniture was scant, and no one piece matched the other. Little and bad as it was, its distribution about the room was more comfortless and wretched still. All was dreary disorder, dust, and dirt, and damp, and mildew, and rat holes. By a large grate, scarcely half filled with a pile of ashes and a few fragments of smouldering turf, sat Gordon Chauncey, the master of this notable establishment. His arm rested upon a dirty deal table, and his fingers played listlessly with a dull and battered pewter goblet, which he had just replenished from a two-quart measure of strong beer which stood upon the table, and whose contents had dabbled that piece of furniture with sundry mimic lakes and rivers. Unrestrained by the ungenerous confinement of a fender, the cinders strayed over the cracked hearthstone, and even wandered to the boards beyond it. Mr. Gordon Chauncey was himself, too, rather in dishabille. He had thrown off his shoes, and was in his stockings, which were unfortunately rather imperfect at the extremities. His waistcoat was unbuttoned, and his cravat lay upon the table, swimming in a sea of beer. As Ashwood entered, with ill-suppressed disgust, this loathly den, the object of his visit languidly turned his head and his sleepy eyes over his shoulder, in the direction of the door, and without making the smallest effort to rise, contented himself with extending his hand along the sloppy table, palm upwards, for Ashwood to shake, at the same time exclaiming, with a drawl of gentle placidity, Oh, dear, oh, dear me! Mr. Ashwood, I declare to God I am very glad to see you. Won't you sit down and have some beer? Eliza, bring a cup for my friend, Mr. Ashwood. Will you take a pipe too? I have some elegant tobacco. Bring my pipe to Mr. Ashwood, and the little canister that M. Quirk left here last night. 
I am much obliged to you said Ashwood, with difficulty swallowing his anger, and speaking with marked hauteur, my visit, though an unseasonable one, is entirely one of business. I shall not give you the trouble of providing any refreshment for me, in a word, I have neither time nor appetite for it. I want to learn exactly how you and I stand, five minutes will show me the state of the account. Oh, dear, oh, dear, and won't you take any beer, then, it's elegant beer, from Mr. Emgin's there, round the corner. Ashwood bit his lips, and remained silent. Eliza, bring a chair for my friend, Sir Henry Ashwood continued Chauncey, he must be very tired, indeed he must, after his long walk, and here, Eliza, take the key and open the press, and do you see, bring me the little oak box on the second shelf. She's a very good little girl, Mr. Ashwood, I assure you. Eliza is a very sensible, good little girl. Oh, dear, oh, dear. But your father's death was very sudden, but old chaps always goes off that way, on short notice. Oh, dear me, I declare to, dash, only I had a pain in my, here he mentioned his lower stomach somewhat abruptly, I'd have gone to the funeral this morning. There was a great lot of coaches, wasn't there? Pray, Mr. Chauncey said Ashwood, preserving his temper with an effort, let us proceed at once to business. I am pressed for time, and I shall be glad, with as little delay as possible, to ascertain, what I suppose there can be no difficulty in learning, the exact state of our account. Well, I'm very sorry, so I am, Mr. Ashwood, that you are in such a hurry, I declare to, I am observed Chauncey, supplying Big Goblet afresh from the larger measure. Eliza, have you the box? Well, bring it here, and put it down on the table, like an elegant little girl. The girl shoved a small oaken chest over to Chance's elbow, and he forthwith proceeded to unlock it, and to draw forth the identical red leather pocketbook which had received in its pages the records of Ashwood's disasters upon the evening of their last meeting. Here I have them. Captain Markham, no, that is not it said Chauncey, sleepily turning over the leaves, but this is it, Mr. Ashwood, eh, here, first. Two hundred pounds. Promissory note. Payable one week after date. Mr. Ashwood, again, one hundred and fifty. Promissory note, one week. Lord Kilblatters, no, eh, here again, Mr. Ashwood, two hundred. Promissory note, one week. Mr. Ashwood, two hundred and fifty. Promissory note, one week. Mr. Ashwood, one hundred. Mr. Ashwood, 50. Oh, dear me. Dear me. Mr. Ashwood, 300. And so on, till it appeared that Sir Henry Ashwood stood indebted to Gordon Chauncey, Esquire, in the sum of £6,450, for which he had passed promissory notes which would all become due in two days' time. I suppose said Ashwood. These notes have hardly been negotiated. Eh? Oh, dear me. No, oh, no, Mr. Ashwood replied Chauncey. They have not gone out of my desk. I would not put them into the hands of a stranger for any trifling advantage to myself. Oh, dear me. Not at all. Well, then, I suppose you can renew them for a fortnight or so, or hold them over. Eh, asked Ashwood. I'm sure I can rejoin Chauncey. The bills belong to the old cripple that lent the money, and he does whatever I bid him. He trusts it all to me. He gives me the trouble, and takes the profit himself. Oh. He does confide in me. I have only to say the word, and it's done. They shall be renewed or held over as often as you wish. Indeed. I can answer for it. Dear me, it would be very hard if I could not. Well, then, Mr. Chauncey replied Ashwood, I may require it, or I may not. Craven has the promise of a large sum of money, 
within two or three days, part of the loan he has already gotten. Will you favor me with a call on tomorrow afternoon at Morley Court? I will then have heard definitely from Craven, and can tell you whether I require time or not. Very good, sir, very fair, indeed, Mr. Ashwood. Nothing fairer rejoined the lawyer. But don't give yourself any uneasiness. Oh, dear, on no account, for I declare to, I would hold them over as long as you like. Oh, dear me, indeed but I would. Well, then, I'll call out at about four o'clock. Very good, Mr. Chauncey replied Ashwood. I shall expect you. Meanwhile, good night. So they separated. The young baronet reached his ancestral dwelling without adventure of any kind, and Mr. Gordon Chauncey poured out the last drops of beer from the inverted can into his pewter cup, and draining it calmly, Anon buttoned his waistcoat, shook the wet from his cravat, and tied it on, thrust his feet into his shoes, and flinging his cocked hat carelessly upon his head, walked forth in deep thought into the street, whistling a concerto of his own invention. Chapter Xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
we'll just choose our own time for striking. I tell you what it is, if you are just said and led by me, you'll have a queer hold on him before three months are passed and gone said Chansey, lazily, mind I tell you, you will. Well, Gordy, boy, fill again, fill again, here's success to you. Chauncey filled, and quaffed his bumper, with, a matter of fact, business like air. And do you mind me, boy continued Bladen, spare nothing in this business, bring Ashwood entirely under my knuckle, and, by, dash, I'll make it a great job for you. Indeed, indeed but I will, Mr. Bladen, if I can rejoin Chauncey, and I think I can, I think I know a way, so I do to get a halt around his neck, do you mind, and leave the rope's end in your hand, to hang him or not, as you like. To hang him, echoed Bladen, like one who hears something too good to be true. Yes, to hang him by the neck till he's dead, dead, dead repeated Chauncey, imperturbably. How the blazes will you do it, demanded the wretch, anxiously. Pish, it's all prate and vapour. Gordon Chauncey stole a suspicious glance round the room from the corner of his eye, and then suffering his gaze to rest sleepily upon the fire once more, he stretched out one of his lank arms, and after a little uncertain groping, succeeding in grasping the collar of his companion's coat, and drawing his head down toward him. Bladen knew Mr. Chance's way, and without a word, lowered his ear to that gentleman's mouth who forthwith whispered something into it which produced a marked effect upon Mr. Bladen. If you do that replied he with ferocious exultation, by, dash, I'll make your fortune for you at a slap. And so saving, he struck his hand with heavy emphasis upon the barrister's shoulder, like a man who clenches a bargain. Well, Mr. Bladen replied Chauncey, in the same drowsy tone, as I said before, I declare it's my opinion I can, so it is, I think I can. And so do I think you can, by, dash, I'm sure of it exclaimed Bladen triumphantly, but take some more, more wine, won't you, take some more, and stay a bit, can't you? Chauncey had made his way to the door with his usual drowsy gait, and, passing out without deigning any answer or word of farewell stumbled lazily downstairs. There was nothing odd, however, in this leave-taking, it was Chance's way. We'll do it, and easily too muttered Bladen with a grin of exultation. I never knew him fail, that fellow is worth a mine. Ho! Ho! Sir Henry, beware, beware! Igord, you had better keep a bright lookout. It's rather late for green goslings to look to their necks, when the fox claps his nose in the poultry yard. Chapter XXXIII Showing how Sir Henry Ashwood played and plotted, and of the sudden summons of Gordon Chauncey. Henry Ashwood was but too anxious to avail himself of the indulgence offered by Gordon Chauncey. With the immediate urgency of distress, any thoughts of prudence or retrenchment which may have crossed his mind vanished, and along with the command of new resources came new wants and still more extravagant prodigality. His passion for gaming was now indulged without restraint, and almost without the interruption of a day. For a time his fortune rallied, and sums, whose amount would startle credulity, flowed into his hands only to be lost and squandered again in dissipation and extravagance, which grew but the wilder and more reckless, in proportion as the sources which supplied them were temporarily increased. At length, after some coquetting, the giddy goddess again deserted him. Night after night brought new and heavier disasters, and with this reverse of fortune came its invariable accompaniment, a wilder and more daring recklessness and a more unmeasured prodigality in hazarding larger and larger sums, as if the victims of ill luck sought, by this frantic defiance, to bully and browbeat their capricious persecutor into subjection. There was scarcely an available security of any kind which he had not already turned into money, and now he began to feel, in downright earnest, 
the iron gripe of ruin closing upon him. He was changed, in spirit and in aspect changed. The unwearied fire of a secret fever preyed upon his heart and brain, an untold horror robbed him of his rest, and haunted him night and day. Brother said Mary Ashwood, throwing one hand fondly round his neck, and with the other pressing his, as he sate moodily, with compressed lips and haggard face, and eyes fixed upon the floor, in the old parlour of Morley Court, Dear brother, you are greatly changed, you are ill, some great trouble weighs upon your mind. Why will you keep all your cares and griefs from me? I would try to comfort you, whatever your sorrows may be. Then let me know it all, dear brother, why should your griefs be hidden from me? Are there not now but the two of us in the wide world to care for each other, and as she said this her eyes filled with tears. You would know what grieves me, said Ashwood, after a short silence, and gazing fixedly in her face, with stern, dilated eyes, and pale features. He remained again silent for a time, and then uttered the emphatic word, Ruin. How, dear brother, what has befallen you, asked the poor girl, pressing her brother's hand more kindly. I say, we are ruined, both of us. I've lost everything. We are little better than beggars replied he. There's nothing I can call my own he resumed, abruptly, after a pause, but that old place, Inchidon. It's worth next to nothing, bog, rocks, brushwood, old stables, and all, absolutely nothing. We are ruined, beggared, that's all. Oh, brother, I am glad we have still that dear old place. Oh, let us go down and live there together, among the quiet glens, and the old green woods, for amongst its pleasant shades I have known happier times than shall ever come again for me. I would like to ramble there again in the pleasant summer time, and hear the birds sing, and the sound of the rustling leaves, and the clear winding brook, as I used to hear them long ago. There I could think over many things, that it breaks my heart to think of here and you and I, brother, would be always together, and we would soon be as happy as either of us can be in this sorrowful world. She threw her arms around her brother's neck, and while the tears flowed fast and silently, she kissed his pale and wasted cheeks again and again. In the meantime said Ashwood, starting up abruptly, and looking at his watch, I must go into town, and see some of these harpies, usurers that have gotten their fangs in me. It is as well to keep out of jail as long as one can and, with a very joyless laugh, he strode from the room. As he rode into town, his thoughts again and again recurred to his old scheme respecting Lady Stukely. It is after all my only chance said he. I have made my mind up fifty times to it, but somehow or other, dn me, if I could ever bring myself to do it. That woman will live for five and twenty years to come, and she would as easily part with the control of her property as with her life. While she lives I must be her dependent, her slave, there is no use in mincing the matter, I shall not have the command of a shilling, but as she pleases, but patience, patience, Henry Ashwood, sooner or later death will come, and then begins your jubilee. As these thoughts hurried through his brain, he checked his horse at Lady Betty Stukeley's door. As he traversed the capacious hall, and ascended the handsome staircase, well thought he, even with her ladyship, this were better than the jail. In the drawing-room he found Lady Stukeley, Emily Copland, and Lord Aspinley. The two latter evidently deep in a very desperate flirtation and her ladyship meanwhile very considerately employed in trying a piece of music on the spinet. The entrance of Sir Henry produced a very manifest sensation among the little party. Lady Stukeley looked charmingly conscious and fluttered. Emily Copland smiled a gracious welcome, for though she and her handsome cousin perfectly well understood each other, and both well knew that marriage was out of the question, they had each what is called, a fancy for the other, and Emily, with the unreasonable jealousy of a woman, 
felt a kind of soreness, secretly and almost unacknowledged to herself, at Sir Henry's marked devotion to Lady Stukeley, though, at the same time, no feeling of her own heart, beyond the lightest and the merest. Vanity, had ever been engaged in favour of Henry Ashwood. Of the whole party, Lord Aspinley alone was a good deal disconcerted, and no wonder for he had not the smallest notion upon what kind of terms he and Henry Ashwood were to meet, whether that young gentleman would shake hands with him as usual, or proceed to throttle him on the spot. Ashwood was, however, too completely a man of the world to make any unnecessary fuss about the awkward affair of Morley Court, he therefore met the little nobleman with cold and easy politeness, and, turning from him, was soon engaged in an animated and somewhat tender colloquy with the love-stricken widow, whose last words to him, as at length he arose to take his leave, were, Remember tomorrow evening, Sir Henry, we shall look for you early, and you have promised not to disappoint your cousin Emily, has not he, Emily? I shall positively be affronted with you for a week at least if you are late. I am very absolute and never forgive an act of rebellion. I'm quite a little sovereign here, and very despotic, so you had better not venture to be naughty. Here she raised her finger, and shook it in playful menace at her admirer. Lady Stukeley had, however, little reason to doubt his punctuality. If she had but known the true state of the case she would have been aware that in literal matter of fact she had become as necessary to Sir Henry Ashwood as his daily bread. Accordingly, next evening Sir Henry Ashwood was one of the gayest of the guests in Lady Stukeley's drawing rooms. His resolution was taken, and he now looked round upon the splendid rooms and all their rich furniture as already his own. Some chatted, some played cards some danced the courtly minuet, and some hovered about from group to group, without any determinate occupation, and sharing by turns in the frivolities of all. Ashwood was, of course, devoted exclusively to his fair hostess. She was all smiles, and sighs, and bashful coyness, he all tenderness and fire. In short, he felt that all he wanted at that moment was the opportunity of asking, to ensure his instantaneous acceptance. While thus agreeably employed, the young baronet was interrupted by a footman, who, with a solemn bow, presented a silver salver, on which was placed an exceedingly dirty and crumpled little note. Ashwood instantly recognised the hand in which the address was written, and snatching the filthy billet from its conspicuous position, he thrust it into his waistcoat pocket. A messenger, Sir, waits for an answer murmured the servant. Where is he? He waits in the hall, sir. Then I shall see him in a moment, tell him so said Ashwood, and turning to Lady Stukeley, he spoke a few sweet words of gallantry, and with a forced smile, and casting a longing, lingering look behind, he glided from the room. So, what can this mean? muttered he, as he placed himself immediately under a cluster of lights in the lobby, and hastily drew forth the crumpled note. He read as follows, My dear Sir Henry, there is bad news, as bad as can be. Wherever you are, and whatever you are doing, come on receipt of these, on the moment, to me. If you don't, you will be done for tomorrow, so come at once. Bobby M. Quirk will hand you these and if you follow him, will bring you where I am now. I am desirous to serve you, and if the art of man can do it, to keep you out of this pickle. Your obedient, humble servant, Gordon Chauncey. N.B. It is about these infernal notes, so come quickly. Through this production did Ashwood glance with no very enviable feelings, and tearing the note into the very smallest possible pieces, he ran downstairs to the hall, where he found the aristocratic Mr. M. Quirk, with his chin as high as ever, marching up and down with a free and easy swagger, and one arm akimbo, and whistling the while an air of martial defiance. Did you bring a note to me just now, inquired Ashwood. 
I have had that pleasure replied M. Quirk, with an aristocratic air. I presume I am addressed by Sir Henry Ashwood, Baronet. I am Mr. M. Quirk, Mr. Robert M. Quirk. Sir Henry, I kiss your hands, proud of the honour of your acquaintance. Is Mr. Chauncey at his own lodging now, inquired Ashwood, without appearing to hear the speeches which M. Quirk thought proper to deliver. Why, no replied the little gentleman. Our friend Chauncey is just now swigging his pot of beer, and smoking his penorth of pigtail in the old St. Columcill in Ship Street, a comfortable house, Sir Henry, as any in Dublin, and very cheap, cheap as dirt, sir. A Welsh rabbit, one penny, a black pudding, and neat cut of bread, and three leeks, for, how much do you guess? Have the goodness to conduct me to Mr. Chauncey, wherever he is said Ashwood dryly. I will follow, go on, sir. Well, Sir Henry, I'm your man, I'm your man, glad of your company, Sir Henry exclaimed the insinuating Bobby M. Quirk, and following his voluble conductor in obstinate silence, Sir Henry Ashwood found himself, after a dark and sloppy walk, for the first though not for the last time in his life, under the roof tree of the old St. Columkill. Chapter Xxxiv The old St. Columkill, a tete-a-tete in the Royal Ram, the Tempter. The old St. Columkill was a sort of low sporting tavern frequented chiefly by horse jockeys, cock fighters, and dog fanciers, it had its cock pits, and its badger baits, and an unpretending little hell of its own, and, in short, was deficient in none of the attractions most potent in alluring such company as it was intended to receive. As Ashwood, preceded by his agreeable companion, made his way into the low-roofed and irregular chamber, his senses were assailed by the thick fumes of tobacco, the reek of spirits, and the heavy steams of the hot dainties which ministered to the refined palates of the patrons of the old St. Columkill, and through the hazy atmosphere. Seated at a table by himself, and lighted by a solitary tallow candle with a portentous snuff, and canopied in the clouds of tobacco smoke which he himself emitted, Gordon Chauncey was dimly discernible. Ah, dear me, dear me. I'm right glad to see you, I declare to, dash, I am, Mr. Ashwood said that eminent barrister, when the young gentleman had reached his side. Indeed. I was thinking it was maybe too late to see you tonight, and that things would have to go on. Oh, dear me, but it's a regular providence, so it is. You'd have been up in lavender tomorrow, as sure as eggs is eggs. I'm gladder than a crown piece, upon my soul, I am. Don't talk of business here, cannot we have some place to ourselves for five minutes, out of this stifling pigsty? I can't bear the place, besides, we shall be overheard urged Ashwood. Well, and that's very true assented Chauncey, gently, very true, so it is, we'll get a small room above. You'll have to pay an extra sixpenny bit for it though, but what signifies the matter of that? M. Quirk, ask old Pottles if Noah's Ark is empty, either that or the Royal Ram, run, Bobby. I have something else to do, Mr. Chauncey replied Mr. M. Quirk, with Ota. Run, Bobby, run, man repeated Chauncey, tranquilly. Run yourself retorted M. Quirk, rebelliously. Chauncey looked at him for a moment to ascertain by his visible aspect whether he had actually uttered the audacious suggestion and reading in the red face of the little gentleman nothing but the most refractory dispositions. He said with a low, dogged emphasis which experience had long taught Mr. M. Quirk to respect, Are you at your tricks again? Do you, you blackguard, if you stand prating there another minute, I'll open your head with this pot, be off, you scoundrel. The learned counsel enforced his eloquence by knocking the pewter pot with an emphatic clang upon the table. All the aristocratic blood of the M. Quirks mounted to the face of the gentleman thus addressed, he suffered the noble inundation, however, to subside, and after some hesitation, 
and one long look of unutterable contempt, which Chansey bore with wonderful stoicism, he yielded to prudential considerations, as he had often done before, and proceeded to execute his orders. The effect was instantaneous, Pottles himself appeared. A short, stout, asthmatic man was Pottles, bearing in his thoughtful countenance an ennobling consciousness that human society would feel it hard to go on without him, and carrying in his hand a soiled napkin, or rather clout, with which he wiped everything that came in his way, his own forehead and nose included. With pompous step and wheezy respiration did Pottles conduct his honoured guests up the creaking stairs and into the royal ram. He raked the embers in the fireplace, threw on a piece of turf, and planting the candle which he carried upon a table covered with slop and pipe ashes, he wiped the candlestick, and then his own mouth carefully with his dingy napkin, and asked the gentlemen whether they desired anything for supper. No, no, we want nothing but to be left to ourselves for ten or fifteen minutes said Ashwood, placing a piece of money upon the table. Take this for the use of the room, and leave us. The landlord bowed and pocketed the coin, wheezed and bowed again, and then waddled magnificently out of the room. Ashwood got up and closed the door after him, and then returning, drew his chair opposite to Chance's, and in a low tone asked, Well, what is all this about? All about them notes, nothing else replied Chancey, calmly. Go on, what of them? urged Ashwood. Can you pay them all tomorrow morning, inquired Chauncey, tranquilly. Tomorrow, exclaimed Ashwood. Why, hell and death, man, you promised to hold them over for three months. Tomorrow. By, dash, you must be joking and as he spoke his face turned pale as ashes. I told you all along, Mr. Ashwood said Chauncey drowsily that the money was not my own, I'm nothing more than an agent in the matter, and the notes are in the desk of that old bedridden cripple that lent it. D in him, he's as full of fumes and fancies as old cheeses of maggots. He has taken it into his head that your paper is not safe, and the devil himself won't beat it out of him, and the long and the short of it is, Mr. Ashwood, he's going to arrest you tomorrow. In vain Ashwood strove to hide his agitation, he shook like a man in an egg. Good heavens, and is there no way of preventing this? Make him wait for a week, for a day said Ashwood. Was not I speaking to him ten times today, eh, twenty times replied Chauncey, trying to make him wait even for one day. Why, I'm hoarse talking to him, and I might just as well be speaking to Patrick's Tower. So make your mind up to this. As sure as light, you will be in gull before tomorrow's past, unless you either settle it early some way or other, or take leg bail for it. See, Chauncey, I may as well tell you this said Ashwood, before a fortnight, perhaps before a week, I shall have the means of satisfying these damned notes beyond the possibility of failure. Won't he hold them over for so long? I might as well be asking him to cut out his tongue and give it to me as to allow us even a day, he has heard of different accidents that has happened to some of your paper lately, and the long and the short of it is, he won't hear of it, nor hold them over one hour more than he can help. I declare to, dash, Mr. Ashwood, I am very sorry for your distress, so I am, but you say you'll have the money in a week. Eh, 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 so I shall. If he don't arrest me replied Ashwood, but if he does, my perdition's sealed, I shall lie in gull till I rot, but, curse it, can't the idiot see this, if he waits a week or so he'll get his money, every penny back again, but if he won't have patience, he loses every sixpence to all eternity. You might as well be arguing with an iron box as think to change that old chap by talk. When he once gets a thing into his head rejoined Chauncey. Ashwood walked wildly up and down the dingy, squalid apartment, exhibiting in his aristocratic form and face, and in the rich and elegant suit, flashing even in the dim light of that solitary, unsnuffed candle, 
with gold lace and jeweled buttons, and with cravat and ruffles fluttering with rich point lace, a strange and startling contrast to the slovenly and deserted scene of low debauchery which surrounded him. Chancy said he, suddenly stopping and grasping the shoulder of the sleepy barrister with a fierceness and energy which made him start, Chancy, rouse yourself, do you? Do you hear? Is there no way of averting this awful ruin, underscore is underscore there none? As he spoke, Ashwood held the shoulder of the fellow with a gripe like that of a vice, and stooping over him, glared in his face with the aspect of a maniac. The lawyer, though by no means of a very excitable temperament, was startled at the horrible expression which encountered his gaze, and sat silently looking into his victim's face with a kind of fascination. Well said Chauncey, turning away his head with an effort, there's but one way I can think of. What is it? Do you know anyone that will take my note at a short date? For God's sake, man. Speak out at once, or my brain will turn. What is it, said Ashwood. Why, Mr. Ashwood, to be plain with you rejoined Chauncey, I do not know a soul in Dublin that would discount for you to one-fourth of the amount you require, but there is another way. In the fiend's name, out with it, then said Ashwood, shaking him fiercely by the shoulder. Well, then. Get Mr. Craven to join you in a bond for the amount said Chauncey, with a warrant of attorney to confess judgment. Craven. Why, he knows as well as you do how I am dipped. He'd just as readily thrust his hand into the fire replied Ashwood. Is that your hopeful scheme? Why, Mr. Craven might not do so well, after all said Chauncey, meditatively and without appearing to hear what the young baronet said. Oh, dear, dear, no, he would not do. Old Moneybags knows him, no, no, that would not do. Can your DD scheming brain plot no invention to help me? In the devil's name, where are your wits? Chauncey, if you get me out of this accursed fix, I'll make a man of you. I got a whole lot of bills done for you once by the very same old gentleman continued Chauncey, and d.n. heavy bills they were too, but they had Mr. Nicholas Bladen's name across them, would not he lend it again, if you told him how you stand. If you can come by the money in a month or so, you may be sure he'll do it. Better and better. Why, Bladen would ask no better fun than to see me ruined, dead and damned rejoined Ashwood, bitterly. Cudgel your brains for another bright thought. Oh, dear me, dear me said the barrister mildly, I thought you were the best of friends. Well, well, it's hard to know. But are you sure he don't like you? It's odd if he does said Ashwood, seeing it's scarce a month since I trounced him almost to death in the theatre. Bladen, indeed. Well, Mr. Ashwood, sit down here for a minute, and I'll say all I have to say, and if you like it, well and good, and if not, there's no harm done, and things must only take their course. Are you quite sure of having the means within a month of taking up the notes? As sure as I am that I see you before me replied he. Well, then, get Mr. Bladen's name along with your own to your joint and several bond. The old chap won't have anything more to do with bills, so, do you mind, your joint and several bond, with warrant of attorney to confess judgment, and I'll stake my life, he'll take it as ready as so much cash, the instant I show it to him said the lawyer quietly. Are you dreaming or drunk? Have not I told you twenty times over that Bladen would cut his throat first, retorted Ashwood, passionately. Why said Chauncey, fixing his cunning eyes, with a peculiar meaning, upon the young man, and speaking with a lowered voice and marked deliberateness, perhaps if Mr. Bladen knew that his name was wanted only to satisfy the whim of a fanciful old hunks, if he knew that judgment should never be entered, if he knew that the bond should never go outside a strong iron box, 
under an old bedridden cripple's bed, if he knew that no questions should be asked as to how he came to write his name at the foot of it, and if he knew that no mortal should ever see it until you paid it long before the day it was due, and if he was quite aware that the whole transaction should be considered so strictly confidential, that even to himself, do you mind, no allusion should be made to it, don't you think, in such a case, you could, by some means or other, manage to get his, underscore name underscore. They continued to gaze fixedly at one another in silence, until, at length, Ashwood's countenance lighted into a strange, unearthly smile. I see what you mean, Chauncey, is it so, said he, in a voice so low, as scarcely to be audible. Well, maybe you do said the barrister, in a tone nearly as low and returning the young man's smile with one to the full as sinister. Thus they remained without speaking for many minutes. There's no danger in it said Chauncey, after a long pause, I would not take a part in it if there was. You can pay it eleven months before it's due. It's a thing I have known done a hundred times over, without risk, here there can be none. I do all his business myself. I tell you, that for anything that any living mortal but you and me and the old badger himself will ever hear, or see, or know of the matter, the bond might as well be burned to dust in the back of the fire. I declare to, it's the plain truth I'm telling you, Sir Henry, so it is. There followed another silence of some minutes. At length Ashwood said, I'd rather use any name but Bladen's, if it must be done. What does it matter whose name is on it, if there is no one but ourselves to read it, replied Chauncey. I say Bladen's is the best, because he accepted bills for you before, which were discounted by the same old codger, and again, because the old fellow knows that the money was wanted to satisfy gambling debts, and Bladen would seem a very natural party in a gaming transaction. Bladen's is the name for us. And, for myself, all I ask is fifty pounds for my share in the trouble. When must you have the bond? asked Ashwood. Set about it now said Chauncey, or stay, your hand shakes too much, and for both our sakes it must be done neatly, so say tomorrow morning, early. I'll see the old gentleman tonight, and have the overdue notes to hand you in the morning. I think that's doing business. I would not do it, I'd rather blow my brains out, if there was a single chance of his entering judgment on the bond, or talking of it said Ashwood, in great agitation. A chance, said the barrister. I tell you there's not a possibility. I manage all his money matters, and I'd burn that bond, before it should see the outside of his strong box. Why, D.N. Do you think I'd let myself be ruined for fifty pounds? You don't know Gordon Chauncey, indeed you don't, Mr. Ashwood. Well, Chauncey, I'll see you early tomorrow morning said Ashwood, but are you very, underscore very underscore sure, is there no chance, no possibility of, of mischief? I tell you, Mr. Ashwood replied Chauncey, unless I chose to betray myself you can't come by harm. As I told you before, I'm not such a fool as to ruin myself. Rely on me, Mr. Ashwood, rely on me. Do you believe what I say? Ashwood walked slowly up to him, and fixing his eyes upon the barrister, with a glance which made Chance's heart turn chill within him, yes, Mr. Chauncey he said, you may be sure I believe you, for if I did not, so help me. God, you should not quit this room, alive. He eyed the caitiff for some minutes in silence, and then returning the sword, which he had partially drawn, to its scabbard, he abruptly wished him good night, and left the room. Chapter XXXV Of the Cousin and the Black Cabinet, and of Henry Ashwood's decisive interview with Lady Stukeley. Well, then said Ashwood, a few days after the occurrences which have just been faithfully recorded, it behoves me without loss of time to make provision for this infernal bond, 
until I see it burned to dust, I feel as if I stood in the dock. This sure NT last long, my stars be thanked, one door of escape lies open to me, and through it I will pass, the sun shall not go down upon my uncertainty. To be sure, I shall be, but curse it, it can't be helped now, and let them laugh, and quiz, and sneer as they please, two-thirds of them would be but too glad to marry Lady Stukely with half her fortune, were she twice as old and twice as ugly, if, indeed, either were possible. Pshaw! The laugh will subside in a week, and in the style in which I shall open, curse me, if half the world won't lie at my feet. Give me but money, money, plenty of money, and though I be a paragon of absurdity and vice, the whole town will vote me a Solomon and a saint, so let's have no more shivering by the brink, but plunge boldly in at once and have it over. Fortified with these reflections, Sir Henry Ashwood vaulted lightly into his saddle, and putting his horse into an easy canter, he found himself speedily at Lady Stukeley's house in Stephen's Green. His servant held the rein and he dismounted, and, having obtained admission, summoned all his resolution, lightly mounted the stairs, and entered the handsome drawing room. Lady Stukeley was not there, but his cousin, Emily Copland, received him. Lady Betty is not visible, then, inquired he, after a little chat upon indifferent subjects. I believe she is out shopping, indeed, you may be very certain she is not at home replied Emily, with a malicious smile, her ladyship is always visible to you. Now confess, have you ever had much cruelty or coldness to complain of at dear Lady Stukeley's hands? Ashwood laughed, and perhaps for a moment appeared a little disconcerted. I do admit, then, as you insist on placing me in the confessional, that I have always found Lady Betty as kind and polite as I could have expected or hoped rejoined Ashwood, assuming a grave and particularly proper air, I were particularly ungrateful if I said otherwise. Oh, ho! Oh. So her ladyship has actually succeeded in inspiring my platonic cousin with gratitude continued Emily, in the same tone, and gratitude we all know is Cupid's best disguise. Alas, and alack a day, to what vile uses may we come at last, alas, my poor cuz. Nay, nay, Emily replied he, a little piqued, you need not write my epitaph yet, I don't see exactly why you should pity me so enormously. Haven't you confessed that you glow with gratitude to Lady Stukeley, rejoined she. Nonsense. I said nothing about glowing, but what if I had, answered he. Then you acknowledge that you do glow. Heaven help him, the man actually glows ejaculated Emily. Pshaw, stuff, nonsense. Emily, don't be a blockhead said he, impatiently. Oh. Harry. Harry, Harry, don't deny it continued she, shaking her head with intense solemnity, and holding up her fingers in a monetary manner, you are then actually in love. Oh, Benedick, poor Benedick. Would thou hadst chosen some Beatrice not quite so well stricken in years, but what of that, the beauties of age, if less attractive to the eye of thoughtless folly than those of youth, are unquestionably more durable. Time may rob the cheek of its bloom, but I defy him to rob it of its rouge, years, I might say centuries, have no power to blanch a wig or thin its flowing locks, and though the nymph be blind with age, what matters it if the swain be blind with love? I make no doubt you'll be fully as happy together as if she had twice as long to live. Ashwood poked the fire and blew his nose violently, but nevertheless answered nothing. The brilliant blush of her cheek and the raven blackness of her wig continued the incorrigible Emily, in close and striking contrast, will remind you, and I trust usefully, of that rouge et noy which has been your ruin all your days. Still Ashwood spoke not. The exquisite roundness of her ladyship's figure will remind you that flesh, if not exactly grass, is at least very little better than bran and buckram and her smile will invariably suggest the great truth, 
that whenever you do not intend to bite it is better not to show your teeth, especially when they happen to be like her ladyship's. In short, you cannot look at her without feeling that in every particular, if rightly read, she supplied a moral lesson, so that in her presence every unruly passion of man's nature must entirely subside and sink to rest. Yes, she will make you happy, eminently happy, every little attention, every caress, every fond glance she throws at you, will delightfully assure your affectionate spirit, as it wanders in memory back to the days of earliest childhood, that she will be to you all that your beloved grandmother could have been, had she been spared. Oh! Harry, Harry, this will indeed be too much happiness. Another pause ensued, and Emily approached Sir Henry as he stood sulkily by the mantelpiece and laying her hand upon his arm, looked archly up into his face, while shaking her head she slowly said, Oh, love, love, oh! Cupid, Cupid, mischievous little boy, what hast thou done with my poor cousin's heart? Twas on a widow's joint you land the archer, Cupid, took his stand. As she said this, she looked so unutterably mischievous and comical that in spite of his vexation and all his efforts to the contrary, he burst into a long and hearty fit of laughter. Emily said he, at length, you are absolutely incorrigible, gravity in your company is entirely out of the question, but listen to me seriously for one moment, if you can. I will tell you plainly how I am circumstanced, and you must promise me in return that you will not quiz me any more about the matter. But first he added, cautiously, let us guard against eavesdroppers. He accordingly walked into the next room, which opened upon that in which they were, and proceeded to close the far door. Before he had reached it, however, that in the other room opened, and Lady Stukeley herself entered. The instant she appeared, Emily Copland by a gesture enjoined silence, nodded towards the door of the next room from which Ashwood's voice, as he carelessly hummed an air, was audible, she then frowned, nodded, and pointed with vehement repetition toward a dark recess in the wall, made darker and more secure by the flanking projection of a huge, black, varnished cabinet. Lady Stukeley looked puzzled, took a step in the direction of the post of concealment indicated by the girl, then looked puzzled, and hesitated again. More impatiently Emily repeated her signal, and her ladyship, without any distinct reason, but with her curiosity all alive, glided behind the protecting cabinet, with all its army of china ornaments, into the recess, and there remained entirely concealed. She had hardly effected this movement, which the deep-piled carpet enabled her to do without noise, when Ashwood returned closed the door of communication between the two rooms, and then shut that through which Lady Stukeley had just entered, almost brushing against her as he did so, so close was their proximity. These precautions taken, he returned. Now said he, in a low and deliberate tone, the plain facts of the case are just these. I am dipped over head and ears in debt, debts, too, of the most urgent kind debts which threaten me with ruin. Now, these must be paid, one way or another they must be met. And to effect this I have but one course, one expedient, and you have guessed it. No man knows better than I what Lady Stukeley is. I can see all that is ridiculous and repulsive about her just as clearly as anybody else. She is old enough to be my grandmother, and ugly enough to be the devil's, and moreover, painted and varnished over like a signboard. She may be a fool, she may be a termagant, she may be what you please, but, underscore but underscore she has money. She has been throwing herself into my arms this twelve month or more, and, but what the deuce is that? This interrogatory was caused by certain choking sounds which proceeded with fearful suddenness from the place of Lady Stukeley's concealment and which were instantaneously followed by the appearance of her ladyship in bodily presence. She opened her mouth, but gave utterance to nothing but a gasp, 
drew herself up with such portentous and swelling magnificence, that Ashwood almost expected to see her expand like the spectre of a magic lantern until her head touched the ceiling. Forward she came, in her progress sweeping a score of china ornaments from the cabinet, and strewing the whole floor with the crashing fragments of monkeys, monsters, and mandarins, breathless, choking, and almost black with rage, Lady Stukely advanced to Ashwood, who stood, for the first time in his life, bereft of every vestige of self-possession. Painted, varnished, she screamed hysterically, ridiculous, repulsive. Oh, heaven and earth! You! you preternatural monster. With these words she uttered two piercing shrieks, and threw herself in strong hysterics into a chair, holding on her wig distractedly with one hand, for fear of accidents. Illustration, painted. Varnished, she screamed, hysterically. To face page 188. Don't, don't ring the bell said she, with an abrupt accession of fortitude observing Emily Copland approach the bell. Don't, I shall be better presently. And then, with another shriek, she opened afresh. As the hysterics subsided, Ashwood began a little to recover his scattered wits, and observing that Lady Stukely had sunk back in extreme languor and exhaustion, with closed eyes, he ventured to approach the shrine of his outraged divinity. I feel, indeed I own, Lady Stukely he said, hesitatingly, I have much to explain. I ought to explain, yes, I ought. I will, Lady Stukely, and, and I can entirely satisfy, completely dispel he was interrupted here, for Lady Stukely, starting bolt upright in the chair, exclaimed, you wretch, you villain, you perjured, scheming, designing, lying, paltry, stupid insignificant, outrageous whether it was that her ladyship wanted words to supply a climax, or that hysterics are usually attended with such results, we cannot pretend to say, but certain it is that at this precise point the languishing, fashionable, die-away Lady Stukely actually spat in the young baronet's face. Ashwood changed colour as he promptly discharged the ridiculous but very necessary task of wiping his face. With difficulty he restrained himself under this provocation, but he did command himself so far as to say nothing. He turned on his heel and walked downstairs, muttering as he went, an old painted devil. The cool air, as he passed out, speedily dissipated the confusion and excitement of the scene that had just passed, and all the consequences of his rupture with Lady Stukely rushed upon his mind with overwhelming and maddening force. You were right, perfectly right, he is a cheat, a trickster, a villain, exclaimed Lady Stukely. Only to think of him. Oh, heaven and earth. And again she was seized with violent hysterics, in which state she was conducted up to her bedroom by Emily Copland, who had enjoyed the catastrophe with an intensity of relish which none but a female, and a mischievous one to boot, can know. Loud and repeated were Lady Stukely's thanksgivings for having escaped the snares of the designing young baronet, and warm and multiplied and grateful her acknowledgments to Emily Copland, to whom, however, from that time forth she cherished an intense dislike. Chapter XXXV Of jewels, plate, horses, dogs, and family pictures, and concerning the appointed hour. In a state little if at all, short of distraction, Sir Henry Ashwood threw himself from his horse at Morley Court. That resource which he had calculated upon with absolute certainty had totally failed him, his last stake had been played and lost, and ruin in its most hideous aspect stared him in the face. Spattered from heel to head with mud, for he had ridden at a reckless speed, with a face pale as that of a corpse, and his dress all disordered, he entered the great old parlour, and scarcely knowing what he did, dashed the door to with violence and bolted it. His brain swam so that the floor seemed to heave and rock like a sea, he cast his laced hat and his splendid peruke, 
the envy and admiration of half the petty maters in Dublin, upon the ground, and stood in the centre of the room, with his hands clutched upon the temples of his bare, shorn head, and his teeth set, the breathing image of despair. From this state he was roused by someone endeavouring to open the door. Who's there? he shouted, springing backward and drawing his sword, as if he expected a troop of constables to burst in. Whoever the party may have been, the attempt was not repeated. What's the matter with me, am I mad, said Ashwood, after a terrible pause, and hurling his sword to the far end of the room. Lie there. I've let the moment pass, I might have done it, cut the Gordian knot, and there an end of all. What brought me here? He stared about the room, for the first time conscious where he stood. Damn these pictures he muttered, they're all alive, everything moves towards me. He flung himself into a chair and clasped his fingers over his eyes. I can't breathe, the place is suffocating. Oh, God! I shall go mad. He threw open one of the windows and stood gasping at it as if he stood at the mouth of a furnace. Everything is hot and strange and maddening, I can't endure this, brain and heart are bursting, it is hell. In a state of excitement which nearly amounted to downright insanity, he stood at the open window. It was long before this extravagant agitation subsided so as to allow room for thought or remembrance. At length he closed the window, and began to pace the room from end to end with long and heavy steps. He stopped by a pier table, on which stood a china bowl full of flowers, and plunging his hands into it, dashed the water over his head and face. Let me think, let me think said he. I was not wont to be thus overcome by reverse. Surely I can master as much as will pay that thrice accursed bond, if I could but collect my thoughts, there must yet be the means of meeting it. Let that be but paid, and then, welcome ruin in any other shape. Let me see. A. The furniture, then the pictures, some of them valuable, underscore very underscore valuable, then the horses and the dogs, and then, A. The plate. Why, to be sure. What have I been dreaming of? The plate will go halfway to satisfy it, and then, what else? Let me see. The whole thing is six thousand four hundred and fifty pounds, what more? Is there nothing more to meet it? The plate, the furniture, the pictures, eh, idiot that I am, why did I not think of them an hour since, my sister's jewels, why, it's all settled. How the devil came it that I never thought of them before? It's very well, however, as it is, for if I had, they would have gone long ago. Come, come, I breathe again, I have gotten my neck out of the hemp, at all events. I'll send in for Craven this moment. He likes a bargain, and he shall have one, before tomorrow's sun goes down, that D.D. Bond shall be ashes. Mary's jewels are valued at two thousand pounds. Well, let him take them at one thousand five hundred, and the pictures, plate, furniture, dogs, and horses for the rest, and he has a bargain. These jewels have saved me, bribed the hangman. What care I how or when I die, if I but avert that? Ten to one I blow my brains out before another month. A short life and a merry one was ever the motto of the Ashwoods, and as the mirth is pretty well over with me, I begin to think it time to retire. Satis edisti, satis by pisti, satis lusisti, tempus ist tibi abbey, what am I raving about? There's business to be done now, to it, then, to it like a man, while we are alive let us be alive. Craven liked his bargain and engaged that the money should be duly handed at noon next day to Sir Henry Ashwood, who forthwith bade the worthy attorney good night, and wrote the following brief note to Gordon Chauncey, Esquire, Sir, I shall call upon you tomorrow at one of the clock, if the hour suit you, upon particular business, and shall be much obliged by your having a certain security by you, 
which I shall then be prepared to redeem. I remain, sir, your very obedient servant, Henry Ashwood. So said Sir Henry, with a half shudder, as he folded and sealed this missive, I shall, at all events, escape the halter. Tomorrow night, spite of wreck and ruin, I shall sleep soundly. God knows, I want rest. Since I wrote that name, and gave that accursed bond out of my hands, my whole existence, waking and sleeping, has been but one abhorred and ghastly nightmare. I would gladly give a limb to have that dd scrap of parchment in my hand this moment, but patience, patience, one night more, one night only, of fevered agony and hideous dreams, one last night, and then, once more I am my own master, my character and safety are again in my own hands, and may I die the death, if ever I risk them again as I have done, one night more, would, underscore would underscore to God it were morning. Chapter XXXA The Reckoning, Chance's Large Cat, and the Coach The morning arrived, and at the appointed hour Sir Henry Ashwood dismounted in Whitefriar Street, and gave the bridle of his horse to the groom who accompanied him. Well thought he, as he entered the dingy, dilapidated square in which Chance's lodgings were situated, this matter, at all events, is arranged, I shall sure he hang though I'm half inclined to allow I deserve to do so for my infernal folly in trying the thing at all, but no matter, it has given me a lesson I shall sure and he soon forget. As to the rest, what care I now? Let ruin pounce upon me in any shape but that, luckily I have still enough to keep body and soul together left. He paused to indulge in ruminations of no very pleasant kind, and then half muttered, I have been a fool. I have walked in a dream. Only to think of a man like me, who has seen something of the world, allowing that D.D. Hag to play him such a trick. Well, I believe it is true, after all, that we cannot have wisdom without paying for it. If my acquisitions bear any proportion to my outlay, I ought to be a Solomon by this time. The door was opened to his summons by Gordon Chancy himself. When Ashwood entered, Chauncey carefully locked the door on the inside and placed the key in his pocket. It's as well, Sir Henry, to be on the safe side observed Chauncey, shuffling towards the table. Dear me, dear me, there's no such thing as being too careful, is there, Sir Henry? Well, 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 let's to business said young Ashwood, hurriedly, seating himself at the end of a heavy deal table at which was a chair, and taking from his pocket a large leathern pocket book. You have the, the security here. Of course, oh, dear, of course replied the barrister, the bond and warrant of attorney, that DD forgery, it is in the next room, very safe, oh, dear me, yes indeed. It struck Ashwood that there was something, he could not exactly say what, unusual and sinister in the manner of Mr. Chauncey as well as in his emphasis and language, and he fixed his eye upon him for a moment with a searching glance. The barrister, however, busied himself with tumbling over some papers in a drawer. Well, why don't you get it, asked Ashwood, impatiently. Never mind, never mind replied Chauncey, do you reckon your money over, and be very sure the bond will come time enough. I don't wonder, though. You're eager to have it fast in your own hands again, but it will come, it will come. Ashwood proceeded to open the pocketbook and to turn over the notes. They're all right, said he, they're all right. But, hush, he added, slightly changing colour, I hear something stirring in the next room. Oh, dear, dear, it's nothing but the cat rejoined Chauncey, with an ugly laugh. Your cat treads very heavily, said Ashwood, suspiciously. So it does, rejoined Chauncey, it does tread heavy, it's a very large cat, so it is, it has wonderful great claws, it can see in the dark, it's a great cat, it never missed a rat yet, and I've seen it lure the bird off a branch with the mere power of its eye, it's a great cat, but reckon your money, 
and I'll go in for the bond. This strange speech was uttered in a manner at least as strange, and chancy, without waiting for commentary or interruption, passed into the next room. The step crossed the adjoining chamber, and Ashwood heard the rustling of papers, it then returned, the door opened, and not Gordon Chancy, but Nicholas Bladen entered the room and confronted Sir Henry Ashwood. Personal fear in bodily conflict was a thing unknown to the young baronet, but now all courage, all strength forsook him, and he stood gazing in vacant horror upon that, to him, most tremendous apparition, with a face white as ashes, and covered with the starting dews of terror. With that hideous combination, a smile and a scowl, stamped upon his coarse features, the wretch stood with folded arms, in an attitude of indescribable exultation, gazing with savage, gloating eyes full upon his appalled and terror-stricken victim. Fixed as statues they both remained for several minutes. Ho, 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 you look frightened, young man exclaimed Bladen, with a hoarse laugh, you look as if you were going to be hanged, you look as if the hemp were round your neck, you look as if the hangman had you by the collar, you do, ho, ho, ho. Ashwood's bloodless lips moved, but utterance was gone. It's hard to get the words out continued Bladen, with ferocious glee. I never knew the man yet could do a last dying speech smooth, a sort of choking comes on, eh? The sight of the minister and the hangman makes a man feel so queer, eh? And the coffin looks so ugly, and all the crowd, it's confusing somehow, and puts a man out, eh? Ho, ho, ho. Ashwood laid his hand upon his forehead, and gazed on in blank horror. Why, you're not such a great man, by half, as you were in the playhouse the other evening continued Bladen, you don't look so grand, by any manner of means. Some way or other, you look a little sickish or so. I'm afraid you don't like my company, ho, ho, ho. Still Sir Henry remained locked in the same stupefied silence. Ho, ho, you seem to think your hemp is twisted, and your bored sword resumed Bladen, you seem to think you're in a fix at last, and so do I, by, dash, he thundered, for I have the rope fairly round your weasand, and, by, I'll make you dance upon nothing, at Gallows Hill, before you're a month older. Do you hear that, do you? you swindler. Eh, hey, you gullbird, you common forger, you robber, you crow's meat, who holds the winning cards now? Where, where's the bond, said Ashwood, scarce audibly. Where's your precious bond, you forger, you gibbet carrion, shouted Bladen, exultingly. Where's your forged bond, the bond that will crack your neck for you, where is it, eh? Hey? Why, here, here in my breeches pocket, underscore that's underscore where it is. I hope you think it's safe enough, eh, you gallows tassel. Yielding to some confused instinctive prompting to recover the fatal instrument, Ashwood drew his sword, and would have rushed upon his brutal and triumphant persecutor, but Bladen was not unprepared even for this. With the quickness of light, he snatched a pistol from his coat pocket, recoiling, as he did so, a hurried pace or two, and while he turned, coward as he was, pale and livid as death, he leveled it at the young man's breast, and both stood for an instant motionless, in the attitudes of deadly antagonism. Put up your sword, I have you there, as well as everywhere else, regularly checkmated, by, dash, shouted Bladen, with the ferocity of half-desperate cowardice. Put up your sword, I say, and don't be a bloody idiot, along with everything else. Don't you see you're done for, there's not a chance left you. You're in the cage, and there's no need to knock yourself to pieces against the bars, you're done for, I tell you. With a mute but expressive gesture of despair, Ashwood grasped his sword by the slender, glittering blade, and broke it across. The fragments dropped from his hands, and he sunk almost lifeless into a chair, a spectacle so ghastly, that Bladen for a moment thought that death was about to rescue his victim. Chancy, 
Come out here exclaimed Bladen, the fellow has taken the staggers, come out, will you? Oh, dear me, dear me said Chauncey, in his own quiet way, but he looks very bad. Go over and shake him said Bladen, still holding the pistol in his hand. What are you afraid of? He can't hurt you, he has broken his bilbo across, the symbol of gentility. By, dash. He's a good deal down in the mouth. While they thus debated, Ashwood rose up, looking more like a corpse endowed with motion than a living man. Take me away at once said he, with a sullen wildness, take me away to Gaul, or where you will, anywhere were better than this place. Take me away, I am ruined, blasted. Make the most of it, your infernal scheme has succeeded, take me to prison. Oh, murder, he wants to go to Gaul, do you hear him, Chauncey, cried Bladen, such an elegant, fine gentleman to think of such a thing, only to think of a baronet in Gaul, and for forgery, too, and the condemned cell such an ungentlemanly sort of a hole. Why? You'd have to use perfumes to no end, to make the place fit for the reception of your aristocratic visitors, my lord this, and my lady that, for, of course, you'll keep none but the best of company, ho, ho, ho. Perhaps the judge that's to try you may turn out to be an old acquaintance, for your luck is surprising, isn't it, Chauncey, and he'll pay you a fine compliment and express his regret when he's going to pass sentence, eh, ho, ho, ho. But, after all, I'd advise you, if the condescension is not too much to expect from such a very fine gentleman as you, to consort as much as possible with the turnkey, he's the most useful friend you can make, under your peculiarly delicate circumstances, ho, ho, eh. It's just possible he mayn't he like to associate with you. For some of them fellows are rather stiff, do ye see, and won't keep company with certain classes of the coves in quad, such as forgers or pickpockets, but if he'll allow it, you'd better get intimate with him, ho, 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 eh. Take me to the prison, sir said Ashwood, sternly, I suppose you mean to do so. Let your officers remove me at once, you have, no doubt, men for the purpose in the next room. Let them call a coach, and I will go with them, but let it be at once. Well, you're not far out there, by, dash, replied Bladen. I have a broad-shouldered acquaintance or two, and a little bit of a warrant, you understand, in the next apartment. Grimes, Grimes, come in here, you're wanted. A huge, ill-looking fellow, with his coat buttoned up to his chin and a short pipe protruding from the corner of his mouth, swaggered into the chamber, with that peculiar gait which seems as if contracted by habitually shouldering and jostling through mobs and all manner of riotous assemblies. That's the bird, said the fellow, interrogatively, and pointing with his pipe carelessly at Ashwood. You're my prisoner he added, gruffly addressing the unfortunate young man and at the same time planting his ponderous hand heavily upon his shoulder, he in the other exhibited a crumpled warrant. Grimes, go call a coach said Bladen, and don't be a brace of shakes about it, do you mind? Grimes departed, and Bladen, after a long pause, suddenly addressing himself to Ashwood, resumed, in a somewhat altered tone, but with intenser sternness still, now, I tell you what it is. My young cove, I have a sort of half a notion not to send you to Gull at all, do you hear? Pshaw, pshaw, said Ashwood, turning bitterly away. I tell you I'm speaking what I mean rejoined Bladen, I'll not send you there now at any rate. I want to have a bit of chat with you this evening, and it shall rest with you whether you go there at all or not, I'll give you the choice fairly. We'll meet, then at Morley Court this evening, at eight o'clock, and for fear of accidents in the meantime, you will have no objection to our mutual friend, Mr. Chauncey, and our common acquaintance, Mr. Grimes, accompanying you home in the coach, and just keeping an eye on you till I come, 
for fear you might be out walking when I call, you understand me. But here's Grimes. Mr. Grimes, my particular friend Sir Henry Ashwood has taken an extraordinary remarkable fancy to you, and wishes to know whether you'll do him the favour to take a jaunt with him in a carriage to see his house at Morley Court, and to spend the day with him and Mr. Chauncey, for he finds that his health requires him to keep at home and he has a particular objection to be left alone, even for a minute. Sir Henry, the coach is at the door. You'd better bundle up your banknotes, they may be useful to you. Chauncey, tell Sir Henry's groom, as you pass, that he'll not want his horse any more today. The party went out, Sir Henry, pale as death, and scarcely able to support himself on his limbs walking between Chauncey and the Herculean constable. Bladen saw them safely shut up in the vehicle, and giving the coachman his orders, gazed after them as they drove away in the direction of Morley Court, with a flushed face and a bounding heart. Chapter XXX8 Strange Guests at the Manor The coach jingled, jolted, and rumbled on and Ashwood lay back in the crazy conveyance in a kind of stupefied apathy. The scene which had just closed was, in his mind, a chaos of horrible confusion, a hideous, stunning dream, whose incidents, as they floated through his passive memory, seemed like unreal and terrific exaggerations, into whose reality he wanted energy and power to inquire. Still before him sat a breathing evidence of the truth of all these confused and horrible recollections, the stalwart, ruffianly figure of the constable, with his great red horny hands, and greasy cuffs, and the heavy coat buttoned up to his unshorn chin, and the short, discoloured pipe, protruding from the corner of his mouth, lounging back with half-closed eyes, and the air of a man who had passed the night in wearisome vigils among strife and riot and who has acquired the compensating power of dividing his faculties at all times pretty nearly between sleep and waking, a kind of sottish, semi-existence, something between that of a swine and a sloth. Over this figure the eyes of the young man vacantly wandered, and thence to the cheerful fields and trees visible from the window, and back again to the burly constable until every seam and button in his coat grew familiar to his mind as the oldest tenants of his memory. Beside him, too, sat Chauncey, his artful, cowardly betrayer. Yet even against him he could not feel anger, all energy of thought and feeling seemed lost to him, and nothing but a dull ambiguous incredulity and a scared stupor were there in their stead. On, on they rolled and rumbled, among pleasant fields and stately hedgerows, toward the ancestral dwelling of the miserable prisoner, who sat like a lifeless effigy, yielding passively to every jolt and movement of the carriage. I say, Grimes, were you ever out here before, inquired Mr. Chauncey. We'll soon be in the manor, driving up to Morley Court. It's a fine place, I'm given to understand. I never was here but once before, long as I know Sir Henry, but better late than never. Do you know this place, Mr. Grimes? A negative grunt and a short nod relieved Mr. Grimes from the painful necessity of removing his pipe for the purpose of uttering an articulate answer. Oh, dear me, dear me resumed Mr. Chauncey, but I'm uncommon hungry and dry. I wish to God we were safe and sound in Sir Henry's house. Grimes, are you dry? Mr. Grimes removed his pipe, and spat upon the coach floor. Am I dhry, said he. About as dhry as a sprat in a tinder box, that's all. Is there much more to go? Chauncey stretched his head out of the coach window. I see the old piers of the avenue, said he and God knows but it's I that's glad we're near our journey's end. Now we're passing in, we're in the avenue. Mr. Grimes hereupon uttered a grunt of approbation, and pressing down the ashes of his pipe with his thumb, he deposited that instrument in his waistcoat pocket, whence, at the same time, he drew a small plug of tobacco, which he inserted in his mouth, 
and rolled it about with his tongue from time to time during the remainder of their progress. Sir Henry, we're arrived said Chauncey, admonishing the baronet with his elbow, we're at the hall door at Morley Court. Sir Henry, dear me, dear me, he's very abstracted, so he is. I say, Sir Henry, we're at Morley Court. Ashwood looked vacantly in Chance's face, and then upon the stately door of the old house, and suddenly recollecting himself, he said with strange alacrity, A, A, at Morley Court, so we are. Come, then, gentlemen, let us get down. Accordingly the three companions descended from the conveyance, and entered the ancient dwelling house together. Follow me, gentlemen said Ashwood leading the way to a small, oak-wenskated parlour. You shall have refreshments immediately. He called the servant to the door, and continued addressing himself to Chauncey, and his no less refined companion. Order what you please, gentlemen, I can't think of these things just now, and, sirrah, do you hear me, bring a large vessel of water, my throat is literally scorched. Well, Mr. Chauncey, what do you say, said Grimes. I'm for a couple of bottles of sack, and a good pitcher of ale, to begin with, in the way of liquor. Well, it wouldn't be that bad, said Chauncey. What meat have you on the spit, my good man? I don't exactly know, sir, replied the wondering domestic, but I'll inquire. And see, my good man, continued Chauncey. Ask them whether there isn't some cold roast beef in the buttery, and if so, bring it up in a jiffy, for, I declare to G, D I'm uncommon hungry, and let the cook send up a hot joint directly, and do you mind, my honest man, light a bit of a fire here, for it's rather chill, and put plenty of dry sticks give us the ale and the sack this instant minute, do you see said Mr. Grimes. You may do the rest after. Yes. You may as well resume Chauncey, for indeed I'm lost with the truth myself. Cut your stick, saucepan said Mr. Grimes, authoritatively, and the servant departed in unfeigned astonishment to execute his various commissions. Ashwood threw himself into a seat, and in silence endeavoured to collect his thoughts. Faint, sick, and stunned. He nevertheless began gradually to comprehend every particular of his position more and more fully, until at length all the ghastly truth stood revealed to his mind's eye in vivid and glaring distinctness. While Ashwood was engaged in his agreeable ruminations, Mr. Chauncey and Mr. Grimes were busily employed in discussing the substantial fare which his larder had supplied, and pledging one another in copious libations of generous liquor. Chapter 6 The Bargain, and the New Confederates At length the evening came, darkness closed over the old place, and as the appointed hour approached, Ashwood became more and more excited. I must thought he, keep every faculty intensely on the stretch, to detect, if possible, the nature of their schemes. Bladen and Chauncey have unquestionably hatched some other DD plot though what worse can befall me? I am netted as completely as their worst malice can desire. It is now seven o'clock. Another hour will determine all my doubts. Hark you, sirrah, continued he, raising his voice, and addressing a servant who had entered the chamber, I expect a gentleman upon particular business at eight o'clock. On his arrival conduct him directly to this room. He then relapsed into the same train of gloomy and agitated thought. Chauncey and his burly companion both sat snugly before the fire smoking their pipes in silent enjoyment, while their miserable host paced the room from wall to wall in mental torments indescribable. At length the weary interval expired, and within a few minutes of the appointed hour, Nicholas Bladen was admitted by the servant and ushered into the chamber in which Ashwood expected his arrival. Well, Sir Henry exclaimed Bladen, as he swaggered into the room, you seem a little flustered still, eh? Hope you found your company pleasant. My friend's society is considered uncommon agreeable. 
The visitor here threw himself into a chair, and continued, By the holy Saint Paul, as I rode up your cursed old dusky avenue, I began to think the chances were ten to one you had brought your throat and a razor acquainted before this. I have known men do it under your circumstances, of course I mean gentlemen, with fine friends and delicate habits, and who could not stand exposure and all that kind of thing. I say, Mr. Grimes, my sweet fellow, you may leave the room, but keep within call, do ye mind? Mr. Chauncey and I want to have a little confidential conversation with my friend, Sir Henry. Bundle out, and the moment you hear me call your name, bolt in again like a shot. Mr. Grimes, without answering, rose and lounged out of the room. Chauncey, shut that door continued Bladen. Shut it tight, as tight as a drum. There, to your seat again. Now then, Sir Henry, we may as well to business, but first of all, sit down. I have no objection to your sitting. Don't be shy. Sir Henry Ashwood did seat himself, and the three members of this secret council drew their chairs around the table, each with very different feelings. I take it for granted said Bladen, planting his elbow upon the table, and supporting his chin upon his hand, while he fixed his baleful eyes upon the young man, I take it for granted, and as a matter of course, that you have been puzzling your brains all day to come at the reason why I allow you to be sitting in this house, instead of clapping your four bones under lock and key, in another place. He paused here as if to allow his exordium to impress itself upon the memory of his auditory, and then resumed, and I take it for granted, moreover, that you are not quite fool enough to imagine that I care one blast if you were strung up by the hangman, and carved by the doctors, tomorrow, eh? He paused again. Well, then, it's possible you think I have some end of my own to serve, by letting the matter stand over this way and so I have, by, dash. You think right, if you never thought right before. I have an object in view, and it lies with you whether it's gained or lost. Do you mind? Go on, go on, go on repeated Ashwood, gloomily. What a devil of a hurry you're in observed Bladen, with a scornful chuckle. But don't tear yourself, you'll have it all time enough. Now I'm going to do great things for you, do you mind me? I'm going, in the first place, to give you your life and your character, such as it is, and, what's more, I'll not let you go to jail for debt neither. I'll not let you be ruined, for Nicky Bladen was never the man to do things by halves. Do you hear all I'm saying? Yes, yes said Ashwood, faintly, but the condition, come to that the condition. Well, I will come to that. I will tell you the terms rejoined Bladen. I suppose you need not be told that I am worth a good penny, no matter how much. At any rate I'm rich, that much you do know. Well, perhaps you'll think it odd that I have not taken up a little to live more quiet and orderly, in short, that I have not sown my wild oats, and settled down, and all that and become what they call an ornament to society, eh? You, perhaps, wonder how it comes I have not taken a rib, why I have not got married, eh? Well, I think myself it is a wonder, especially for such an admirer of the sex as I am, and I think it's a pity besides, and so I've made up my mind to mend the matter, do you see, and to take a wife without loss of time. She must have family for I want that, and she must have beauty, for I would not marry the queen without it, family and beauty. I don't ask money, I have more of my own than I well know what to do with. Family and beauty is what I require. And I have settled the thing in my own mind, that the very article I want, just the thing to a nicety, is your sister, little, bright-eyed Mary, sporting Molly. I wish to marry her and her I'll have, and that's the long and the short of the whole business. You.
underscore you underscore marry my sister exclaimed Ashwood, returning the fellow's insolent gaze with a look of indescribable scorn and astonishment. Yes, I, I myself, I, Nicholas Bladen, with more gold than a man could count in three lives shouted Bladen, returning his gaze with a scowl of defiance, I condescend to marry the sister of a ruined, beggared profligate, a common forger, who has one foot in the dock at this minute. Down upon your marrow bones, and thank me for my condescension, down, I say. Overwhelmed with indignation and disgust, Ashwood could not answer. All his self-command was required to resist his vehement internal impulse to strike the fellow to the ground and trample upon him. This strong emotion, however, had its spring in no generous source. No thought or care for Mary's feelings or fate crossed his mind, but only the sense of insulted pride, for even in the midst of all his misery and abasement, his hereditary pride of birth survived that this low, this entirely blasted, this branded ruffian should dare to propose to ally himself with the Ashwoods of Morley Court, a family whose blood was as pure as centuries of aristocratic transmission, and repeated commixture with that of nobility, could make it, a family who stood, in consideration and respect, one of the very highest of the country. Could flesh and blood endure it? Make your mind up at once. I have no time to spare, and just remember that the locality of your night's lodging depends upon your decision," said Bladen, coolly, looking at his watch. If, unfortunately for yourself, you should resolve against the connection, then you must have the goodness to accompany us into town tonight, and the law takes its course quietly with you, and your neck bone must only reconcile itself to an ugly bit of a twist. If otherwise, you're a made man. Run the matter fairly over in your mind, and see which of us two should desire the thing most. As for me, I tell you plainly, it's a bit of a fancy, no more, and may pass off in a day or two, for I don't pretend to be extraordinarily steady in love affairs, and always had rather a roving eye, and if I should happen to cool, by, dash, you'll be in a nice hobble. So I think you had best take the ball at the hop. Do you mind, and make no mouths at your good fortune? Bladen paused, and looked at his huge chased gold watch again, and laid it on the table, as if to measure Ashwood's deliberation by the minute. Meanwhile the young baronet had ample time to recollect the desperate pressure of his circumstances, which outraged pride had for a moment half obliterated from his mind and the process of remembrance was in no small degree assisted by the heavy tread of the constable, distinctly audible from the hall. Bladen said Ashwood, in a voice low and husky with agitation, she'll never consent, you can't expect it, she'll never marry you. I'm not talking of the girl's consent just now replied Bladen, I'm asking only for yours in the first place. Am I to understand that you're agreed? Yes, replied Ashwood, sullenly, what is there left to me, but to agree? Then leave me alone to gain her consent, retorted Bladen, with a brutal smile. I have a bit of a winning way with me, a knack of my own, for coming round a girl, and if she don't yield to that, why we must only try another course. When love is wanting, obedience is the next best thing, although we can't charm her. She's no girl if we can't frighten her, eh? Ashwood was silent. Now mind, I require your active cooperation, continued Bladen, there's to be no shamming. I'm no greenhorn, and no a loaded die from a fair one. It's not safe to try hocus pocus with me, and if I don't get the girl, of course you're no brother of mine, and must not expect me to forget the old score that's between us. Do you understand me? Unless you bring this marriage about, you must only take the consequences, and I promise you they'll be of the very ugliest possible description. Agreed, agreed, talk no more of it just now said Ashwood, vehemently, we understand one another. Tomorrow we may talk of it again, meanwhile torment me no more. Well, 
I have said my say rejoined Bladen, and have nothing more to do but to inform you, that I intend passing the night here, and, in short, to make a visit of a week or so, for it's right the young lady should have an opportunity of knowing my geography before she marries me, and besides, I have heard a great account of old Sir Richard's cellar. Chancy, do you tell my servant to bring my things up to the room that Sir Henry will point out? Sir Henry, you will see about my room, have a bit of fire in it, see to it yourself, mind, for do you mind, between ourselves, I think it's on the whole your better course to be uncommonly civil to me. Stir yourselves, gentlemen. And, Chauncey, hand Grimes his fee, and let him be off. We'll try a jug of your claret, Sir Henry, and a spatchcock, or some little thing of the kind, and then to our virtuous beds, eh? After a carousel protracted to nearly three hours, during which Nicky Bladen treated his two companions to sundry ballads, and other vocal efforts somewhat more boisterous than elegant, and supplying frequent allusion, and not of the most delicate kind, to his contemplated change of condition, that interesting person proceeded somewhat unsteadily upstairs to his bedchamber. With a suspicion, which even his tipsiness could not overcome, he jealously bolted the door upon the inside, and laid his sword and pistols upon the table by his bed, remembering that it was just possible that his entertainer might conceive an expeditious project for relieving himself of all his troubles, or at least the greater part of them. These pleasant precautions taken, Mr. Bladen undressed himself with all celerity and threw himself into bed. This gentleman's opinion of mankind was by no means exalted, nor at all complimentary to human nature. Utter, hardened selfishness he believed to be the master passion of the human race, and any appeal which addressed itself to that, he looked upon as irresistible. In applying this rule to Sir Henry Ashwood he happened, indeed, to be critically correct, for the young baronet was in very nearly all points fashioned precisely according to honest Nicky's standard of humanity. That gentleman experienced, therefore, no misgivings as to his young friends preferring at all hazards to remain at Morley Court, rather than quit the country, and enter upon a life of vagabond beggary. No, no thought Bladen, he'll not take leg bail, just because he can gain nothing earthly by it now, the only thing I can see that could serve him at all, that is, supposing him to be against the match, is to cut my throat, however, I don't think he's wild enough to run that risk, and if he does try it, by, dash, he'll have the worst of the game. Thus, after a day of unclouded triumph, did Mr. Bladen compose himself to light and happy slumbers. Chapter XL Dreams, First Impressions, The Man in the Plum-Coloured Suit The sun shone cheerily through the casement of the quaint and pretty little chamber which called Mary Ashwood its mistress. It was a fresh and sunny autumn morning, the last leaves rustled on the boughs, and the thrush and blackbird sang their merry morning lays. Mary sat by the window, looking sadly forth upon the slopes and woods which caught the slanting beams of the ruddy sun. I have passed, indeed, a very troubled night, I have been haunted with strange and fearful dreams. I feel very sorrowful and uneasy, indeed, indeed I do, Carey. It's only the vapours, my lady replied the maid. A glass of orange flower water and camphor is the sovereignest thing in the world for them. Indeed, Carey continued the young lady, still gazing sadly from the casement, I know not why it is so, a foolish dream, wild and most extravagant, yet still it will not leave me. I cannot shake off this fear and depression. I will run downstairs and talk with my dear brother, that may cheer me. She arose, ran lightly down the stairs, and entered the parlour. The first object that met her gaze, Standing full before her, was a large and singularly ill-looking man, arrayed in a suit of plum-coloured cloth, richly laced. It was Nicholas Bladen. With a vulgar swagger, half abashed and half impudent, 
the fellow acknowledged her entrance by retreating a little and making an awkward bow, while a smile and a leer, more calculated to frighten than to attract, lighted his coarse and swollen features. The girl looked at this object with a startled air, she felt that she had seen that sinister face before, but where or when, whether waking or in a dream, she strove in vain to remember. I say, Ashwood, where's your manners, said Blarden, turning angrily towards the young baronet, who was scarcely less confounded at her sudden entrance than was the girl herself. What do you stand gaping there for? Don't you see the young lady wants to know who I am? Blarden followed this vehement exhortation with a look which at once recalled Ashwood to his senses. Mary said he, approaching, this is my particular friend, Mr. Nicholas Blarden. Mr. Blarden, my sister, Miss Mary Ashwood. Your most obedient humble servant, Mistress Mary said Blarden, with a gallant air. Wonderful beautiful weather, Demi, but it's like the middle of summer. I'm just going out to take a bit of a tramp among the bushes and lead goddesses he added, not feeling, spite of all his effrontery, quite at his ease in the presence of the elegant and high-born girl, and, more confounded and abashed by the simple dignity of her artless nature than he ever remembered to have been before, under any circumstances whatever. He made his exit from the chamber. Who is that man, said the girl, drawing close to her brother's side, and clinging timidly to his arm. His face is familiar to me, I have seen or dreamed of it before, it has been before me either in some troubled scene or dream. I feel frightened and oppressed when he is near me. Who is he, brother? Pshaw, nonsense, girl said her brother in vain attempting to appear unconstrained and at his ease, he is a very good, honest fellow, not, as you see, the most polished in the world, but in essentials an excellent fellow, you'll easily get over your antipathy, his oddity of manner and appearance is soon forgotten, and in all other points he is an admirable fellow. Pshaw! You have too much sense to hate a man for his face and manner. I do not hate him brother said Mary, how could I? The man has never wronged me, but there is something in his eye, in his air and expression, in his whole appearance, sinister and terrible, something which oppresses and terrifies me. I can scarcely move or breathe in his presence. I only hope that I may never meet him so near again. Your hope is not likely to be realized, then replied Ashwood, abruptly. He makes a stay here of a week, or perhaps more. A silence followed, during which he revolved the expediency of hinting at once at the designs of Blarden. As he thus paused, moodily plotting how best to open the subject, the unconscious girl stood beside him, and, looking fondly in his face, she said, Dear brother, you must not be so sad. When all's done, what have we lost but some of the wealth which we can spare? We have still enough, quite enough. You shall live with your poor little sister, and I will take care of you, and read to you, and sing to you whenever you are sad, and we will walk together in the old green woods, and be far happier and merrier than ever we could have been in the midst of cold and heartless luxury and dissipation. Brother, dear brother, when shall we go to Incheden? I can't say, I, I don't know that we shall go there at all replied he, shortly. Deep disappointment clouded the poor girl's face for a moment, but as instantly the sweet smile returned, and she laid her hand affectionately upon her brother's shoulder, and looked in his face. Well, dear brother, wherever you go, there is my home, and there I will be happy, as happy as being with the only creature that cares for me now can make me. Perhaps there are others who care for you, eh, even more than I do said the young man deliberately, and fixing his eyes upon her searchingly, as he spoke. How, brother, what do you mean, said the poor girl, faintly, and turning pale as death. Have you seen, have you heard from she paused, trembling violently, and Ashwood resumed, no, no, child, 
I have neither seen nor heard from anyone whom you know anything of. Why are you so agitated? Pshaw! Nonsense! I know not how it is, brother, I am depressed, and easily agitated today rejoined she, perhaps it is that I cannot forget a fearful dream which troubled me last night. Tut, tut, child replied he, I thought you had other matters to think of. And so I have, God knows, dear brother resumed she, so I have, but this dream haunted me long, and haunts me still, it was about you. I dreamed that we were walking, lovingly, hand in hand, among the shady walks in this old place, when, on a sudden, a great savage dog, just like the old bloodhound you had shot last summer, came, with open jaws and all its fangs exposed, springing towards us. I threw myself, terrified, into your arms, but you grasped me, with iron strength, and held me forth toward the frightful animal. I saw your face, it was changed and horrible. I struggled, I screamed, and awakened, gasping with affright. A silly, unmeaning dream said Ashwood, slightly changing color, and turning from her. You're not such a child, surely as to let that trouble you. No, indeed, brother replied she, I do not suffer it to trouble my mind, but it has fastened somehow upon my imagination, and spite of all I can do, the impression remains there, there, see that horrible man staring in at us, from behind the evergreens she added, glancing at a large, tufted laurel, which partially screened the unprepossessing form of Nicholas Bladen who was intently watching the youthful pair as they conversed. Perhaps conscious that he had been observed, he quitted his lurking place, and plunged deeper into the thick screen of foliage. Dear Henry said she, turning imploringly toward her brother, there is something about that man which frightens me, my heart sickens whenever I see him. I feel like some poor bird under the eye of a hawk. I do not feel safe when he is looking at me, there is some evil influence in his gaze, something bad, satanic, in his look and presence, I dread him instinctively. For God's sake, dear, dear brother, do not keep company with him, he will harm you, it cannot lead to good. This is mere folly, downright raving said Ashwood, vehemently, but with an uneasiness which he could not conceal. He is my guest, and will remain so for some weeks. I must be civil to him, underscore both underscore of us must. Surely, dear brother, after all I have said, you will not ask me to associate with him during his stay, since stay he must urge Mary. We ought not to consult our whims at the expense of civility retorted the baronet, dryly. But surely my presence is not required urged she. You cannot tell how that may be replied Ashwood, abruptly, and then added, abstractedly, as he walked slowly towards the door, we often speak, we know not what, we often stand, we know not where, necessity, fate, destiny, whatever is, must be. Let this be our philosophy, Mary. Wholly at a loss to comprehend this incoherent speech, his sister remained silent for some minutes. Well, child, how say you, exclaimed Ashwood, turning suddenly round. Dear brother said she, I would fain not meet that man any more while he remains here. You will not ask me to come down. A truce to this folly exclaimed Ashwood, with loud and sudden emphasis. You must, you must, I say, appear at breakfast, at dinner, and at supper. You must see Bladen and talk with him, he's my friend, you must know him. Then checking himself, he added, in a less vehement tone, Mary, don't act like a fool, you are none, these silly fancies must not be indulged, remember, he's my friend. There, there, be a good girl, no more folly. He came over, patted her cheek, and then turned abruptly from her, and left the room. His parting caress, however, 
was not sufficient to obliterate the painful impression which his momentary violence had left, for in that brief space of angry excitement his countenance had worn the self-same sinister expression which had appalled her in her last night's dream. Chapter XLI Of a Connor and a certain travelling ecclesiastic, and how the darkness overtook them. It has become necessary, in order to a clear and chronologically arranged exposition of events to return for a little while to our melancholy young friend, Edmund O'Connor, who, with his faithful squire, Larry Toole, following in close attendance upon his progress, was now returning from a last visit to the poor fragment of his patrimony, the wreck of his father's fortunes, and which consisted of a few hundred acres of wild woodland surrounding a small square tower half gone to decay, and bidding fair to become in a few years a mere roofless ruin. He had seen the few retainers of his family who still remained, and bidden them a last farewell, and was now far in his second day's leisurely journey toward the city of Dublin. The sun was fast declining among the rich and glowing clouds of an autumnal evening and pouring its melancholy luster upon the woods and the old towers of Lake Slip, as the young man rode into that ancient town. How different were his present feelings from those with which he had last traversed the quiet little village, then his bright hopes and cheery fancies had tinged every object he looked on with their own warm and happy colouring, but now, alas! How mournful the reverse! With the sweet illusions he had so fondly cherished had vanished all the charm of all he saw, the scene was disenchanted now, and all seemed coloured in the sombre and chastened hues of his own deep melancholy, the river, with all its brawling falls and windings, filled his ear with plaintive harmonies, and all its dancing foam bells, that chased one another down its broad eddies, glancing in the dim, discoloured light of the evening sun seemed but so many images of the wayward courses and light illusions of human hope, even the old ivermantled towers, as he looked upon their time-worn front, seemed to have suffered a century's decay since last he beheld them, every scene that met his eye, and every sound that floated to his ear on the still air of evening, was alike charged with sadness. At a slow pace, and with a heart oppressed, he passed the little town and soon its trees, and humble roofs, and blue curling smoke were left far behind him. He had proceeded more than a mile when the sun descended, and the dusky twilight began to deepen. He spurred his horse, and at a rate more suited to the limited duration of the little light which remained, he rode at a sharp trot along the uneven way toward Dublin. He had not proceeded far at this rate when he overtook a gentleman on horseback, who was listlessly walking his steed in the same direction, and who, on seeing a cavalier thus wending his way on the same route, either with a view to secure good company upon the road, or for some other less obvious purpose, spurred on also, and took his place by the side of our young friend. O'Connor looked upon his uninvited companion with a jealous eye for his night adventure of a few months since was forcibly recalled to his memory by the circumstances of his present situation. The person who rode by his side was, as well as he could describe, a tall, lank man, with a hooked nose, heavy brows, and sallow complexion, having something grim and ascetic in the character of his face. After turning slightly twice or thrice towards a Connor, as if doubtful whether to address him, the stranger at length accosted the young man. A fair evening this, sir said he, and just cool enough to make a brisk ride pleasant. O'Connor assented dryly, and without waiting for a renewal of the conversation, spurred his horse into a canter, with the intention of leaving his new companion behind. That personage was not, however, so easily to be shaken off, he, in turn, put his horse to precisely the same pace, and remarked composedly, I see, sir, you wish to make the most of the light we've left us, dark riding, they say, is dangerous riding hereabout. I suppose you ride for the city. O'Connor made no answer. I presume you make Dublin your halting place, repeated the man. You are at liberty, 
Sir replied O'Connor, somewhat sharply, to presume what you please, I have good reasons, however, for not caring to bandy words with strangers. Where I rest for the night cannot concern anybody but myself. No offence, sir, no offence meant replied the man, in the same even tone, and I hope none taken. A silence of some minutes ensued, during which O'Connor suddenly slackened his horse's pace to a walk. The stranger made a corresponding alteration in that of his. Your pace, sir, is mine observed the stranger. We may as well breathe our beasts a little. Another pause followed, which was at length broken by the strangers observing, a lucky chance, in truth. A cumrid is an important acquisition in such a ride as ours promises to be. I already have one of my own choosing replied O'Connor dryly, I ride attended. And so do I continued the other and doubtless our trusty squires are just as happy in the rencounter as are their masters. A considerable silence ensued, which at length was broken by the stranger. Your reserve, sir said he, as well as the hour at which you travel, leads me to conjecture that we are both bound on the same errand. Am I understood? You must speak more plainly if you would be so replied O'Connor. Well, then resumed he, I half believe that we shall meet tonight, where it is no sin to speak loyalty. Still, sir, you leave me in the dark as to your meaning replied O'Connor. At a certain well of sweet water said the man with deliberate significance, is it not so, eh, am I right? No, sir replied O'Connor, your sagacity is at fault, or else, it may be, your wit is too subtle, or mine too dull, for... If your conjectures be correct, I cannot comprehend your meaning, nor indeed is it very important that I should. Well, sir replied he, I am seldom wrong when I hazard a guess of this kind, but no matter, if we meet we shall be better friends, I promise you. They had now reached the little town of Chapelizod, and darkness had closed in. At the door of a hovel, from which streamed a strong red light, the stranger drew his bridle, and called for a cup of water. A ragged urchin brought it forth. Pax Domini Vobiscum said the stranger, restoring the vessel, and looking upward steadfastly for a minute, as if in mental prayer, he raised his hat, and in doing so exhibited the monkish tonsure upon his head, and as he sate there motionless upon his horse, with his sable cloak wrapped in ample folds about him and the strong red light from the hovel door falling upon his thin and well-marked features, bringing into strong relief the prominences of his form and attire, and shining full upon the drooping head of the tired steed which he bestrode, this equestrian figure might have furnished no unworthy study for the pencil of Skarkan. In a few minutes they were again riding side by side along the street of the straggling little town. I perceive. Sir said O'Connor, that you are a clergyman. Unless this dim light deceives me, I saw the tonsure when you raised your hat just now. Your eyes deceived you not, I am one of a religious order replied the man, and perchance not on that account a more acceptable companion to you. Indeed you wrong me, reverend sir said O'Connor. I owe you an apology for receiving your advances as I have done but experience has taught me caution, and until I know something of those whom I encounter on the highway, I hold with them as little communication as I can well avoid. So far from being the less acceptable a companion to me by reason of your sacred office, believe me, you need no better recommendation. I am myself an humble child of the true church, and her ministers have never claimed respect from me in vain. The priest looked searchingly at the young man, but the light afforded but an imperfect scrutiny. You say, sir rejoined he after a pause, that you acknowledge our father of Rome, that you are one of those who eschew heresy, and cling constantly to the old true faith, that you are free from the mortal taint of Protestant infidelity. That do I with my whole heart rejoined O'Connor. Are you, moreover? one of those who still look with a holy confidence to the return of better days. 
when the present order of things, this usurped government and abused authority, shall pass away like a dark dream, and fly before the glory of returning truth. Do you look for the restoration of the royal heritage to its rightful owner, and of these afflicted countries to the bosom of Mother Church? Happy were I to see these things accomplished rejoined O'Connor, but I hold their achievement, except by the intervention of Almighty Providence, impossible. Methinks we have in Ireland neither the spirit nor the power to do it. The people are heartbroken, and so far from coming to the field in this quarrel, they dare not even speak of it above their breath. Young man, you speak as one without understanding. You know not this people of Ireland of whom you speak. Believe me, sir, the spirit to write these things is deep and strong in the bosoms of the people. What though they do not cry aloud in agony for vengeance, are they therefore content, and at their hearts ease? Quam vis tase hermogens, cantor tamen atc, optimus ist modulator. Their silence is not dumbness, you shall hear them speak plainly yet. Well, it may be so rejoined O'Connor, but be the people ever so willing, another difficulty arises, where are the men to lead them on, who are they? The priest again looked quickly and suspiciously at the speaker, but the gloom prevented his discerning the features of his companion. He became silent, perhaps half repenting his momentary candor, and rode slowly forward by O'Connor's side, until they had reached the extremity of the town. The priest then abruptly said, I find, sir, I have been wrong in my conjecture. Our paths at this point diverge, I believe. You pursue your way by the river's side, and I take mine to the left. Do not follow me. If you be what you represent yourself, my command will be sufficient to prevent your doing so, if otherwise, I ride armed, and can enforce what I conceive necessary to my safety. Farewell. And so saying, the priest turned his horse's head in the direction which he had intimated, rode up the steep ascent which loomed over the narrow level by the river's side, and his dark form quickly disappeared beyond the brow of the dusky hill. O'Connor's eyes instinctively followed the retreating figure of his companion, until it was lost in the profound darkness, and then looking back for any dim intimation of the presence of his trusty follower he beheld nothing but the dark void. He listened, but no sound of horses' hoofs betokened pursuit. He shouted, he called upon his squire by name, but all in vain, and at length, after straining his voice to its utmost pitch for six or ten minutes without eliciting any other reply than the prolonged barking of half the village curs in chapel isoed, he turned away, and pursued his course alone consoling himself with the reflection that his attendant was at least as well acquainted with the way as was he himself, and that he could not fail to reach the cock and anchor whenever he pleased to exert himself for the purpose. Chapter XLII The Squires O'Connor had scarcely been joined by the priest, when Larry Tool, who jogged quietly on, pipe in mouth, behind his master, was accosted by his reverence's servant, a stout, clean-limbed fellow, arrayed in blue frieze, who rode a large, ill-made horse, and bumped listlessly along at that easy swinging jog at which our southern farmers are wont to ride. The fellow had a shrewd eye, and a pleasant countenance withal to look upon, and might be in years some five or six and thirty. God save you, neighbour said he. God save you kindly rejoined Mr. Toole graciously. A pleasant evening for a quiet bit for a smoke rejoined the stranger. None better rejoined Larry, scanning the stranger's proportions, to see whether, in his own phrase, he liked his cut. The scrutiny evidently resulted favorably, for Larry removed his pipe, and handing it to his new acquaintance, observed courteously, maybe you'd take a draw. Neighbor. I thank you kindly, said the stranger, as he transferred the utensil from Larry's mouth to his own. It's turning cowed, I think. I wish to the Lord we had a drop for something to warm us, observed he, 
speaking out of the unoccupied corner of his mouth. We'll be in chapelizode, plays God said Larry Tool, in half an hour, and if a Tim Delaney isn't gone under the daisies, maybe we won't have a taste for his best. Are you following that gintleman, inquired the stranger, with his pipe indicating a corner, that gintleman that the master is talking to. I am so rejoined Larry promptly, and a good gintleman he is, and that's your master there. What sort is he? Oh, good enough, as masters goes, no way surprise and one way or th other. Where are you going to? pursued Larry. I never axed, but dad rejoined the man, only to folly on, wherever he goes, and de villa hair I care where that is. What way are you two going? To Dublin, to be sure rejoined Larry. I wished we were there now. What the devil makes him ride so unequal, sometimes canthorn, and other times mostly walking, it's mighty nonsensical, so it is. By Gora, I don't know, unless fancy alone rejoined the stranger. Here's your pipe continued he, after some pause, and I thank you kindly, Mr., Mr., how's this they call you? Mr. Larry Toole is the name I was christened by rejoined the gentleman so interrogated. An aral elegant name it is replied the stranger. The Tools is a royal family, and may the Lord restore them to their rights. Amen, Badad rejoined Larry devoutly. My name's Ned Moloney continued he, anticipating Larry's interrogatory, from the town of Baladun, the plies in test spot in the beautiful county for Tipperary. There isn't its aquil out for fine men and purty girls. Larry sighed. The conversation then took that romantic turn which best suited the melancholy chivalry of Larry's mind, after which the current of their mutual discoursing, by the attraction of irresistible association, led them, as they approached the little village, once more into suggestive commentaries upon the bitter cold, and sundry pleasant speculations respecting the creature comforts which awaited them under Tim Delaney's genial roof tree. The holy saints be praised said Ned Moloney, we're in the village at last. The telling four stories is the driest work that ever a boy tuck in hand. My mouth is like a cinder all as one. Tim Delaney's is the second house bay and that wind in the street said Larry, pointing down the road as they advanced. We'll just get down for a minute or two, and have something warm by the fire, we'll overtake the gintleman as he enough. I'm agreeable, Mr. Toole said the accommodating Ned Moloney. Let the gintleman take care for themselves. They're come to an age when they ought to know what they're about. This is it said Larry, checking his horse before a low thatched house, from whose doorway the cheerful light was gleaming upon the bushes opposite. The two worthies dismounted, and entered the humble place of entertainment. Tim Delaney's company was singularly fascinating, and his liquor was, if possible, more so, besides, the evening was chill, and his hearth blazed with a fire, the very sight of which made the blood circulate freely, and the fingertops grow warm. Larry Toole was prepossessed in favour of Ned Moloney, and Ned Moloney had fallen in love with Larry Toole so that it is hardly to be wondered at that the two gentlemen yielded to the combined seduction of their situation, and seated themselves snugly by the fire, each with his due allowance of stimulating liquor, and with a very vague and uncertain kind of belief in the likelihood of their following their masters respectively until they had made themselves particularly comfortable. It was not until after nearly two hours of blissful communion with his delectable companion, that Larry Toole suddenly bed out him of the fact that he had allowed his master, at the lowest calculation, time enough to have ridden to and from the cock and anchor at least half a dozen times. He, therefore, hurriedly bade good night, with many a fond vow of eternal friendship for the two companions of his princely revelry, mounted his horse with some little difficulty, and becoming every moment more and more confused, and less and less perpendicular found himself at length, with an indistinct remembrance of having had several hundred falls upon every possible part of his body, 
and upon every possible geological substance, from soft alluvial mud up to plain limestone, during the course of his progress, within the brick precincts of the city. The horse, with an instinctive contempt for Mr. Toole's judgment, wholly disregarded that gentleman's vehement appeals to the bridle, and quietly pursued his well-known way to the hostelry of the cock and anchor. Our honest friend had hardly dismounted, which he did with one eye closed, and a hiccough, and a happy smile which mournfully contrasted with his filthy and battered condition, when he at once became absolutely insensible, from which condition he did not recover till next morning, when he found himself partially in bed, quite undressed, with the exception of his breeches, boots, and spurs, which he had forgotten to remove, and which latter, along with his feet, he had deposited upon the pillow. Allowing his head to slope gently downward towards the foot of the bed. As soon as Mr. Toole had ascertained where he was, and begun to recollect how he came there, he removed his legs from the pillow, and softly slid upon the floor. His first solicitude was for his clothes, the spattered and villainous condition of which appalled him. His next was to endeavour to remember whether or not his master had witnessed his weakness. Absorbed in this severe effort of memory, he sat upon the bedside, gazing upon the floor, and scratching his head, when the door opened, and his friend the groom entered the chamber. I say, old gentleman, you've been having a little bit of a spree observed he, gazing pleasantly upon the disconsolate figure of the little man who sat in his shirt and jack boots, staring at him with a woebegone and bewildered air. Why, you had a bushel of mud about your body when you came in, and no hat at all. Well, you had a pleasant night of it, there's no denying that. No hat, said Larry desolately. It isn't possible I dropped my hat off my head unknownest. Bloody was, my hat. Is it gone in earnest? Yes, young gentleman, you came here bareheaded. The hat is gone, and that's a fact replied the groom. I thought my coat was bad enough, but, oh, blur anagers, my hat, ejaculated Larry with abandonment. Bad luck go with the liquor, terror nouns, my hat. There's a shoe off the horse observed the groom, and the seat is gone out of your breeches as clean as if it never was in it. Well but you had a pleasant evening of it, you had. And my breech is destroyed, ruined bay and cure. See, Tom Berry, take a blunt herbuzz, will you, and put me out of pain at once. My breech is. Oh, Deville go with the liquor. Holy Moses, is it possible, my breech is. In an agony of contrition and desperate remorse, Larry Toole clasped his hands over his eyes and remained for some minutes silent, at length he said, and what did the master say? Don't be keeping me in pain, out with it at once. What master, inquired the groom. What master, echoed Mr. Toole, why Mr. O'Connor, to be sure. I'm sure I can't say replied the man, I have not seen him this month. Wasn't he here before me last night? inquired the little man. No, nor after neither replied his visitor. Do you mean to tell me that he's not in the house at all, interrogated Mr. Toole. Yes replied he, Mr. O'Connor is not in the house, the horse did not cross the yard this month. Will that do you? Be the hokey said Larry, that's extramly queer. But are you really sure and quite sartin? Yes. I tell you yes replied he. Well, well said Mr. Toole, but that puts me to the devil's rounds to and her stand it, not come at all. What in the world's gone with him, not come, where else could he go to? Bagura, the whole for the occurrences for last night is a blackguard mystery. What the devil's gone with him, where is he at all, why couldn't he wait a bit for me and I'd foretuck the best care for him? But Gintleman is always unruly. What the devil's keeping him? I wouldn't be surprised if he made a baste for himself in some public house last night. 
A man ought never to take a drop more than just what makes him pleasant, bad luck to it. Lend me a breeches, and I'll pray for you all the rest of my days. I must go out at once and look for him, maybe he's at Mr. Audley's lodgings, eh, sure enough, it's there he is. Bad luck to the liquor. Why the devil did I let him go alone? Oh. Sweet bad luck to it he continued in fierce anguish, as he held up the muddy wreck of his favorite coat before his aching eyes, my elegant coat, bad luck to it again, and my beautiful hat, once more bad luck to it, and my breeches, oh, it's fairly past bearing, my elegant breeches. Bad luck to it for a three cheerous drop, and the master lost, and no one knows what's done with him. Up with that poker. I tell you, and blow my brains out at once, there's nothing before me in this life but the devil's own delight, finish me, I tell you, and let me rest in the shade. I'll never hood up my head again, there's no use in pretending. Oh. Bad luck to the drink. In this distracted frame of mind did Larry continue for nearly an hour, after which, with the aid of some contributions from the wardrobe of honest Tom Berry, he clothed himself, and went forth in quest of his master. Chapter XLIII The Wildwood, the old mansion house of Finneski, secrets, and a surprise. O'Connor pursued his way towards the city, following the broken horse track, which then traversed the low grounds which lie upon the left bank of the Liffey. The Phoenix Park, or, as it was then called, the Royal Park was at the time of which we write a much wilder place than it now is. There were no trim plantations nor stately clumps of tufted trees, no signs of care or culture. Broad patches of shaggy thorns spread with little interruption over the grounds, and regular roads were then unknown. The darkness became momentarily deeper and more deep as O'Connor pursued his solitary way, and the difficulty of proceeding grew every instant greater for the heavy rains had interrupted his path with deep sloughs and pools, which became at length so frequent, and so difficult of passage, that he was fain to turn from the ordinary track, and seek an easier path along the high grounds which overhang the river. The close screen of the wild gnarled thorns which covered the upper level on which he now moved, still further deepened the darkness, and he became at length so entirely involved in the pitchy gloom, that he dismounted, and taking his horse by the head, led him forward through the tangled brake, and under the knotted branches of the old hoary thorns, stumbling among the briars and the crooked roots, and every moment encountering the sudden obstruction, either of some stooping branch, or the trunk of one of the old trees, so that altogether his progress was as tedious and unpleasant as it well could be. His annoyance became the greater as he proceeded, for he was so often compelled to turn aside, and change his course, to avoid these interruptions, that in the utter darkness he began to grow entirely uncertain whether or not he was moving in the right direction. The more he paused, and the oftener he reflected, the more entirely puzzled and bewildered did he become. Glad indeed would he have been that he had followed the track upon which he had at first entered, and run the hazard of all the sloughs and pools which crossed it, but he was now embarked in another route, and even had he desired it, so perplexed was he, that he could not have effected his retreat. Fully alive to the ridiculousness, as well as the annoyance of his situation, he slowly and painfully stumbled forward conscious that if only he could move for half an hour or thereabout consistently in the same direction, he must disengage himself in some quarter or another from the entanglement in which he was involved. In vain he looked round him, nothing but entire darkness encountered him. In vain he listened for any sound which might intimate the neighborhood of any living thing. Nothing but the hushed soughing of the evening breeze through the old boughs was audible and he was forced to continue his route in the same troublesome uncertainty. At length he saw, or thought he saw, a red light gleaming through the trees. It disappeared, it came again. 
He stopped, uncertain whether it was one of those fitful marsh fires which but mock the perplexity of benighted travellers. But no, this light shone clearly, and with a steady beam, through the branches, and towards it he directed his steps, losing it now, and again recovering it, till at length, after a longer probation than he had at first expected, he gained a clear space of ground, intersected only by a few broken hedges and ditches, but free from the close wood which had so entirely darkened his advance. In this position he was enabled to discern that the light which had guided him streamed from the window of an old shattered house, partially surrounded by a dilapidated wall, having a few ruinous outhouses attached to it. In this building he beheld the old mansion house of Finiski, which then occupied the ground on which at present stands the powder magazine, and which, by a slight alteration in sound, though without any analogy in meaning, has given its name to the Phoenix Park. The light streamed through the diamond panes of a narrow casement, and still leading his horse, O'Connor made his way over the broken fences towards the old house. As he approached, he perceived several figures moving to and fro in the chamber from which the light issued, and detected, or thought he did so, among them the remarkable form of the priest who had lately been his companion upon the road. As he advanced, someone inside drew a curtain across the window, though, as a Connor conjectured, wholly unaware of his approach, and thus precluded any further reconnoitering on his part. At all events thought he, they can spare me someone to put me upon my way. They can hardly complain if I intrude upon such an errand. With this reflection, he led his horse round the corner of the building to the door, which was sheltered by a small porch roofed with tiles. By the faint light, which in the open space made objects partially discernible, he perceived two men, as it appeared to him, fast asleep half sitting and half lying on the low step of the door. He had just come near enough to accost them, when, somewhat to his surprise, he was seized from behind in a powerful grip, and his arms pinioned to his sides. A single antagonist he would easily have shaken off, but a reinforcement was at hand. Up, boys, be stirring, open the door cried the hoarse voice of the person who held a Connor. The two figures started to their feet, their strength, combined with the efforts of his first assailant, effectually mastered a Connor, and one of them shoved the door open. Pretty watch you keep said he, as the party hurried their prisoner, wholly without the power of resistance, into the house. Three or four powerful, large-limbed fellows, well armed, were seated in the hall, and arose on his entrance. O'Connor saw that resistance against such odds were idle, and resolved patiently to submit to the issue, whatever it might be. Gentlemen that's caught peeping is sometimes made to see more than they have a mind to observe one of O'Connor's conductors. Another removed his sword, and having satisfied himself that he had not any other weapon upon his person, observed, you may let his elbows loose, but just keep him tight by the collar. Let the gentleman know there's a bird limed observed the first speaker, and one of the others passed from the narrow hall to execute the mission. After some little delay, O'Connor, who awaited the result with more of curiosity and impatience than of alarm, was conducted by two of the armed men who had secured him through a large passage terminating in a chamber, which they also traversed and by a second door at its far extremity found entrance into a rude but spacious apartment, floored with tiles, and with a low ceiling of dark plank, supported by ponderous beams. A large wood fire burned in the hearth, beside which some half-dozen men were congregated, several others were seated by a massive table, on which were writing materials, with which two or three of them were busily employed. A number of open letters were also strewn upon it, and here and there a brace of horse pistols or a carbine showed that the party felt neither very secure, nor very much disposed to surrender without a struggle, should their worst anticipations be realized, in any attempt to surprise them. Most of those who were present bore, 
in their disordered dress and mud-soiled boots, the evidence of recent travel. They were lighted chiefly by the broad, uncertain gleam of the blazing wood fire, in which the misty flame of two or three wretched candles which burned upon the table shone pale and dim as the last stars of night in the red dawn of an autumnal sun. In this strong and ruddy light the groups of figures, variously attired, some seated by the table, and others standing with their ample cloaks still folded around them, acquired by the contrast of broad light and shade a character of picturesqueness which had in it something wild and imposing. This singular tableau occupied the further end of the room, which was one of considerable length, and as the prisoner was led forward to the bar of the tribunal, those who composed it eyed him sternly and fixedly. Bind his hands fast said a lean and dark-featured man, with a singularly forbidding aspect and a deep, stern voice, who sat at the head of the table with a pile of papers beside him. Spite of O'Connor's struggles, the order was speedily executed, and with such goodwill that the blood almost started from his nails. Now, sir continued the same speaker, who are you, and what may your errand be? Before I answer your questions you must satisfy me that you have authority to ask them replied O'Connor. Who, I pray, are you, who dare to seize the person, and to bind the limbs of a free man? I shall know this ere one of your questions shall have a reply. I have seen you, young sir, before, scarce an hour since observed one of those who stood by the hearth. Look at me, and say do you remember my features? I do replied O'Connor, who had no difficulty in recognizing those of the priest who had parted from him so abruptly on that evening, of course I recollect your face, we rode side by side from Lake Slip today. You recollect my caution too, you cannot have forgotten that continued the priest, menacingly. You know how peremptorily I warned you against following me, yet you have dogged me here, on your own head be the consequences the fool shall perish in his folly. I have not dogged you here, sir replied O'Connor, I seek my way to Dublin. The river banks are so soft that a horse had better swim than seek to keep them, I therefore took the upper ground, and after losing myself among the woods, at length saw a light, reached it, and here I am. The priest heard the statement with a sinister smile. A truce to these inventions, sir said he. It is indeed possible that you speak the truth, but it is in the highest degree probable that you lie, it is, in a word, plain, satisfactorily plain, that you followed me hither, as I suspected you might have done, you have dogged me, sir, and you have seen all that you sought to behold, you have seen my place of destination and my company. I care not with what motive you have acted, that is between yourself and your maker. If you are a spy, which I shrewdly suspect, Providence has defeated your treason, and punished the traitor, if mere curiosity impelled you, you will remember that ill-directed curiosity was the sin which brought death upon mankind, and cease to wonder that its fruits may be bitter to yourself. What say you, young man? I have told you plainly how I happened to reach this place replied O'Connor, I have told you once, I will repeat the statement no more and once again I ask, on what authority you question me, and dare thus to bind my hands and keep me here against my will. Authority sufficient to satisfy our own consciences rejoined the priest. The responsibility rests not upon you, enough it is for you to know that we have the power to detain you, and that we exercise that power, as we most probably shall another, still less conducive to your comfort. You have the power to make me captive, I admit rejoined O'Connor, you have the power to murder me, as you threaten, but though power to keep or kill is all the justification a robber or a bravo needs, methinks such an argument should hardly satisfy a consecrated minister of Christ. The expression with which the priest regarded the young man grew blacker and more truculent at this rebuke, and after a silence of a few seconds he replied, we are doubly authorized in what we do, a eh? trebly warranted, young traitor. God Almighty has given us the instinct of self-defense, 
which in a righteous cause it is laudable to consult and indulge, the Church, too, tells us in these times to deal strictly with the malignant persecutors of God's truth, and lastly, we have a royal warranty, the authority of the rightful king of these realms, investing us with powers to deal summarily with rebels and traitors. Let this satisfy you. I honor the king rejoined O'Connor, as truly as any man here, seeing that my father lost all in the service of his illustrious sire, but I need some more satisfactory assurance of his delegated authority than the bare assertion of a violent man, of whom I know absolutely nothing, and until you show me some instrument empowering you to act thus, I will not acknowledge your competency to subject me to an examination and still resolutely protest against your detaining me here. You refuse, then, to answer our questions, said the hard-featured little person who sat at the far end of the table. Until you show authority to put them, I peremptorily do refuse to answer them replied the young man. The little person looked expressively at the priest, who appeared to hold a high influence among the party. He answered the look by saying, his blood be upon his own head. Nay, not so fast, Holy Father, let us debate upon this matter for a few minutes, ere we execute sentence said a singularly noble-looking man who stood beside the priest. Remove the prisoner he added, with a voice of command, and keep him strictly guarded. Well, be it so said he, reluctantly. The little man who sat at the head of the table made a gesture to those who guarded O'Connor, and the order thus given and sanctioned was at once carried into execution. Chapter Xliv The Doom The young man was conveyed from the chamber by his two athletic conductors, the door closed upon the deliberations of the stern tribunal who were just about to debate upon the question of his life or death, and he was led round the corner of a lobby a few steps from the chamber where his judges sat, a stout door in the wall was pushed open and he himself thrust through it into a cold, empty apartment, in perfect darkness, and the door shut and barred behind him. Here, in solitude and darkness, the horrors of his situation rushed upon him with tremendous and overwhelming reality. His life was in the hands of fierce and relentless men, by whom, he had little doubt, he was already judged and condemned, bound and helpless, he must await, without the power of hastening or of deferring his fate by a single minute, the cold-blooded deliberations of the conclave who sat within. Unable even to hear the progress of the debate on whose result his life was suspended, a faint and dizzy sickness came upon him, and the cold dew burst from every pore, ghastly. Shapeless images of horror hurried with sightless speed across his mind, and his brain throbbed with the fearful excitement of madness. With a desperate effort he roused his energies, but what could human ingenuity, even sharpened by the presence of urgent and terrific danger, suggest or devise? His hands were firmly bound behind his back, in vain he tugged with all his strength in the fruitless hope of disengaging the cords which crushed them together. He groaned in downright agony as, strength and hope exhausted, he gave up the desperate attempt, nothing then could be done, there remained for him no hope, no chance. In this horrible condition he walked with slow steps to and fro in the dark chamber, in vain endeavouring to compose his terrible agitation. Were my hands but free thought he, I should let the villains know that against any odds a resolute man may sell his life dearly. But it is in vain to struggle, they have bound me here but too securely. Illustration, he made his way to the aperture. To face page 223. Thus saying, he leaned himself against the partition, to await, passively, the event which he knew could not be far distant. The surface against which he leaned was not that of the wall, it yielded slightly to his pressure, it was a door. With his knee and shoulder he easily forced it open, and entered another chamber, at the far side of which he distinctly saw a stream of light, which, passing through a chink, fell upon the opposite wall, and, at the same time, 
he clearly heard the muffled sound of voices in debate. He made his way to the aperture through which the light found entrance, and as he did so, the sound of the voices fell more and more distinctly upon his ear. A small square, of about two feet each way, was cut in the wall, affording an orifice through which, probably, the closet in which he stood was imperfectly lighted in the daytime. A plank shutter was closed over this, and barred upon the outside, through the imperfect joints of which the light had found its way, and a Connor now scanned the contents of the outer chamber. It was that in which the assembly, in whose presence he had, but a few minutes before, been standing, were congregated. A low, broad-shouldered man, whose dress was that of mourning, and who wore his own hair, which descended in meagre ringlets of black upon either side, leaving the bald summit of his head exposed, and who added to the singularity of his appearance not a little by a long, thick beard, which covered his chin and upper lip, this man, who sat nearly opposite to the opening through which O'Connor looked, was speaking and addressing himself to some person who stood, as it appeared, divided by little more than the thickness of the wall from the party whose life he was debating. And against all this continued the speaker, what weighs the life of one man, one life, at best useless to the country, and useless to the king, at best, I say. What came we here for? No light matter to take in hand, sirs, to be pursued with no small risk, each comes hither, Sintus Gladio, in the cause of the king. That cause with our own lives we are bound to maintain, and why not, if need be, at the cost of the lives of others? No good can come of sparing this fellow, at the best, no advantage to the cause, and, on the other hand, should he prove a traitor, a spy, or even an idle babbler, the heaviest damage may befall us. Tush, tush, gentlemen, it is ill straining at gnats in such times. We are here a court-martial, or no court at all. If I find that such dangerous vacillation as this carries it in your counsels, I shall, for one, henceforward hang my sword over the mantelpiece, and obey the new laws. What? One life against such a risk, one execution, to save the cause and secure us all. To us, who have served in the king's wars, and hanged rebels by the round dozen, even on suspicion of being so, such indecision seems incredible. There ought not to be two words about the matter. Put him to death. Having thus acquitted himself, this somewhat unattractive personage applied himself, with much industry and absorption, to the task of chopping, shredding, rolling up, and otherwise preparing a piece of tobacco for the bowl of his pipe. I confess said someone whom O'Connor could not see, that in pleading what may be said on behalf of this young man, I have no ground to go upon beyond a mere instinctive belief in the poor fellow's honesty, and in the truth of his story. Pardon me, sir replied one in whose voice O'Connor thought he recognized that of the priest, if I say, that to act upon such fanciful impressions, as if they were grounded upon evidence, were, in nine cases out of every ten, the most transcendent and mischievous folly. I repeat my own conviction, upon something like satisfactory evidence, that he is not honest. I talked with the fellow this evening, perhaps a little too freely, but in that conference, if he lied not, I learned that he belonged to that most dangerous class, the worst with whom we have to contend, the lukewarm, professing, passive Catholics, the very stuff of which the worst kind of spies and informers are made. He, no doubt, guessed, from what I said, for, to be plain with you, I spoke too freely by a great deal, in the belief, I know not how assumed, that he was one of ourselves, he guessed, I say, something of the nature of my mission, and tracked me hither, at all events, by some strange coincidence, hither he came. It is for you to weigh the question of probabilities. It matters not, in my mind, why or how he came hither observed the ill-favoured gentleman, who sate at the head of the table, he is here, and he hath seen our meeting, 
and could identify many of us. This is too large a confidence to repose in a stranger, and I for one do not like it, and therefore I say let him be killed without any more parley or debate. The old man paused, and a silence followed. With an agonized attention, O'Connor listened for one word or movement of dissent, it came not. All agreed, said the bearded hero, preparing to light his tobacco pipe at the candle. Well, so I expected. The little man who had spoken before him knocked sharply with the butt of a pistol upon the table, and O'Connor heard the door of the room open. The same person beckoned with his hand, and one of the stalwart men who had assisted in securing him, advanced to the foot of the board. Let a grave be digged in the orchard said he, and when it is ready, bring the prisoner out and dispatch him, let it be all done and the grave closed in half an hour. The man made a rude obeisance, and left the room in silence. Bound as he was, O'Connor traced the four walls of the room, in the vague hope that he might discover some other outlet from the chamber than that which he had just entered. But in vain, nothing encountered him but the hard, cold wall, and even had it been otherwise, thus helplessly manacled, what would it have availed him? He passed into the room into which he had been first thrust by the two guards, and in a state little short of frenzy, he cast himself upon the floor. O oh God, said he, it is terrible to see death thus creeping toward me, and not to have the power to help myself. I am doomed, my life already devoted, and before another hour I shall lie under the clay, a corpse. Is there nothing to be done, no hope, no chance? Oh, God! Nothing! As he lay in this strong agony, he heard, or thought he heard, the clank of the spade upon the stony soil without. The work was begun, the grave was opened. Madly he strained at the cords, he tugged with more than human might, but all in vain. Still with horrible monotony he heard the clank of the iron mattock tinkling and clanking in the gravelly soil. Oh! That he could have stopped his ears to exclude the maddening sound. The pulses smote upon his brain like floods of fire. With closed eyes, and teeth set, and hands desperately clenched, he drew himself together, in the awful spasms of uncontrollable horror. Suddenly this fearful paroxysm departed, and a kind of awful calm supervened. It was no dull insensibility to his real situation, but a certain collectedness and calm self-possession, which enabled him to behold the grim adversary of humankind, even arrayed in all the terrors of his nearest approach, with a steady eye. After all, when all's done, what have I to lose? Life had no more joys for me happy I could never more have been. Why should the miserable dread death, and cling to life like cowards? What is it? A brief struggle, the agony of a few minutes, the instinctive yearnings of our nature after life, and this over, comes rest, eternal quiet. He then endeavoured, in prayer, earnestly to commend his spirit to its Maker. While thus employed he heard steps upon the hard tiles of the passage. His heart swelled as though it would burst. He rightly guessed their mission. The bolt was slowly drawn, the dusky light of a lantern streamed into the room, and revealed upon the threshold the forms of three tall men. Lift him up, rise him, boys said he who carried the lantern. You must come with us said one of the two who advanced to a corner. Resistance was fruitless, and he offered none. A cold, sick, overwhelming horror unstrung his joints and dimmed his sight. He suffered them to lead him passively from the room. Chapter XLV The Man in the Cloak, and His Bedchamber As O'Connor approached the outer door through which he was to pass to certain and speedy death, it were not easy to describe or analyze his sensations. Every object he beheld in the brief glance he cast around him as he passed along the hall appeared invested with a strangely sharp and vivid intensity of distinctness, and had in its aspect something indefinably spectral and ghastly, 
like things beheld under the terrific spell of a waking nightmare. His tremendous situation seemed to him something unreal, incredible, he walked in an appalling dream, in vain he strove to fix his thoughts myriads and myriads of scenes and incidents, never remembered since childhood's days, now with strange distinctness and wild rapidity whirled through his brain. The whole door stood half open, and the fellow who led the way had almost reached it, when it was on a sudden thrown wide, and a figure, muffled in a cloak, confronted the funeral procession. The foremost man raised the ponderous weapon which he carried, and held it poised in the air, ready to shiver the head of the intruder should he venture to advance, the two guards who held a corner halted at the same time. How's this, Cormac, said the stranger. Do you lift your weapon against the life of a friend, rub your eyes and waken, how is it you cannot know me, you've been drinking, sirrah? At the sound of the speaker's voice the man at once lowered his hatchet and withdrew, a little sulkily, like a rebuked mastiff. What means all this, continued he in the cloak, looking searchingly at the party in the rear, whom have we got here, where made you this prisoner? So, so, this must be looked to. How were you about to deal with him, fellow, he added, addressing himself to him whom he had first encountered. According to orders, Captain replied the man, doggedly. And how may that have been, interrogated the gentleman in the cloak. End him replied he, sulkily. Has he been before the council in the great parlour, inquired the stranger. Yes, Captain, long enough, too replied the fellow. And they have ordered this execution, added the newly arrived. Yes, sir who else? Come on, boys, bring him out, will you? Time is running short he added, addressing his comrades, and himself approaching the door. Reconduct the prisoner to the council board said the stranger, in a tone of command. Without a moment's hesitation they obeyed the order, and a Connor, followed by the muffled figure of the stranger, for the second time entered the apartment where his relentless judges sate. The newcomer strode up the room to the table at which the self-styled council were seated. God save you, gentlemen said he, and prosper the good work ye have taken in hand, and thus speaking, he removed and cast upon the table his hat and cloak, thereby revealing the square-built form and harsh features of a Hanlon. O'Connor no sooner recognized the traits of his mysterious acquaintance, than he felt a hope which thrilled with a strange agony of his heart, a hope, almost a conviction, that he should escape, and unaccountable though it may appear, in this hope he felt more unmanned and agitated than he had done but a few moments before, in the apparent certainty of immediate and inevitable destruction. The salutation of a Hanlon was warmly, almost enthusiastically, returned, and after this interchange of friendly greeting, and a few brief questions and answers touching comparatively indifferent matters, he glanced toward O'Connor, and said, I've so far presumed upon my favor with you, gentlemen, as to stay your orders in respect of that young gentleman, whom, it would appear, you have judged worthy of death. Death is a matter whose importance I've never very much insisted upon, that you know, at least, several among you, gentlemen, well know it for you have seen me deal it somewhat unsparingly when the cause required it, but I profess I do not care in cool blood to take life upon insufficient reason. Life is lightly taken, but once gone, who can restore it? Therefore, I think it very meet that patient consideration should be had of all cases, when such deliberation is possible and convenient, before proceeding to the last irrevocable extremity. Pray you inform me upon what charges does this youth stand convicted, that his life should be forfeit. It is briefly told replied the priest. On my way hither I encountered him, we rode and conversed together, and conjecturing that he travelled on the same errand as myself, I talked to him more freely than in all discretion I ought to have done. I discovered my mistake, 
and at chapel Izodai turned and left him, telling him with threats not to follow me, yet scarcely had I been here ten minutes, when this gentleman is found lurking near the house, and about to enter it. He is seized, bound, brought in here, and witnesses our assembly and proceedings. Under these suspicious circumstances, and with the knowledge of our meeting and its objects, were it wise to let him go? Surely not so, but the veriest madness. Young man said a Hanlon, turning to a Connor, what say you to this? No more than what I already told these gentlemen, simply, that taking the upper level to avoid the sloughs by the riverside, I became in the darkness entangled in the dense woods which cover these grounds, and at length, after groping my way through the trees as best I might, arrived by the merest chance at this place, and without the slightest knowledge, or even suspicion, either that I was following the course taken by that gentleman, or intruding myself upon any secret counsels. I have no more to say, this is the simple truth. Well, gentlemen said a Lon, you hear the prisoner's defense. What think you? We have decided already, and he has now produced nothing new in his favor. I see no reason why we should alter our decision replied the priest. You would, then, put him to death, inquired he. Assuredly replied the priest, calmly. But this shall not be, gentlemen, he shall not die. You shall slay me first replied a Lon. I know this youth, and every word he has spoken I believe. He is the son of one who risked his life a hundred times and lost all for the sake of the king and his country, one who, throughout the desperate and fruitless struggles of Irish loyalty, was in the field my constant comrade, and a braver and a better one none ever need desire. The son of such a man shall not perish by our hands, and for the risk of his talking elsewhere of this night's adventure, I will be his surety, with my life, that he mentions it to no one, and nowhere. A silence of some seconds followed this unexpected declaration. Be it so, then said the priest, for my part, I offer no resistance. So say I added the person who sat with the papers by him at the extremity of the board. On you, however, Captain Ahanlon, rest the whole responsibility of this act. On me alone. Were there the possibility of treason in that youth? I would myself perish ere I should move a hand to save him replied a Hanlon. I gladly take upon myself the whole accountability, and all the consequences of the act. Your life and liberty are yours, sir said the priest, addressing a Connor, see that you abuse neither to our prejudice. Unbind and let the prisoner go. Stay said a Hanlon. Mr. O'Connor, I have one request to make. It is granted ere it is made. What can I return you in exchange for my life, replied O'Connor. I wish to speak with you tonight continued a Hanlon, on matters which concern you nearly. You will remain here, you can have a chamber. Farewell for the present. Conduct Mr. O'Connor to my apartment he added, addressing the attendants, who were employed in loosening the strained cords which bound his hands and with this direction, a Hanlon mingled with the group at the hearth, and began to converse with them in a low voice. O'Connor followed his guide through a narrow, damp-stained corridor, with tiled flooring, and up a broad staircase, with heavy oaken balustrades, and steps whose planks seemed worn by the tread of centuries, and then along another passage, more cheerless still than the first, several of the narrow windows, by which in the daytime it was lighted had now lost every vestige of glass, and even of the wooden framework in which it had been fixed, and gave free admission to the fitful night wind, as well as to the straggling boughs of ivy which mantled the old walls and clustered shelteringly about the ruined casements. Screening the candle which he carried behind the flap of his coat, to prevent its being extinguished by the gusts which somewhat rudely swept the narrow passage, the man led O'Connor to a chamber, which they both entered. 
it was not quite so cheerless as the desolate condition of the approach to it might have warranted one in expecting, a wood fire, which had been recently replenished, blazed and crackled briskly upon the hearth, and shed an uncertain but cheerful glow through the recesses of the chamber. It was a spacious apartment, hung with stamped leather, in many places stained and rotted by the damp, and here and there hanging in rags from the wall, and exposing the bare, mildewed plaster beneath. The furniture was scanty, and in keeping with the place, old, dark, and crazy, and a wretched bed, with very spare covering, was, as it seemed, temporarily strewn upon the floor, near the hearth. The man placed the candle upon a small table, black with age, and patched and crutched up like a battered pensioner, and flinging some more wood upon the fire, turned and left the room in silence. Alone, his first employment was to review again and again the strange events of that night, his next was to conjecture the nature of O'Hanlon's promised communication. Baffled in these latter speculations, he applied himself to examine the old chamber in which he sat, and to endeavour to trace the half-obliterated pattern of the tattered hangings. These occupations, along with sundry speculations just as idle, touching the original of a grim old portrait, faded and torn, which hung over the fireplace, filled up the tedious hours which preceded his expected interview with his preserver. At length the weary interval elapsed, and the anxiously expected moment arrived. The door opened, and a Hanlon entered. He approached the young man, who advanced to meet him, and extending his hand, grasped that of O'Connor with a warm and friendly pressure. Chapter XLVI The Double Conference, Old Papers When last I saw you said a Hanlon, seating himself before the hearth, and motioning O'Connor to take a chair also, I told you that you ought to tame your rash young blood, and gave you thereupon an old soldier's best advice. It seems, however, that you are wayward and headlong still. Young soldiers look for danger, old ones are content to meet it when it comes, knowing well that it will come often enough, uninvited and unsought, nevertheless, we will pass by this night's adventure, and turn to other matters. First, however, it were meet and necessary that you should have somewhat to refresh you, you must needs be weary and exhausted. If you can give me some wine, it will be very welcome. I care not for anything more tonight replied O'Connor. That can I replied he, and will myself do you reason. He arose, and after a few minutes absence entered with two flasks, whose dust and cobwebs bespoke their antiquity, and filled two large, long-stemmed glasses with the generous liquor. Young man said a Hanlon, from the moment I saw you in the inner room yonder, I know not how or wherefore my heart clave to you, and now knowing you for the son of my true friend, I feel for you the stronger love. I will tell you now how matters stand with us. I will hide nothing from you. I am old enough to have learned the last lesson of experience, the folly of too much suspicion. I will not distrust the son of Richard O'Connor. I need hardly tell you that those men whom you saw below stairs are no friends of the ruling powers, but devoted entirely to the service and the fortunes of the rightful heir of the throne of England and of Ireland, met here together not without great peril. I had conjectured as much from what I myself witnessed rejoined O'Connor. Well, then, I tell you this, the cause is not a hopeless one, the exiled king has warm, zealous, and powerful friends where their existence is least suspected continued a Hanlon. In the Parliament of England he has a strong and untiring party undetected, some of them, too, must soon wield the enormous powers of government, and have already got an entire possession of the ear of the Queen, and so soon as events invite, and the time is ripe for action, a mighty and a sudden constitutional movement will be made in favour of the Prince a movement entirely constitutional and in the Parliament. This will, whether successful or not, raise the intolerant party here into fierce resistance, the resistance of the firelock and the sword, all the usurpers, 
the perjurers, and the plunderers who now possess the wealth and dignities of this spoiled and oppressed country, will arise in terror to defend their booty, and unless met and encountered, and defeated by the party of the young king in this island, will embolden the malignant rebels of the sister country to imitate their example, and so overawe the parliament, and frustrate their beneficent intentions. To us, therefore, has fallen the humble but important task of organizing here, in the heart of this country, and in entire secrecy, a power sufficient for the occasion. Fain would I have thee along with us in so great and good a work, but will not urge you now, think upon it, however, it is not so mad a scheme as you may have thought, but such a one as looked on calmly, with the cold eye of reason, seems practicable, a eh, sure of success. Ponder the matter, then, give me no answer now, I will take none, but think well upon it, and after a week, and not sooner, when you have decided, tell me whether you will be one of us or not. Meanwhile, I have other matters to tell you of, in which perhaps your young heart will take a nearer interest. He paused, and having replenished their glasses, and thrown a fresh supply of wood upon the fire, he continued, Are you acquainted with a family named Ashwood? Yes, replied O'Connor, quickly, I have known them long. A Hanlon looked searchingly at the young man, and then continued, Yes, said he, I see it is even so, your face betrays it, you loved the young lady, Mary Ashwood, deny it not, I am your friend and seek not idly or without purpose thus to question you. What thought you of Henry Ashwood, now Sir Henry Ashwood? He was latterly much, underscore entirely underscore my friend replied O'Connor. He so professed himself, asked a Hanlon. A replied O'Connor, somewhat surprised at the tone in which the question was put, he did so profess himself, and repeatedly. He is a villain. He has betrayed you, said the elder man, sternly. How, what, a villain? Henry Ashwood deceive me, said O'Connor, turning pale as death. Yes, unless I've been strangely practised on, he has villainously deceived alike you and his own sister, pretending friendship, he has sowed distrust between you. But have you evidence of what you say, cried O'Connor. Gracious God! What have I done? I have evidence, and you shall hear and judge of it yourself, replied a Hanlon. You cannot hear it tonight, however, nor I produce it, you need some rest, and so in truth do I, make use of that poor bed, a tired brain and weary body need no luxurious couch, I shall see you in the morning betims, till then farewell. The young man would fain have detained a Hanlon, and spoken with him, but in vain. We have talked enough for this night, said the elder man, I have it not in my power now to satisfy you, I shall, however, in the morning, I have taken measures for the purpose, good night. So saying, a Hanlon left the chamber, and closed the door upon his young friend, now less than ever disposed to slumber. He threw himself upon the pallet, the victim of a thousand harassing and exciting thoughts, Sleep was effectually banished, and at length, tired of the fruitless attitude of repose which he courted in vain, he arose and resumed his seat by the hearth, in anxious and weary expectation of the morning. At length the red light of the dawn broke over the smoky city, and with a dusky glow the foggy sun emerged from the horizon of chimney tops, and threw his crimson mantle of ruddy light over the hoary thornwood and the shattered mansion beneath whose roof had passed the scenes we have just described. Never did the sick wretch, who in sleepless anguish has tossed and fretted through the tedious watches of the night, welcome the return of day with more cordial greeting than did O'Connor upon this dusky morn. The time which was to satisfy his doubts could not now be far distant, and every sound which smote upon his ear seemed to announce the approach of him who was to dispel them all. Weary haggard, and nervous after the fatigues and agitation of the previous day, unrefreshed by the slumbers he so much required, his irritation and excitement were perhaps even greater than under other circumstances they would have been. 
the torments of suspense were at length, however, ended, he did hear steps approach the chamber, the steps evidently of more than one person, the door opened, and a Han Lon, followed by Senior Peruxi, entered the room. I believe, young gentleman, you have seen this person before, said a Han Lon, addressing a Connor, while he glanced at the Italian. A Connor assented. Ah, yes, said the Neapolitan, with a winning smile, he has seen me very often. Senior Connor, he know me very well. I am so happy to see him again, very, oh. Very. Let Mr. O'Connor know briefly and distinctly what you have already told me said a Han Lon. About the letters, asked the Italian. Yes, be brief replied a Han Lon. Ah, did he not guess, rejoined the Neapolitan, Pacrilla, the deception succeed, then, very coning fellow was old Sir Richard, but not half so coning as his son, Sir Henry. He never suspect. Mr. O'Connor never doubt, but took all the letters and read them just so as Sir Henry said he would. Malara. What great misfortune. Peruxi, speak plainly to the point, I cannot endure this. Say at once what has he done, underscore how underscore have I been deceived, cried O'Connor. You remember when the old gentleman, Mr. Audley, I think he is called, saw Sir Richard, immediately after that some letters passed between you and Miss Mary Ashwood. I do remember it, proceed replied O'Connor. Miss Mary's letters to you were cold and unkind, and make you think she did not love you any more added Peruxi. Well, well, say on, say on, for God's sake, man, say on cried O'Connor, vehemently. Those letters you got were not written by her continued the Italian, coolly, they were all what you call forged, written by another person, and planned by Sir Henry and Sir Richard, and the same way on the other side, the letters you wrote to her were all stopped, and read by the same two gentlemen, and other letters written instead, and she is breaking her heart, because she thinks you av betrayed her, and given her up, underscore rotter di colo, underscore the av make nice work. Prove this to me. Prove it said O'Connor, wildly, while his eye burned with the kindling fire of fury. I will prove it rejoined Peruxi, but with an agitated voice and a troubled face, but, Corpo di Plato, you will kill me if I tell, promise, swear, by your honor, you will not haunt me, you will not tarsh me, swear, senor, and I will tell. Miserable caitiff, speak, and quickly, you are safe. I swear it rejoined he. Well, then resumed the Italian, with restored calmness, I will prove it so that you cannot doubt any more, it was I that wrote the letters for them, I, myself, and beside, here is the bundle with all of them written out for me to copy, most of them by Sir Henry, you know his handwriting, you will see the character, underscore Corbett Solly, underscore he is a great rogue and you will find all the real letters from you and Miss Mary that were stopped, I have them here. He here disengaged from the deep pocket of his coat, a red leathern case stamped with golden flowers, and opening it presented it to the young man. With shifting color and eyes almost blinded with agitation, O'Connor read and reread these documents. Where is Ashwood? At length he cried, Bring me to him, gracious God! What a monster I must have appeared, will she, underscore can underscore she ever forgive me? Disregarding in entire contempt the mean agent of Ashwood's villainy, and thinking only of the high-born principal, O'Connor, pale as death, but with perfect deliberateness, arose and took the sword which the attendant who conducted him to the room had laid by the wall, and replacing it at his side, said sternly, Bring me to Sir Henry Ashwood, where is he? I must speak with him. I cannot bring you to him now replied Peruxi, in internal ecstasies, for I cannot say where he is, but I know very well where he will be today after dinner time, in the evening, and I will bring you, but I hope very much you are not intending any mischiefs, if I thought so, 
I would be very sorry, oh, very. Well, be it so, if it may not be sooner said a Connor, gloomily, this evening at all events he shall account with me. Meanwhile said a Hanlon, you may as well remain here, and when the time arrives which this Italian fellow names, we can start. I will accompany you, for in such cases the arm of a friend can do you no harm and may secure you fair play. Hear me, you Italian scoundrel, remain here until we are ready to depart with you, and that shall be whenever you think it time to seek Sir Henry Ashwood, you shall have enough to eat and drink meanwhile, depart, and relieve us of your company. Signor Peruxi smiled sweetly from ear to ear, shrugged, and bowed, and then glided lightly from the room, exulting in the pleasant conviction that he had commenced operations against his ungrateful patron by involving him in a scrape which must inevitably result in somewhat unpleasant exposures, and which had beside reduced the question of Sir Henry's life or death to an even chance. Chapter Xlay The Jolly Bowlers, The Double Fray and The Flight At the time of which we write, there lay at the southern extremity of the city of Dublin, a bowling green of fashionable resort, well known as Cullen's Green. For greater privacy it was enclosed by a brick wall of considerable height, which again was surrounded by stately rows of lofty and ancient elms. A few humble dwellings were clustered about it, and through one of them, a low, tiled public house, lay the entrance into this place of pastime. Thither were a Connor and a Hanlon, having left their horses at the cock and anchor were led by the wily Italian. The players you say, will not stop till dusk said a Connor, we can go in, and I shall wait until the party have broken up, to speak to Ashwood, in the interval we can mix with the spectators, and so escape remark. They were now approaching the little tavern embowed in tufted trees, and as they advanced, they perceived a number of hack carriages and led horses congregated upon the road about its entrance. Sir Henry is within. That iron grey is his horse, sank Dundur, there is no mistake observed the Neapolitan. The little party entered the humble tavern, but here they were encountered by a new difficulty. You can't get in tonight, gentlemen, sorry to disappoint, gentlemen, but the greens engaged said mine host, with an air of mysterious importance, a private party, engaged two days since for fear of a disappoint. Are they so strictly private, that they would not suffer two gentlemen to be spectators of their play, inquired a Hanlon. My orders is not to let anyone in, good, bad, or indifferent, while they are playing the match, that's my orders replied the man, sorry to disappoint, but can't break my word with the gentlemen, you know. Is there any other entrance into the bowling green, inquired a Connor, except through that door. De Villa 1, sir, where would it be? De Villa 1, gentlemen replied mine host, no other way in or out. We will rest ourselves here for a time, then said a Connor. Accordingly the party seated themselves in the low-roofed chamber through which the bowlers on quitting the ground must necessarily pass, and calling for some liquor to prevent suspicion, moodily awaited the appearance of the young baronet and his companions. Many a stern, impatient glance of expectation did O'Connor direct to the old door which alone separated him from the traitor and hypocrite who had with such monstrous fraud practised upon his unsuspecting confidence. At length he heard gay laughter and the tread of many feet approaching. The proprietor of the Jolly Bowlers opened the door, and several merry groups passed them by and took their departure, but O'Connor's eye in vain sought among them the form of young Ashwood. I see the grey horse still at the door, I know it as well as I know my own hand said the Italian, as sure as I am leaving man, Sir Henry is there still. After an interval so considerable that O'Connor almost despaired of the appearance of Ashwood, voices were again audible, and steps approaching the doorway at a slow pace, the time between the first approach of those sounds, and the actual appearance of those who caused them appeared to the overwrought anxiety of O'Connor all but interminable. At length, however, 
two figures entered from the bowling green, the one was that of a spare but dignified looking man, somewhat advanced in years, but carrying in his countenance a singular expression of jollity and good humour, the other was that of Sir Henry Ashwood. God be thanked said a Hanlon, grasping the hilt of his sword, here comes the perjured villain Wharton. O'Connor had another object, however and beheld no one existing thing but only the now hated form of his false friend, both he and Ahanlon started to their feet as the two figures entered the small and darksome room. O'Connor threw himself directly in their path and said, Sir Henry Ashwood, a word with you. The appeal was startling and unexpected, and there was in the voice and attitude of him who uttered it, something of deep, intense, constrained passion and resolution which made the two companions involuntarily and suddenly check their advance. One moment sufficed for Sir Henry to recognise O'Connor, and another convinced him that his quindam friend had discovered his treachery, and was there to unmask, perhaps to punish him. His presence of mind, however, seldom, if ever, forsook him in such scenes as this, he instantly resolved upon the tone in which to meet his injured antagonist. Pray, sir, said he, with stern hauteur, upon what ground do you presume to throw yourself thus menacingly in my way? Move aside and let me pass, or your rashness shall cost you dearly. Ashwood, Sir Henry, you well know there is one consideration which would unstring my arm if lifted against your life, you presume upon the forbearance which this respect commands, said O'Connor. Promise but this, that you will undeceive your sister whom you have practised upon as cruelly as you have on me, and I will call you to no further account, and inflict no further humiliation. Very good, sir, very magnanimous, and exceedingly tragic rejoined Ashwood, scornfully. Turn aside, sirrah, and leave my path open, or by the, you shall rue it. I will not leave the spot on which I stand but with my life, except on the conditions I have named replied O'Connor. Once more, before I strike you, leave the way cried Ashwood, whose constitutional pugnacity began to be thoroughly aroused. Turn aside, sirrah. How dare you confront gentlemen, insolent beggar, how dare you? Yielding to the furious impulse of the moment, Sir Henry Ashwood drew his sword, and with the naked blade struck his antagonist twice with no sparing hand. The passions which O'Connor had, with all his energy, hitherto striven to mask. 